Well, Nathan just mentioned there some of the national average figures in terms of calving interval and calves per cup per year, and uh, the figures aren't too good. We have a calving interval of about 407 days, so the average suckler cow is losing six weeks every year. Calves per cow per year is at about 0.8, so for every five suckler cows, we're getting about four weanlings, which, you know, realistically, long term isn't commercially sustainable. Now, from analysis that ICBF have done, my colleague Niall there is holding the sheet up, up on the camera. There's analysis done here on uh, uh, suckler cows and BDGP herds that were born in 2008. They're analyzed from five stars down to one stars, and on all the key traits, from number of calvings, age of first calving, calving interval, uh, calf growth rates, the five star animals are outperforming the one star animals quite significantly. Now, what the Beef Data and Genomics Program is doing, or its aim, is to put financial supports in place to incentivize farmers to breed more of these high index animals. Um, these two animals here, for example, the cow that Nathan just went through on her calf, the cow, she's a five star cow on the replacement index, she's an index of 101 euros, so we call it 100 euros. So what that basically means is per calf this cow will leave 100 euros more than the average suckler cow, and that's based on her milk performance, her fertility, the extra weight gain she's going to put on the calf and hopefully the longevity as Nathan said she's after six or seven calves at this stage. So these are, you know, cows like this breed isn't really significant. Yeah. It's these types of animals, high index animals that the scheme is looking to incentivize farmers to breed. Yeah. Then in terms of the heifer, this is your next generation. Higher index again, 141 or two euros in, in uh, replacement index. Probably puts that heifer in the top 5% nationally. Functionally a good heifer, um, very quiet. Out of the dairy herd, Chris? No. Mm -hmm. Continental breeding all the ways. Uh, she's out of a cemental AI bull, an old cemental AI bull called uh, Harem HUZ, I think is his code. Um, she's in calf, she's been calving down to 26 months, and she's in calf to a, an easy calving limousine uh, AI bull. So, in terms of index um, and, and physical performance, you're not going to find a, a whole lot better than these two cows. These, these I two mean, animals. is it fair to say, Chris, they don't look like five star cows? Like, they don't, you know, I mean. You know, and just the relationship with that with that piece, like a farmer looking at her say she's an ordinary an ordinary cow. So obviously it's not looks is driving your yeah, salad. Like, you, know I mean? you probably know from the dairy sector, in dairying most cows look the same, same conformation, it's very standard, so performance is judged more on milk solids and milk quantity, whereas in in beef a lot of farmers are conditioned to it's it's a lot more from the eye and how well an animal looks, but right. as, as as a lot of farmers will well know, a cow that looks very well. She looks well because she's probably putting most of her feet on her own back and she's maybe not putting into her own calf. So, I mean, this cow, she might look pretty, but she's a working cow. Yeah. And you can see from the quality of the calf, I mean, that calf, a heifer calf is achieving about a kilo and a quarter gain a day. Yeah. You know, the national average for heifers would be probably less than a kilo. So this cow is far outperforming that. Correct, yeah. Okay, any any comments, questions on, on the suckler cow and calf for the replacement heifer in the ring? All happy that they're... They're doing what they're supposed to do and they're delivering the stars they're delivering um as you say calvin down 26 months of age yeah she's, she's good 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 weight for age oh uh, absolutely yeah that yeah. heifer's uh, 690 kilos i think so yeah at, at, at a, an average uh, mature cow weight of 700 kilos the target is to calvin down at 90 percent of that yeah so that would be 630 kilos so she's well well ahead of that She'd be a little bit heavier now, Jack, than your dairy type. <laughs> she, she worth it. There'd be two of them there together, like, you know, we have to make it up with her, like, yeah. Um, I suppose the other thing it demonstrates, you mentioned dairy breeding there. Some farmers go back to the dairy herd for beef cross calves, you yeah. know, they're kind of more or less guaranteed milk. Right. There are, you know, beef genetics out there that will deliver both. They'll deliver good maternal functional cows and yeah. they'll deliver on beef traits as well. Yeah, yeah. And so it's obviously it's selecting within the, the different breeds, whatever, for the maternal trait, if that's what they're, yeah, that's what the objective is. Absolutely, yeah. I and mean, with all of the breeds, there are bulls strong in all of the various traits, be that milk, fertility, carcass, calving ease, docility. So it's a, that's where the indexes come in, and you have to go a bit further than just going on the eye. You know? Okay. We moved them out of the ring, if there's no comments, and we're going to bring in two wanelings. Again, I suppose the next stage along the, along the cycle, I mean, similar to the waning that's gone out, um, Darren Carty is going to bring in two wanelings here that he bought two months ago. And I suppose we're just going to talk about the management of them now uh, for the next couple of weeks. Well, I suppose what he's done since he's purchased them, um, what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks? And I suppose, where's the, where, what's the objective? Where's the, what market are they aimed at? Um, or, where, or where is it going? Darren, take it up there in terms of the two wanelings that have come in. Uh, thanks, Jack. Yeah, we bought these two wheelands for Tullamore and I suppose with the aim of bringing them to the plough as you see yourself, there's a big difference in quality and that's one of the things we wanted in it. Uh, this wheeland here, he's uh, looks very, very good quality wheeland. Anyone want to put a guess on what weight he is? Anyone have an eye looking at them? 
on around there. Or it, it, it's actually not weighing as much as what he looks, and I suppose that's really one of the reasons. Or that's what you thought when you were buying him as well. Wasn't it? <laughs> that, that's exactly what I thought, Jack. We won't talk about, yeah, no, we won't. We won't talk about buying price in a minute. We will mm. have been with your teeth. 350 kilos when we put him up on the, on the weighing scales yesterday morning. He was bought. Uh, at, he was bought say 300 kilos he's a bit older than this fella and i suppose he was he used to be eating a bit of meal um, when he's coming in the bit of age touch him and he's been getting the out sort of uh, once two kilos meal when we bought him and he's getting three to four kilos in the run up to the plowing and i suppose one of the things we wanted to do was to really i suppose maybe show what he's capable of and to uh, show that he's that sort of live export type animal now joe burke will talk in a minute about live exports and what's available there. The, the day we bought him, there was five casts in the ring, uh, or five casts in the pin with him. The other four went for live export, but since that, there's been a very, very, I suppose, mixed live export trade. The, this fella here, uh, he was 250 kilos the day we bought him, cost 820 euros. Uh, as you know, at the time, wheat and prices were going very, very good. They still are good, still a good uh, price. Them. He won't be anything like or has the potential to make the same type of calf as this. He's more your sort of general steer sort of calf, 24, 26 months steer. His dam is first class out of the dairy herd, so as you see, he isn't as good in, say, maybe as good in the shoulder. Uh, he's a February born calf. He was weighing 300 kilos the last day and i suppose what's the plan with the two of them this fella here if you're getting the weanlands ready for sale as i say you could feed this fella he'd take the feed and that's ideally sort of one to two kilos of meat on good quality grass but you can up it to three kilos and he'd take it because he's short whereas this fella here if you started feeding him and you started giving him three to four kilos well, probably what he'd do is he's that sort of easier flesh but he gets sort of puppy fat up around the tail head and they are on the pin bones and it's not desirable from a point of view of a buyer because you're buying an animal that's pushed yeah. too hard and he's going to go back so what we'd be saying is people that have weanlands getting them ready this fella you can pull and push him on a bit he, he's short there's plenty of farmers even domestic uh, in the domestic market for him as well this fella here i suppose one to two kilos a meal if grass quality is poor you can pop it to two and a half kilos I suppose there's a big range, uh, and we haven't mentioned it's a big range in weather between the west and the east. And a lot of the wean that's coming out of the west this year are showing maybe a small bit of impact. And farmers have responded by up and meal feed. What we're going to do with them now, or I suppose what's going to be done, you could show this fella again. I suppose there was a couple of exporters around yesterday, and they said he's ideal for the North African markets. Joel talk a bit more about that. But we asked to put out the question yesterday, who do him as a bull under 16 months of age? And really, I suppose it was split. There was, I suppose, 50% of the farmers said, yeah, definitely they do him as that. They want to get the benefit out of him, push him on. What age is he now, Darren, sorry? He's about to 10 months, so 10 months you have to keep him going. Like, there's no room for a store period in that fella. He wants to keep going. Yeah. You can keep him that three, three and a half kilos. Keep him, push him in. Ideally, you'd like him at 400 kilos if you are doing that 16 month system. But look at, he, he's, he's gained 50 kilos since we bought him. Yeah. He's probably coming off a cow that might have had as much milk and he's shown yeah. the potential since. Yeah. Uh, but you want a decent price now, Darren, to cover your costs. You want a decent yeah. price to cover your costs, and you really, if you're going 16 month system, you have to be hitting all the boxes. You have to be getting them on the grid. It's a good youth plus calf, so you yeah. get the benefits that way, and you want to get your 12 cents as well. Yeah. It's a good cast rate of Jack, and he'd be a very, very good. He's a very functional calf as well. For 22 uh, or 24 months. You could do 22 or 24 months. Probably up to 22 or 24 months. He's he's good bit forward on now. Next spring, letting him out. Yeah. Putting him onto grass and then bring him in for 100 days, you might just run into issues of carcass weight. That fella would be more suitable weight for doing that, but this is where this fella, I suppose, is. And maybe, maybe that's the point of, of, of maybe bringing in Joe into the equation. Yeah. Now. I mean, Joe, we've talked about the different markets and where, where the likes of these animals are going. And Darren has mentioned the export markets. Uh, you know, hasn't been as strong this year. Maybe just talk around that a little bit in terms of where, maybe where it's going and where it's the future. Yeah, yeah, no matter, Jack. Um, obviously, overall live exports are down. They're down about 25%. Live exports are important enough, obviously, as a source of an alternative source of competition as well as an outlet for a fairly significant number of cattle. Like last year, was 240,000 cattle exported live. So it looks set that this year we'll have 60 or 70,000 less, and those animals will obviously be bought by Irish farmers to stay in the country and be finished here. 
Um, traditionally, when you think of the live export market at this time of the year, Jack, you tend to think of very good quality Wienlands, like that limousine Wienland there, uh, very good U-grade cattle that would tend to go out to the Italian market. Um, and so far this year, exports to Italy have been struggling. They're probably back about 40% now at the moment. There were years there when there was 60 or 70,000 Wienlands exported to Italy. It has been slower in recent years, all right, only between 30 and 40,000 animals being sent there and even a bit slower so far this year. In the last couple of weeks it has recovered a bit and um, the reason for that, or part of the reason for that, uh, even in spite of the higher prices that are prevailing here in Ireland, and you know, the likes of that Wienland, export buyers have not really been able to compete for him. Such has been the level of demand from Irish farmers. Irish farmers in general have been able to pay higher prices uh, export buyers haven't been able to give as good of a price or haven't been able to buy the cattle in a lot of cases and the reason for that is that the beef prices out in Italy and out in France have not been as good as the prices here in Ireland so far this year um, and obviously they have big transport costs as well too in exporting the animals outside there. What's their threshold Joe? You know, in terms yeah, of price, cur you? Currently at the moment a very good quality animal like that really for the export market in order to be able to compete with Wienlands coming down from France to Italy and Irish uh, export buyer would be able to give maybe two euro eighty a kilo for him, and as Darren will tell you, they're freely making two ninety and three euro a kilo. Darren freely yeah. making, and I suppose yeah. that the couple of special sales even last week that have been held. There was a sale. I was talking to David Quinn, Quinn and Karen you uh, yesterday evening. He was in here, and he said that good quality animal or that good quality blue. There were three euros, three twenty, even three twenty a kilo. Yeah. So he said it was very hard for the wheel for the for them in to, to operate and he said there was a good few specialised bull beef finishers in the trade and taking the exporters out of it. Yeah, geez, that reflects the level of optimism that is there. Obviously we all have to take our own systems into account, Jack, yeah. and do our figures, know our costs, yeah. and know what we can you know, realistically Correct. afford to pay for stock when we're going out buying them. Right. Uh, an exporter currently at the moment, the one window of maybe op opportunity that they do have is that there's an outbreak of blue tongue disease over in France at the moment. And that has actually locked up a fairly large portion of France that would traditionally be exporting a lot of Wienlands down to Italy. They're not currently operating. There's about a 150 kilometer radius around this outbreak yeah. that is restricted from exporting just at the moment. Yeah. That's leading to a bit more demand. Hopefully it'll improve the prices that the exporters are able to get. There was 700 Wienlands exported from Ireland to Italy last uh, week. And that's the best week that we've had so far this year. Okay. But other, other years we'd have seen 1,500 yeah. and 2,000 Wienlands going out. That's we just move, one we out might, We might move it on yeah. and, and move up to the finished animals if that's okay. So the, the two Wienlands are going, up, are going out the gate and we're going to bring in um, animals that are closer to slaughter, I suppose. There's two big Charlies and two from the dairy bread uh, herd. So, um, Joe, just, I mean, to, to lead us in, obviously, I mean, yeah. Talk to them. I mean, a bit about the Finnish trade, and I suppose, and where it's going at the moment, and, and you know, I mean, and the type of animals that we're going to see here now. Very good. Um, yeah, this is, I suppose, part of a demonstration, really, Jack, to talk a bit about the types of cattle that we're that uh, we're ideally looking for for the market these days. Um, we have a similar display as well, too, a continuation on from this over on the board via stand. It's worth mentioning. Yeah. We have a display of carcasses or hindquarters from two different carcasses and a number of different cuts and stakes as well, too, from animals of different specifications. Um, but to show you what we're looking at here, you can see there's two very well-bred Charlie animals there, obviously, from the suckler herd. And there's two plainer, lighter animals there for, coming from a dairy background, one of them a Frisian and one of them a Hereford cross bullock there as well. No, at, at different ages of course here. No? Yeah, we're that's not true, that's true. Like what we have yeah. there, the two Charlotte cattle, the nice orange bullock there is 23 months, the white Charlotte bullock there is 21 months of age, and the two other animals there, they're March 2014 born cattle, so they're just a year and a half cattle. Um, very, very interesting and to focus especially firstly on the two Charlotte cattle. Um, you can see there, they're lovely stock altogether. And I suppose to look at them on first glance, they look um, to be a similar enough size of beast. They're a similar height and a similar length. But uh, you can see there's far superior finish on this orangey fella and massive body depth and huge conformation as well too. He's a really good U-grade animal with good flesh. You'd kill him there, no problem straight away. Um, we put a bit of a, a, a guess on the way to this bullock and a good few people were out fairly significantly yesterday because he's a much heavier bullock maybe than he looks at first glance. Anyone want to have a guess of what weight this nice thick orange bullock is? 700? Another bit? Good bit, good bit, good bit heavier than that now. 
830. He's actually 850 kilos, Jack, this bullock here, which you wouldn't you wouldn't believe, you know, because he just has it every way. He's filled out everywhere. Um, he's been on a trial as part of an ICBF performance test trial in Tully above in Kildare. And, um, you know, you can see there he's done a good job. He's been putting on over two kilos a day during that feeding trial. Um, but what you would say about that bullock, and even though all of us would look at him and say he's a great bullock, a really well finished bullock, he's going to kill out really well, uh, he's going to grade well. Um, but unfortunately, taking into account today's market conditions and the, and the specifications of most of the customers that we're exporting beef to nowadays, is that he's actually over the top in terms of what they're looking for. He's too heavy because he's 850 kilos, Jack. When he's killed, he's, he'll kill out probably 470, 480 kilos carcass weight. And then the cuts, especially the high value steak cuts from that animal, are just you know too big for the majority of what customers are looking for. Um, and so we're after building them up here, he was the best bullet walking into the yeah, ring, yeah, and all yeah. of a sudden you've just dropped him down on the floor. Like, well, know. he's still a very valuable animal, all right, Jack. Um, we don't have price cuts at the moment, as you know, for heavy, uh, overweight animals, but that is something that is going to be a factor again. And uh, we may as well start talking about it now because in six months' time, it's likely that you know it will be a feature again. There's a kind of an amnesty there that factories aren't cutting for overweight animals, but it's a reality that the demand of most of our customers is for that animal between a 300 and a 400 kilo carcass, approximately. And the steak cuts, which typically come from the loin of the animal, are along the back. That's where the strip loin is, and in front of that is where the rib or the ribeye is as well too. There are two key, key steak cuts, and um, from a bigger animal like, for example, a 460 or a 470 kilo carcass, you'd have strip loins that are about 10 kilos weight. Yeah. Those strip loins have a very big eye muscle or a big steak. And when that's cut, then it's going to result into a big steak. There's not that many consumers when they go out. And this will be um, more practically demonstrated by Phelim O'Neill, the market specialist, now in a minute. Um, but in a lot of cases, the lighter carcass weight animal, like this Charlie animal, he's a full 150 kilos lighter than the yellow animal there. He's well, just over 700 the kilos. Stages. Is it fair to say they're at different stages? Well, the you could slaughter him, Jack. You could slaughter him. It'd be, it'd be an arc. He's not as... He's not as um, as uh, extreme in terms of his conformation, he'd be yeah. an R plus probably in his conformation. Yeah. He'd be just about a three probably in, the, in his fat class, probably about a three minus. But if you kill him there at the moment, he'd be about 390 kilos carcass weight. Okay. And that is actually more typical of the ideal carcass that most of our in, most of our customers are looking for. A smaller steak, uh, just easier to meet the market requirements. More customers will be looking for that. If you were to talk to any supermarket buyer, Jack, they talk about a strip line between six and about seven and a half kilos as being their ideal strip line for cutting into steaks. And that'll deliver a nicer sized steak for customers, maybe a seven ounce steak or an eight ounce steak, maybe not like uh, you know the, the very big steak that will be coming off the, the bigger animal. And I'd say Phelan yeah, will put this into, nice, into context now in a second. A nice, a nice cue, yeah. a nice cue for, you know, in terms of, you know, and Phelan, we're talking about those, those, those type of steaks and you, you have a demonstration, you can show us an actual steak in a packet here and, and what Joe is talking about here in terms of the live animal in relation to the packet. Very much so, and just to, to add to Joe's comments there before we bring it out to, and, and display it, uh, you know, it, it does feel a bit of a fraud stun here in criticising that, that quality animal. Uh, and certainly the Irish beef industry from 20, 25 years ago would have given the right teeth to that type of animal when our markets were very much uh, intervention buying a race to private storage where the product was sold outside of Europe with the EU assistance and support. So that's and the key change. The market yeah, has changed. The market has changed We're fundamentally and dramatically, yeah. and particularly in the last 10 years. Yeah. That whole support for beef that was in place 25, 20 years ago has gone to be replaced by we have to go into the commercial market with it and you know as opposed to an unfairness to Port Bia and, and to the Irish industry we have developed the best uh, customers across the continent of Europe those are the most demanding customers and they're, they're paying us uh, not near enough as I'm sure anybody that's finishing cattle would say but the reality of life is that they are paying us uh, in European terms a pretty good price now what do they want or what are they looking for in terms of um, the steak and just to, to highlight the problem I'll, I'll hold up this steak here, and I don't know about you men, but certainly I would be of the, the mind that if that steak was presented to me in a plate, I would see very little wrong with it. In fact, I would think that was a really good deal. I would appreciate it. Uh, that's a typical steak that will come from this red Charlie here. It's a big, big guy muscle. It's a big size, and you can see there's one in this pack here, and it's retailing at €10.41. 
for this pack, for this steak. So it's a hell of a lot of money, but it's a quality piece of meat. Now, the reason that the, the supermarkets uh, across Europe uh, don't want this, now they're more demanding and tighter in the UK than they would be in the continent. You'll get away with an extra few kilos there. But the, what they want is everything to hit a price point. And this is where our second exhibit of the day comes in. And if you look at this pack here, the, the main difference is, first and foremost, you have two steaks in it. And uh, these are typically taken of a smaller animal. I would suggest probably not even as good a carcass as the, the whiter of these two, Charlie, here. It'll probably be heading down something a bit lighter still, maybe 360, 370 kilo, Joe, would that be right? And um, the other significant thing about this steak is two of them in the packet, first and foremost, which is very attractive uh, to the shopper that's lifted them up of a, of a supermarket shelf. And the second point of significance is that's uh, retailing at 10 euro, 25 cent a kilo. So that's actually almost 20 cent a kilo less for two steaks than it is for one of the big ones. Uh, now that's, uh, as I say, in, in the supermarket business, in the, in the era of retail packing, whatever the product is, it's about selling at a price point. So you walk down the store, uh, the, the aisle of any of them, you will see it's either 9.99, it's 8.99. Everything is done uh, to, to a particular price point. Yeah. I mean, so I mean that's that's the relationship between what we're looking at here. I might just ask Andrew Comby a, a, a comment in terms of Andrew. We, we we were looking at these bullocks and we 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 got the message that the market is different and big, but there's also a production difference in terms of that big orange sherry is eaten a lot more. Um, you know, and obviously that's what your that's part of your measurement in Tully is the kind of feed conversion efficiency and, and what the difference is between. The, the orange charlie and the white charlie like i mean yeah one of the uh, key traits that we would be following up uh, you mentioned or joe mentioned earlier on these bulls are on a, a performance test at tully so um, we would be uh, also measuring their feed intake uh, throughout the, the the test period so they've been on test for about 120 days as the test period and uh, the, the the big orange bullock is actually eating he's eating about four kilos more per day uh, than the, 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 the white bullock. So he's actually yet another, you know, half a ton or up and a half a ton of dry, ma of dry matter uh, over the test period compared to the white bull bullock. So, I mean, even if you were to put that into some euro values as well, you know, there's there's certainly, there's a hundred, there's 150 euros of additional feed cost alone in the finishing period uh, against the orange Charlie bullock compared to the white bullock. You know, it's significant, isn't it, on the, on the greater scale? It's, it's very significant, and obviously, Jack, this is, um, you know, for farmers, it's very difficult to get your head around that, because how do you actually see how much an animal is going to eat? And Joe would say, this fella's filled up well, you know, <laughs> so he obviously has a good appetite, but but I suppose that is one of the objectives of the whole uh, genetics and, and what we're trying to do there, because within the indexes, there is a big focus on feed efficiency, feed intake and efficiency, so what we're trying to do is identify the animals that are going to convert feed more efficiently and in that sense the white bullock in, in, in the genetic terms anyway is more is more feed efficient and obviously it's that sort of animal or those sorts of genetics or bloodlines that you're going to want to try and bring forward more in the future so it's it, it's about earlier getting them finished earlier finished quicker and eating less feed uh, you know as per what the market wants to uh, in the future and there is an important point there which is feeling made the comment yet you know, the orange bullock in many ways is the culmination of 20, 25 years of breeding. Yeah, yeah. You know, because that's what the market wanted. Yeah. So, you know, we do have to acknowledge the market is going to start to change. And it's not that this bullock is not a good bullock. It's just that, you know, going forward, we're going to need less, want less of them. And we're going to want to de develop an industry that are more like that white bullock. Yeah. But, and, and Andrew, then, in terms of ICBF and the relationship with the genetics, you're trying to select the, 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 the line of genetics that's more, that's more efficient, you know. So is, is that an AI vote then that you're going to No, no. So, I mean, obviously, then this comes back to a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of farmers now involved in this B to fit data and genomics program. And right. lots of fellas are hearing from me for the first time the whole four and five stars. So the bottom line of it is these four and five star cows that farmers do have on their farms. You know, these are the cows that are producing progeny that finish earlier, that finish easier, you know at a more acceptable target carcass weight yeah. compared to, to compared to where we would have been if you go back to you know back to those one and two star cows right. i mean right. so and it's the same on the bull side whether you're using a stock bull or an ai bull you know if you go down to any of the ai stands or the herdbook stands look that's where the four and five stars on both that terminal index which is the slaughter you know if you're taking animals through to slaughter if you're buying bulls uh, stock bulls or ai 
or alternatively on the female side. You know, those are the traits that we're looking to pick up more and more in the future, Jack. Okay. Just uh, very quickly, yeah, come in yeah. there again, Jack, for a final yeah. point in the context of our, of our quality orange uh, animal here. The, I wouldn't necessarily say that the market for these is going to disappear completely. There will always be a market for heavier type uh, carcasses, but it will be a very limited, almost a speciality market. But the minute we have that Warbling Angus and Hereford, yeah. where they're particular schemes, and I would see in the future where heavier cattle can get away, it will be where farmers have an individual arrangement with a factory, and it will involve planning ahead, booking in ahead, doing all that type of thing. Uh, but you know, we, we had, and, and, and I suppose the, the one of the things that the round table last year, there was a moratorium on heavy cattle at the factories, you know. Yeah. That was to end on the 31st of December. We would have recently heard uh, that uh, the factories would be, the, that they have that date very much in their mind. So it was very much a case of having heavier cattle to plan ahead on. Okay. Let's, let's move on to the, the other two animals that are in the ring from the dairy bred herd. Um, Joe, take, take us through what we have here and, and kind of again related to the market space. Yeah, definitely, Jack. And again, these are very typical of obviously a lot of cattle around the country. Both spring-born cattle, so they're year and a half old bullocks. You have a Frisian bullock there, and a Hereford cross bullock out of a dairy herd as well. Um, so they're 18 months old. You have a Frisian bullock there that's 450 kilos. The Hereford is a little bit heavier, around 470 kilos. But most farmers will be thinking about doing with them. Jack would be uh, keep them going on good grass, obviously, for another month or six weeks. Get them into the shed and probably kill them next February with you know a diet of good grass silage maybe complemented with five or six kilos of meal yeah. um, that would be the, the typical regime for both of those cattle yeah. the big thing about them is Jack that the dairy herd has grown we've seen an increase of nearly 120,000 in calf registrations this year um, and they're a, a reflection of both of these types really you know the Frisian animal there isn't that big of an uptake, Jack, in the level of sixth semen being used. So yeah. for the for the foreseeable future, there are going to be a number, uh, a, a considerable number of uh, male dairy calves there, pure Frisian animals, and there is a market for them. And you know, the the limitations maybe which exist in terms of the heavy carcass weights, that's not going to be an issue for for uh, for a Frisian animal. In most cases, when that slaughtered is going to be between 300 and 320 kilos carcass weight, yep. you'd hope that if a good job was done finishing him now and he does a good drive, he should grow grade about the no equals in his confirmation. Uh, so he'll hopefully be eligible for the 12 cents a kilo of an inspect bonus. Um, so he won't be that far off the, uh, the the QPS base price. And you know, when he's slaughtered, that will mean that his steaks, even though they'll be a bit thinner, they won't have the nice you know muscling and the nice round eye muscle that the that the con continental bred animals will have. But a lot of supermarkets and a lot of customers will still accept the beef coming from the dairy bred animal. The main difference between the two animals is going to be saleable meat yield. The meat yield from a good continental bred animal, like a ewe bred animal, is going to be, you might have 75% saleable meat yield. Whereas a planar animal will be down typically around 70, or maybe even slightly below 70% meat yield. And that's the main difference why a ewe bred animal is a lot more valuable than, for example, an ore bred animal. Yeah. And then, it's also important to note as well that a big, a big proportion of these extra calves that are registered are Angus and Hereford calves out of a dairy background. So their mother was a dairy cow and the sire would have been an Angus or a Hereford bull. Very, very popular animals as well. There's an extra 70,000 of them in the country so far this year. And, uh, you know, that's typical of that type. Um, yeah. They have a bit better confirmation and they're going to fatten and, and fleshen a bit easier than just the pure Frisian animal. And the big advantage from a farmer's point of view is that when that animal is finished, he's going to incur or he's going to be eligible for a bonus, a uh, Hereford Prime bonus, or if it was an Angus animal, he'd be eligible for an Angus bonus. And uh, in cases, if they're booked in in advance and everything like that, those bonuses can be considerable, up to 25 or 30 cents a kilo. I suppose the farmer comes back, Joe, and says, if we have 70,000 more of those Angus or Hereford type animals, yeah. would, would that premium stay there? Like, I mean, do you... Well, that's an increase of 20% this year. It's a fairly considerable increase in any given year to see 20% more of, you know, for example, Hereford bred animals. But the market would suggest that there are plenty of customers there for that beef jack. Okay. Um, you know, you have plenty of, we'll say, high-end supermarket chains, uh, restaurants, hotels that are buying the likes of Angus beef or Hereford beef. It's a premium product, it's a branded product. They're given a bit more for it, but they're happy with it because they'll put that on the menu, it's on the pack, it's something tangible that yeah. consumers can relate to yeah. and are willing to pay a little bit extra for. It. Okay. And you know, that would be a very good example of a, a successful you know, brand and, and uh, I suppose a, a bonus program that's developed in the last few years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for farmers there, I know they're never going to be the Rolls-Royce, the U-grade, um, but 
you know, farmers rearing those animals. It can be part of a very, you know, well planned and efficient production model, either rearing the calves or buying in the stock at the yearling stage and bringing them through to slaughter uh, and getting them still into a product that's going to meet the requirements of those supermarket customers. It's going to produce a steak that's going to tick all the right boxes in terms of specification and weight and fat cover and all yeah. of those different parameters. Yeah. Phelan, if I bring you in on it, in terms of, you know, the, will, will they, you know, tick the box in terms of, as Joe said, markets, yes. But obviously they're going to be finished at probably maybe a younger age. I mean, the likes of these two will probably could finish, you know, two or two months short of their two-year-old birthday, 24 months or 22 months, 21, 22 months. Like, um, yeah, and, and I suppose that's an additional point. Joe has touched on it here in, in terms of the context of the product you know, that goes off them. Just let them all the ring as they go. Yeah, you keep going. That, that, that yeah. they, um, <laughs> they have, uh, whilst it's heresy to, to breeders of, beef, of good quality beef cattle, uh, the reality is that uh, commercially uh, the, the plainer and smaller steak has its place. We all see the, the six ounce uh, steak offered in places. And again, coming back to the retailer's point of view, you know, those smaller, uh, less well-formed cattle will uh, produce, you'll get three of these steaks into a pack as opposed to two, and you will still hit the press, the price point somewhere similar to, to what you have here for the two, so there's a base for that. In terms of the finishing time, uh, the, the benefit there is now, the, you know, the recently the Taoiseach Andy Kenny was talking to the Irish Farmers Journal, and he would have reminded us that the issue of the carbon footprint uh, and Ireland's uh, need to reduce that hasn't gone away. Uh, so if we think of them, and we know that one of the big offenders in that area is the uh, uh, ruminant livestock, and in terms of reducing the emissions from ruminant livestock, Jack, the best way to achieve that is to get the maximum numbers of kilos of beef out of the animal at the earliest possible age. So something that can finish at 22, 24, 26 months uh, is a hell of a lot better than something that's going to 30 or over in, in terms of the carbon footprint from that animal. Yeah. Okay, any comments or questions on the animals that are gone outside the ring, uh, the finished animals? I mean, sorry, Joe, I mean, market out outlook, I mean, uh, you know, I suppose just very quickly, market outlook in terms of, you know, the next couple of weeks and months, like we'd say, with a lot of finished animals coming out. Yeah, well, we, traditionally at this time of the year, this is when we tend to see the peak in terms of numbers of animals slaughtered. But in actual fact, Jack, we are seeing much higher numbers of cattle slaughtered this year in the springtime, in the month of February, March, April, than what we've seen in recent weeks. And even though the weather has been bad in the last few weeks, that has pushed out a few more cattle. But still, yeah. the kill has remained very consistent at around 31 and a half, 32,000 cattle a week. The reality, Jack, is um, that numbers, you know, were, were slaughtered early in the year. You're not going to see a big kill now at this time. Um, as well as reflected in the department's uh, AIM database, there aren't uh, you know big numbers of animals there in the system. When we looked at it, there's 35,000 less male cattle in the slaughter age bracket. There's 27,000 less beef female cattle. That would suggest that the kill is going to be back by three or four thousand a week for the remainder of the year in comparison to the same weeks last year. So supply isn't going to be an issue. Uh, on the demand side, the UK market thankfully has been very good to us this year. Uh, prices there have been very strong. The exchange rate has been very favourable to us as well too. It's still around 73 pence to the euro compared to nearly 80 pence to the euro this time last year. So the UK market is very, very important. But elsewhere around Europe, it's similar to the issue that we described there with live exports. Our live exports haven't been competitive for export into markets like Italy because the beef prices around Europe have been much, much lower. We see beef prices in Europe, um, you know, at between three euro sixty and three euro eighty a kilo for our great bulls. Yeah. You know, so they're below Irish prices, and yet we still have to export half our beef into continental Europe. It's, you know, it's a challenge for us. We obviously have to try and have the best possible beef we can and get the best price we can for it. Um, but that is maybe one of the things that's, uh, you know, holding a bit of a break on uh, on the returns that we're able to get. Um, but you have to say that based on the returns from the UK market, based on the relatively tight capital supplies, you'd say that, you know, the, the market looks to be in a fairly good place. Hopefully we'll see prices again returning to where they would have been earlier on in the spring okay. and returning a margin there okay. for that winter finisher. Thank you very much, Joe Burke from Board B and Phelan O'Neill from The Journal. Peter Varley um, has six lands in sight in the ring here, and I, I want to keep it moving because I want to bring in Declan Fennell from Board B. Uh, while we have the camera, we're streaming live on, on, on the internet. So while we have the camera, I'm going to keep uh, Declan involved. But Peter, maybe just very quickly describe the, the type of lands you have, um, that, what you have in the ring, and I suppose no again, relating it to the market, Declan related to the market specification. Well, Jack, there's a lot more interest now we've seen the last few years, and especially this year in the store land trade. Um, 
beef prices have been very strong all year, so some beef farmers are opting now to buy store lambs and finish them off grass and some meal. Um, if we look here now, this be your typical lowland lamb. Um, he's 44 kg, so he'd be a short keep lamb for someone buying them, <coughs> buying them to finish. You'd expect on grass and a little bit of meal that he'd be gaining, let's say, 150 to 160 grams per day during September and early October. So you'd be expecting to get him finished off in about four weeks' time. Okay. And for the European grades, you'd be hoping to get him into 22 kilos because um, you, to, to, make, to, make, to, make, to make a margin, you, you want to be getting him um, well over 100 euro. The likes of that lamb to buy him now, you'd be buying him at, let's say, 85 to 90 euro. So yeah. if you spend a fiver on him, Jack, you'd want to be getting him in, in over the 100 euro just, just to make a bit of a margin Absolutely. on him. The other two lads are lighter, are they? The other two lads are lighter. So the likes of this lamb here, he's 35 kg. This lamb here with the purple on his shoulder, he's 40 kg. So now those lambs will take a little bit longer longer to finish off. The 35 kg lamb, maybe you'd be, you'd be keeping him into January, February. Okay. So you'd, you'd run him on grass. He'd probably be on maintenance in December, but um, if you finish him off then, maybe in January, Jack, you'd get him into a, into a weight of 22 kg. And uh, generally prices do pick up that time of year when, when there is a short sheep around. Okay. Um, then we have the crossbred sheep. Yep. So this little fella here. This, this, this little fella here. What what weight he does anyone well, think he is? Oh no, this is. What Don't. weight do you think he is? Fifteen kilos. No, a little bit heavier than that. Twenty kg. This man here is right. Um, yeah, he's twenty kg now. So he is a very light lamb, a hill bred lamb. Um, we got him down the south. He what generally. Uh, the trade for those really light lambs isn't great, Jack. It, it's it's hard it's hard to get rid of them. So what we'd be saying to do with that type of lamb is maybe to um, keep them on grass, let them build a frame up, and maybe in April time then to sell them off after intensive feeding period. So what 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 you'd be hope to do is get them into big frame, and it is possible with with some of those crossbred lambs or hill lambs is to get them into the 16 kg um, dead weight um, the European grades at the moment now if you were to get into 28 kg at this time of year you'd be only expecting let's say 9 kg carcass weight and there just really isn't a market for them at the moment but Declan will talk more and on I that I mean we use that as the cue maybe Declan and Declan Fennell from Board B just in terms of re relating the type of lens that we're looking at here to the, to the market specifications and the market requirements yeah, I suppose yeah, that was a good point and even to pick up on what Peter said there about that like land you know that other market typically we send those down to Portugal and Spain big markets taking about 40 Forty-five thousand a year. Did everyone hear that? now? that, that um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What had yeah. happened there is those markets, uh, no different to ourselves, about four years ago, went into uh, an economic meltdown. And if anything is, if anything with Spanish, what Spanish farmers are doing now is they're exporting their own sheep. If they're if they an opportunity to export their sheep up here, they would. Probably the interesting thing is, is there a market for them? The answer is yes. With a bit of work, a bit of meal in, and getting up to a finish, a good, a good weight to a French weight making sure they're well fleshed and there's good work over in the, in Chagas and that Rye and actually they've done some good field work in terms of it can be done even on another level the uh, the male blackface and there's work done over in Ackle that could be done so I suppose there's, there's good news there in the light land you know there's, there's, there's light in the tunnel even though Portugal and Spain are, are, are closed markets but probably the one thing is and, and uh, Peter mentioned there about the um, the store lambs there there was one there about 44 kg um, Another week or two, that will be getting up to a weight there, about 40, 46 or so, and you should get a kill out weight around 21, 21 and a half kg. Uh, just interesting is that we have example of, of, a, of a carcass or a, a lamb of that weight over in the Borbia stand, and we have carcass displays of an ideal overweight and over, over, over fat. Probably the big thing that's happened over the last 10 years, Jack, is that our business 10 years ago was about exporting carcasses. And we were sending something like 70% of what we exported was purely carcass business. And we are sending it into the French or the UK market. Someone else would get the value out of it. But in fairness to the industry here and the processors, if you go back to even present day, something like 65 to 70% of what we export now is primals. We're exporting so much less carcass. And the big feature of that is, I suppose, what the key takeout message is about market specification, about attention to detail. And I have an example here, here in the pack, that our business, and if we look at the last couple of years, we see where we're, you know, prices have improved. This year, prices have been very, very strong and held strong. And the big difference is, is that we get we changed our game. 
our business is all about exporting primals and spe- sending it into markets like Belgium and Germany and France. When you say primals, Dickon, sorry, you're not sorry, 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 yeah. Yeah. sending it uh, the, the, the leg, the loin, the rack, etc. Yeah. So what we're able to do is we're able to rather than sending over one product, we're able to bring up the product into individual units and we're able to select a market and say, you know, what market would give them the best price return for a leg or a loin or a rack? And that's really that's where we see the prices coming back. And I would say is, you know, when we look at the Irish uh, sheep industry, we're punching well above our weight. Just the point here is, and you'll always hear coming from the factories is in terms of what's the ideal specification, what's the ideal weight. You know, your bullseye market is like it's around your 44, 45, 46 kg, getting a dead weight around 21, 21 and a half or 22. But that's the end product, and I suppose ultimately is, as Joe and Phelan were talking about, it's about market, it's about customer specification. There's your centre line, okay? Nice central line pack and a retail pack looks well on the eye. And I always say, as consumers buy with their eye, and they also spend with their pocket. They're looking for value and they're looking for something that's good. That there is retailing there at eight euro, eight euro seventy. It's about just shy or just over four hundred and fifty grams, and it looks well in the pack. That'll do two people sitting in the frying pan and yeah. do well. Yeah. If I take out a pack here, and, and the interesting thing about this here is, this came from lightweight of forty. 46 kg, kill out weight of 20.9. Well, so you like that, you, the butcher uh, them, they're going 50, 60. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, you look at that there, yeah. that there is what, the, the 500, so it's half a kilogram. Look at the straight away, visually, it doesn't look well in the pack. Um, the vast majority of people sort of say, or the consumer that we're talking to is, they'll say no, there's too much fat in that there. And you see there, Jack, is there's a good sense of 20, 20% of fat there. That's retailing at 10 euro. The last one was what, 8 euro 70. Straight away, I'm, I'm losing 2 euro on that. Now, would that ever make a retail shelf? The answer is no, Jack, it'll never get there. The problem with that is, it came into the into the factory is, we spent unnecessary money and time putting fat onto it. And the other thing is, that won't get to your best market. So straight away, you're kind of either losing value, and, and it's not where we want to be. And I'm finishing this last one here. Yeah. And maybe this is an exaggeration, but, you know, we talk about getting sufficient fat cover, sufficient weight. You know, that, that bullseye market getting up to your 18, your 21, 22 kg, that's important. I know everyone's working towards the 100 euro mark. But this is something that's coming from a very light lamb. It's got a below your French weight, but coming from maybe at a 14, 14 uh, 15 kg. But visually, looking at the retail pack, uh, it looks pretty mean in terms of it wouldn't feel. You and I wouldn't get a meal out of that, no. just for one of us. And the other thing is, there's not enough fat cover on it. And I think you can't overstress the, the, the importance of when drafting is, you know, making sure there's sufficient fat cover. The implications are is, and that goes on the grill of the frying pan, you just fill it up and it's gone, you know? So, you know, what's the key takeout message is, is the bread and butter of this sheep industry and the future of the industry is, it's all about selling our product to the highest value. And the best way to get the value of that is finishing it off to the right specification, having a product that we compete well. And I would say one thing is, you know, when we look at Irish exports, we're doing 45,000 tonnes. The UK is twice our size, over 100,000 tonnes. New Zealand's 350,000 tonnes. We punch well above, above our weight. Okay, thanks very much to Dick and Bill for, for kind of relating that market piece in terms of the, the, the cuts that are coming and how the industry has changed away from selling the whole carcass out of the country to now selling the, the loin, the lake, the, the various cuts within the lamb. So to relate that message again in terms of what you as farmers have written, Kevin McDermott from ICBF has has a couple of lambs here, store lambs again. But Kevin, you're going to talk to us about, you know, what's the difference between these six lambs that are going to come into the ring and I suppose what the farmers can do about it to get the type of lamb that, 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 that's coming into the, into the ring right now at the moment. Uh, yeah, that's right, Jack. So, look, again, it's, it's a very similar message to what we've heard in the beef already. Um, so, like, uh, when, when it comes to indexes, the in the EBI and the beef, like, you know, we've all seen what's happened there and, you know, the extra profit we're getting from the EBI and, and the Eurostars and the beef. To, we're moving that on to the next step now and bringing that in, in, into, the, into the sheep side of things. So the six sheep we have here today um, came from John Larges flock in, in Tipperary. Um, J- John is a, a member of the Sheep Ireland CPT flocks. Um, and and the, the big difference in that being is uh, Sheep Ireland doesn't sort of full control of the breeding in that flock. Uh, so all the ewes in that flock are AI'd every year um, for, for, I suppose for the purposes of research. But apart from that, the flock is run completely commercially for the rest of the year. Um, the rams we use in that, in that CPT are rams that's coming from pedigree flocks, so like the stock rams from pedigree flocks that are breeding the rams that you are buying at the sales. 
We're bringing in those rams and we're using them to AI 100 euros a piece. Uh, and then we follow on their produce performance, uh, you know, through, through the lambs and onto the dockers as well. We'll, well. we'll concentrate on the terminal side of things at the moment. So we, we've six lambs in the ring here yeah. at the moment. Um, and you have three of them red, 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 red dots in the, on the hind quarter. Yeah, and, and that's that's to separate them by the sire. So the three with the dots uh, are all by the same sire, and the three without any of the dots then are, are by a different uh, Texas sire. So they're, they're both of them are two, by two Texas sires. Um, what we what we found in the, when those two sires was there was a, over three kilos of a difference um, when we weighed them there last weekend. Like there, that difference has been coming since since birth. So forty days, hundred days, hundred and fifty days, they've always been been heavier. So they're all the same age. They're all the same age. All these lambs have all been uh, been born within within the space of five six days of each other. You know. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and when you weighed last week, the three with the. Which is the light? Which is the? Because it's hard to see visually between them. Like, which is the lighter? Which is the heavier one? The, you know, the three red dots are the lighter ones, yeah, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and and I suppose the, the question to ask ourselves then is like, you know, on our own farms now, um, you know, you're looking at your pen of sheep. What would you be given now, like, you know, to to have all the lambs in your flock three kilos heavier? Uh, and you know, when you take into account, you know, we had them, we had the guys talking earlier saying, you know, lambs do, only doing about 150 grams a day or so at this time of year. Yeah. You know, how long is it going to take you? To, weeks, yeah. How long is it going to take you to build up that extra three or four, three or four kilos? Yeah. Uh, I suppose the point to get across is like, you know, on the day of the sale when you're buying that ram, you know, it's fair enough. You know, you, you can you can take the shape of the ram into account, uh, you know, and you can get a good conformed ram. But like, it's also important to. Use the indexes as an extra tool uh, when buying the ram, and say it is just an extra tool. The ram still has to be visually correct and functional. Um, but by using by using the indexes year after year, you can you can um, help to build up the suppose, the genetic potential of the flock to, to breed faster growing sheep. And I suppose that so, all. So effectively, you're saying the stars are working. I mean, you're using the the, the, the the five heavier, the three heavier lambs here that are three kilos heavier than the than their three comrades. They're from a five star ram. Yeah, 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 it's five star RAM on, on the growth index. The growth index. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. And, and, and that goes across all the indexes as well as, uh, as well as the survivability, number of lambs born, um, and daughters milk. Okay. All those things are coming across as well. And I suppose it's even nearly more important on, on the on the maternal side of things because you know as I say earlier, you know you can I suppose you can tell maybe to a certain degree you're standing behind an animal, how, you know what sort of confirmation they're going to breed on, but. There's one thing that you can tell by standing behind the animal on the day of a sale is how milky their daughters are going to be, or, or you know how fertile they're going to be as regards how many lambs they're going to have. Yeah. And again, that's that's always that's coming through when we put, when we put put the rams into the CBT um, and and record all the performance of the daughters and the lambs. And um, the the fives on average are always outperforming. Yeah. So as you say, similar to the beef and similar to the dairy, you're, you're gathering this information, and you know by weighing these lambs so in, 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 in the dairy world, we, we have milk every day, but you're you're weighing. How often are you weighing the lambs to get to see the differences between the? So uh, for the members that are for the breeders that are in lamb plus, they're they're weighing the lambs at 40 days, 100 days, um, and 150 days, and again each of those weights sort of tell us something different about the lambs. Yeah. So around the 40 days, the biggest contributor to the lambs growth at that stage is the ewe's milk. Um, so we can tell, you know, the the bloodlines that are producing the lamb, heavier lambs at the 40 days are generally your monthly bloodlines, and then you know, I suppose as, as time goes on, then that's where we're picking up the terminal lines. Uh, the the other thing I suppose important, like you know, when we are looking at that, the indexes neck and the, the indexes is you know, is to be selecting um, the on the right index. You know, we have the replacement index and the terminal index. If you're buying a ram solely for the purpose. Of, of producing lambs to the factory, you know, you want to be selecting a ram on the terminal sure. index, uh, and that's going to get you easier lambing and faster growing. Yeah. Whereas if you're buying a ram to produce lambs to the factory and to hold back a few replacements from him the following year, yeah. you want to be selecting on the replacement index because that's going to bring in some of your more fertility traits uh, and and your milk and and again uh, the maintenance side, right. side of it as well. So and and our our sheep farmers are, are they. Are they breeding both? Are they breeding replacements and terminals? Like, are, are they making it? Are, and are they managing separate animals, like to breed replacements or to breed terminals? Like, yeah, the, there would be. Yeah, look, I suppose the.
Oil, rapeseed oil, and uh, it's a super oil, guys. Guys, I'm just going to show you, just watch the screen in the mirror, just how we dice an onion. You're using a big knife, you go three quarters to the end of the onion, and then what we do is we hold it all together. This is probably the trickiest part here. Using a big knife, watch the fingers, and you just go three quarters in here, keeping it all together. Can you see the way I'm kind of doing a little claw on my hands? Curving my fingers, and that's what we've done there. We've diced that. So it's very, very simple. We're gonna put some garlic into this. So we'll crush the garlic here in a moment. So just take your time. I'm dicing it very fine. And honestly, people think it's a very basic thing, but you gotta get the basics right when it comes to cooking. You know, when I started training as a chef, I trained in Fermanagh College. I applied, I didn't do my leaving cert, I left after my junior cert. And then I applied for Killy Beggs. I wasn't accepted into Killy Beggs. And I went for the interview and I was made feel that small and I, I, made, I, I made a promise to myself, no, no, I'm going to be a chef. And I learned to cook, as, I suppose, as I told you, from my mother. But Killy Beggs has been very, very good to me and I go and judge different competitions and I get lots of their students down. So faith is an amazing thing. I'm a big believer in that. And kind of there is something to the story about for young, for young people to follow your dreams. It's like as a chef and uh, if you want to be a chef, it's glamorized in television, but it is hard work. It's long hours, you're working weekends when all your friends are off. So there's huge commitment. I never regret being a chef. I love my job. I love eating food too, as you can see. And I love the whole subject of food. Uh, and I've seen food change so much. Uh, I'm going to crush two cloves of garlic. There's never been a better time in Ireland to be cooking. Everyone now is a food critic, which is good. My customers are my biggest food critics. The Michelin Guide was out last week. And people say, are you disappointed we didn't get a Michelin star? And I said, no. I said, absolutely not. I just am so happy we have one of the busiest restaurants in the country, and it's all about having a good team. And I had the Michelin inspector a few years ago. It's been a while since they've been in, as far as I know. They never tell you when they're coming, actually. It's only after dinner. And uh, he said, you know, would you like your Michelin star? And I said, listen, to be honest with you, the only Michelin I want is tires on my car. And maybe I shouldn't have said that. That might have been a wee bit disrespectful, because there's a lot of pretentiousness with that. But it's great because I think we should have more Michelin stars and more, more restaurants and, and places with that. Um, so it creates, for me, it's all about giving the customers what they want. That's really important. One onion, sorry, half an onion, uh, two cloves of garlic into the pot. So if you look in the mirror, you look in the screen, whatever, scrape this out here. Okay. We're just going to let this cook off for a moment. It's a very, very simple um, kind of tomato stew I'm going to do. It's kind of like a tomato sauce, so it is. We're going to use butter beans. We're going to use a little bit of dried chili. Now, this is very hot, okay? So you just got to be careful when you are using um, chili. And this is a can of just whole peeled plum tomatoes. That's what we're going to put in here. We're going to flavor it with a little bit of vinegar and some sage. We're going to put in some sage in here, so we are in a moment. It's quite an interesting herb with uh, lamb. Usually, it's traditionally served with pork, but uh, with lamb, it works really well. So let's put in our tomatoes, okay? Put them all in, if you can see in the mirror. Turn that down and kind of crush them up a little bit. So we're kind of stewing the tomatoes here. You can put smoked bacon into this if you want to. So just break them at the back of the spoon. Give you that there, Claire. Thank you. I'm going to put a tiny little bit of chilli. I don't want whoever wins this to burn them out of them. When chilies are dried, the seeds are dried, and it's always very, very spicy. So I'm literally going to put a tiny little pinch of chilies in there. That's all I'm going to put in. I'm going to put in some vinegar, and I'm going to put in a tiny little bit of sage. So, Claire, if you get me a little bit of sage. This is some red wine vinegar, but any vinegar will do, guys. You don't have to go out and buy red wine vinegar. Just a little splash. Now, if you find with tomatoes, they're a little bit sharp, acidic, put a pinch of sugar in there. Brown sugar, white sugar, it doesn't really matter, whatever you have. Thank you, Claire. Okay, that's a little bit of vinegar. Sage. I have to be honest with you, sage is a herb I don't use an awful lot. It's lovely and stuffy. We all think of it at Christmas with the turkey and Christmas will be upon us very, very quickly. I love Christmas because every year I cook for my family. And last year I had about 35. Uh, in, we do it in the restaurant and uh, it's just a great family. We, 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 we close the restaurant for four days. So it's a great family occasion, so it is. So I always make kind of like a nice kind of like sage, onion, dried cranberry, uh, pine nut and apricot stuffing, really good. So I'm gonna put in the sage here, guys. Just sprinkle that in. I will finish it with flat leaf parsley. And I just wanna talk to you now, I want this to stew down. I'm gonna bring it to the boil. And I'm just going to let that kind of cook down a little bit. And I'm probably making half the recipe than what you have in your booklet. I'm only making a small amount of it. So let's talk about the beans I'm going to put in. If you can see, I'm trying to hold it up to the fixed camera, in the mirrors, whatever. These are already cooked. You know when I make a vegetable soup, I put them in. Always have a can of these at home. They're wonderful. If you make a pot of mince, 
I'd make mints, traditional mints, with uh, Worcester sauce, uh, vegetables, uh, onion, uh, garlic, carrots, and put, finish them with butter beans, gorgeous. Haricot beans, all those kind of beans are really good for you and wonderful in a soup. So they are really, really lovely. So um, I'm going to put them in at the last minute just to warm through. They're already cooked. They're soft, guys. They're completely soft. So they'll add nice texture to it. And actually, this is lovely in a soup. Last week, everyone, we were recording, and Mairead very kindly mentioned that I've just finished recording uh, my latest show for RTE, which is uh, Healthy um, Home Chef. Now, we haven't finished it yet. We, we, we have about maybe um, six more guest chefs. But I was with Sonia Sullivan uh, last week. I was in Fota Island. Has anyone ever been there? That's amazing. I was never there. I, I cannot wait to bring my twins. It was fantastic. So we were there because she was there with her family and herself and her daughter went running and then I decided to join them. So they had probably 5K done and then we ran about 3K and I was, oh God, I was out of breath, I can tell you. But we had such fun. And then we cooked a dish and she'd done a lovely hake dish with a clonakilty kind of crust. She'd done really nice polenta chips with rosemary oil. They were delicious, weren't they? With Ballymaloo relish. It was really good. So she was a lovely lady. And then I asked her, would she come up and launch my book, Monda? And she did. And that's a busy woman. And tonight, as a wee treat, I'm, I'm bringing her, well, I won't be there tonight, but she's coming down to the restaurant in Black Lion with her family, with her husband, and she's meeting a friend. So that's my way of thanking her, you know. We call that bartering in Cavan. We love to barter, don't we? <laughs> I know, but she's wonderful. She really is. So this is a new program. I was in Airfield last week, everyone, recording. And it's a, it's a, a new program uh, for RTE that I have um, that I've just started. And it's going to be lovely. I think it's going to be really good. Has anyone ever been to Airfield? Oh, wow. What a place. I didn't know about it six months ago. And it's just beside Dundrum Shopping Centre. It's super, guys. It really is. And what's lovely about it and we may take this for granted because I live in the country, my uncle is a farm, but there's children that will never even see live chickens or, or milk um, cows. They have all this experience for kids and they grow everything. It's super and I really would recommend it. And they have beautiful food uh, in the cafe. It's excellent. I couldn't read about sing, sing enough praises. So we were cooking all my recipes outdoor. Last week was a nice week, so we were very lucky. Guys, I'm going to talk to you about lamb, okay? This is for the stew. We're going to sear this off. We're going to cook our lamb pink, okay? Not rare, but pink. I'm going to talk to you about the cut that I'm using. It's a really lean cut. And it's um, the loin of lamb. So the loin of lamb is uh, similar to the strip loin of beef, uh, sirloin of beef. It's a very tender cut. I've just got this. This is board be a quality assured Irish lamb. And we get this from Donegal, but it's from a butcher just near us in, in Black Lion that we get the lamb. So I asked him just to trim off all the actual fat in the lamb. We want this really kind of healthy and low fat, but I love lamb. And this can be done lovely because this is an expensive cut with lamb cutlets, pork chops, or chicken breast. This lovely um, stew that I'm doing, it works really well. And even some fish. Uh, this would work really well with salmon. Uh, I would even uh, serve that with some hake or monkfish. It really is good. So we're very lucky that we have such great meat. So what I've done, what Claire has done, is marinated it, everyone, with um, rapeseed oil and some rosemary. And we're just going to season it up. So when you're cooking any kind of meat, the secret is to season it up. Sorry, bring it to room temperature and season it just before it goes onto the pan. So a little bit of salt and pepper. Make sure your pan is hot. Even if it takes a minute, just wait, take your time. And then we're going to cook this nice and pink. All right, I'm going to show you how to sear it in the oven. I'm going to put a tiny little bit of butter just for flavor, also for color. And I think butter, I mean, like, with my new book, The Healthy Food, it's all about small steps. It's not a diet book. It's about kind of introducing healthier food, juices, that kind of thing, to people's uh, lifestyle, to their diets. Because healthy is the buzzword now in food. It really is. And people want to feel good. Not the, and good food, I mean, like, w when you think of it, it's all about reconnecting with food, where our food comes from. And some of you here, I know you're wonderful cooks, and you could cold some fresh food, but a lot of people don't. They have no idea even how to roast a chicken or do something like that. So there are skills that are lost. Guys, I'm going to sear this off, and I'm going to put it season side down. I hope you can see this in the screen, okay? Thank you, um, Claire. A little bit more salt on the outside. And then we're just going to let this cook for about two minutes on either side. I'm going to put a tiny little bit of butter. So it's a very lean cut. So the saddle, everyone, is from, sorry, the loin of lamb. You get two little loin of lambs, and then there's a little fillet underneath. So we get them boned, usually with the skin on, and that's where the belly comes. So it's this part of the animal. It's the back of the animal there. That is a very lean cut. You just trim it up so you do. Your butcher will do that. Serve this, as I say, with, um, with, with, with pork cutlets you know, or even lamb cutlets, they work really well. Now, back onto our stew, if you can see this just in the overhead mirror. We're gonna let this stew away there for a few minutes. 
I'm going to just throw my eye just for a second just in the oven, just how the sticky toffees are doing. Too early to take them out, but they've risen because of the two raisin agents. And I'll take them out and I'll show you. I bet you're all hungry, are you? Well, the food village, if you go out the door, you take a left and take another left. There's lots of nice places to eat. Uh, we are going to raffle off the food. Now, look in the mirror, look in the screen, look in the cameras, because this is what we've got here. It's nicely caramelized. And, and that's what you call to sear a piece of meat. I'm going to put it into the oven, on the pan. These are non-stick enamel pans. These are expensive pans, guys. These are about 130 euro a pan. That's a lot of money. And especially coming from a calf, man, it's a hell of a lot of money. But anyway, it's a... Uh, they're worth it because they go to higher um, smoke temperature and they don't uh, lose their coating. So that's very important. So these are the pans we use in the cookery school. I'm going to flip that over one more time. I hope you can see that there. I'm going to pop it in. It's completely blue at the minute. Don't cover it, this oven here. Sorry, Claire. All right. I'm going to go in. The oven's at about 190. Okay. So I'm going to let that cook away. My um, tomatoes are on stewing, which I'm very happy with. I'm going to finish that with parsley. Don't let me forget the feta, I forgot a jester, and then the butter beans. So it's great when you're recording on the television, because if you forget anything, or you burn anything, not that we'd ever burn anything, we caramelize it, we can re-record it. You know, one of the hardest dishes I ever had to do on the television, and all the cooking is done in my house, literally in my house, behind where I live, in Black Lion. So the crew come down, and it's the same producer who has recorded over 105 programs with me for RT. David Hare is his name, a gentleman. So he looks after Donald Ski, and he would have done Rachel Allen, in, in her earlier years, what a lady she is. And you know when my twins were born, uh, what she sent, two little baby grows for the twins, give peas a chance, not peace, peas, garden peas. <laughs> and that's a busy woman. Oh, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Now, they can't fit into them, they're well past that. But that's such a lovely lady. Guys, I'm going to show you um, a nice marinade for chicken. We have some already done, okay? So I'm going to get my griddle pan on. Are you okay? Okay. Kira's going around with the tickets. So everyone, these are your raffle tickets. If you're not in, you can't win. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna give away the food and we're gonna give away a cookbook. Would you like that? Of course you would, wouldn't that be a nice little treat? Now, <coughs> pardon me. I had an awful sore throat yesterday, so I'm getting better, I'm getting better. Guys, I wanna show you, um, <laughs> Claire has the water. This is only water, okay? It's not vodka or gin, I promise. Mm. Cheers, Pep. Okay, a marinade for pork. Um, lamb cutlets would work well with this. Uh, turkey breast, but chicken is fantastic. I'm going to show you a little bit of curry powder, mild curry powder. And um, our twins are funny; they don't like spicy food. When you give Connor something spicy, which I don't cook many spices, he actually cries. He doesn't know what's going wrong with his little palate. So, just what I would say to introduce some spices into your kids: just do it gradually. You know, and you can always, of course, flex your muscles and do that. This is a wonderful soya sauce, everyone, and it's called ketchup manis. It's a really lovely, um, um, sweet, low in salt soya sauce. This is excellent. Asian markets, some supermarkets sell it, and uh, some health food shops. Look how thick it is in the screen. It's so good. I use this all the time in stir fries, marinades. It's wonderful. Thank you. And then a little bit of honey. So just a little drizzle, and this is some olive and honey which is not made not too far from here in Kilkenny. Okay, thank you so much. And we just mix this all together. So what I got Thomas to do this morning, and Thomas is one of the chefs with me, okay, from Donegal, my thanks to him, and to Claire for all their hard work. I got him to do little, uh, kind of like skewers. So what we did with the chicken, everyone, we sliced the chicken lengthways. Not across, lengthways, and it looks better, I think so. These are little bamboo skewers. Place your chicken in. Three for a breast is what you'd get, depending on the size of the chicken breast. We have these marinating since last night, is it? In the fridge, okay, really important, in the fridge. So probably after an hour or two, you need to turn them over just to get the chicken coated with the marinade. But try this with pork chops, it's gorgeous, it really is. The wee bit of curry powder is very interesting. The wee bit of honey uh, gives lovely sweetness. Now before I cook them, which I will do in a moment, we're gonna do a satay sauce for you, but I just wanna show you the sticky toffees if that's okay. And I wanna check the lamb too, I wanna make sure that I don't uh, overcook the lamb. So just very quickly guys, these need to go back into the oven, they're not done, I know by looking at them. They're soft, okay? So that's what we're looking for. See how, how they've risen up? That's why you don't overfill them. You have a carbonate of soda and you also have uh, self-raising flour. So they're cooking up nicely. It says there's six more minutes to go on that. Let's have a little look at our lamb. I don't think it'll be done. I will serve a pink, but I will flip it over. 
and I just want to show you what I mean by it being nice and soft and pink. So we'll just press this. That's a little bit too rare now at the minute. Uh, I'm going to give that about another maybe two, three minutes. Then I'm going to take it out. I'm going to let it rest. And the reason why I let it rest, everyone, is to let the, um, the juices go back into the meat. If I slice it straight away, I've lost what I want. That's a beautiful piece of meat. And look at the nice bit of color there, if you can see that there. All right, so that's a wonderful, wonderful lamb is delicious. So when we cook lamb in the restaurant, everyone, we use the lamb shoulder, we use the lamb rum, we use the lamb loin, we use sweetbreads, we use lamb shanks. It's so versatile. It's one of my favorite meats. And usually when we do a dish in the restaurant, we um, do it three or four different ways. So you might get the, the, the loin, the sweetbread, and the braised shoulder. So you're showcasing what a great ingredient the lamb is. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put in my butter beans. Claire, do you have them there? Here, sorry, Pet. Thank you. Stir them in. We're going to make our satay sauce, okay, which doesn't take long to do. So I just want to bring this back to the boil. So these are the beans. If you can look on your screens, everyone in the mirror, absolutely great texture, lovely flavor. And, you know, they're not very strong, but they, add, they really add a lovely creaminess is the best way to describe them to this. So I'm going to let them cook out there for a few minutes. I'm going to make a satay sauce. Peanut butter, crunchy peanut butter. I've already spoke about the soya. We're going to use coconut milk. Does anyone know the company Thai Gold? Irish company based in Wexford. We don't grow coconut in Ireland, we know that, but it's the best, the best. Uh, in the afternoon, we're going to do a nice uh, red curry. Red curry with beef, rump of beef and rice, and we use their coconut milk and their Thai curry paste. It's fantastic, absolutely brilliant. So let me show you what goes into our satay sauce. We put in some peanut butter, and this is a really thick peanut butter. You know, there is a difference in some of the peanut butters, whatever one you prefer. Now I'm going to use, I think, a whisk will be good for me doing this. Scrape that out, okay, into the pan, some soya sauce. I bet you you love the way I measure everything, I just chuck it in. When my wife cooks at home, everyone, she's very particular about measuring things, whereas I add this and I add that, and that just comes with experience, you know. Um, a sweet chili sauce, it's not going to be hot. In the recipe it says fresh chili, it's up to you. So sweet chili, you'll get a little bit of sweetness and you'll get a little bit of heat, but you won't burn your mouth, promise you that. Ginger, I love ginger. So peel the ginger, everyone, uh, wrap it in cling film and freeze it. Take it out of the freezer, unwrap the cling film, and then what you do, everyone, is you just simply uh, grate it, which I'm you doing here. These are wonderful graters called micro graters, or micro plane, and you just simply sit them on top of the pot. So just watch the fingers here. Okay, now, so, our lamb is in. Claire, I'm gonna check the lamb now in one minute, okay? Don't let me forget. I need to take it out and I need to let it rest. So the ginger goes in, I love ginger. You can put garlic, I'm not putting garlic into it. I'm gonna put in the coconut milk and this is just half a can that I have in here, everyone. So when I make a, li a little dessert at home for the twins, rice pudding, who doesn't like rice pudding? So you get pudding rice and what you do is put it into a saucepan, thank you, with some, with some um, full fat milk, lemon zest, lime zest, a vanilla pod and no, no sugar, no sugar. Finish, finish it at the end when the rice is cooked with coconut milk, it's beautiful. Put in some sultanas, uh, some sliced bananas, really gorgeous. And if you want to, you can drizzle it with a little bit of maple syrup. So it's really, really lovely. Now guys, we're gonna warm this up, okay? We're gonna put lime juice into this. Uh, no salt, I don't think it'll need it. Uh, it should be sweet, it should be a little bit spicy. Just while that's coming to the boil, don't let me forget about um, the, the lime. I'm gonna put in a little bit of palm sugar. So this is from Thai Gold. I'm not a rep, I don't work for Thai Gold. I think they're a great company. I think they have great products. And you've probably heard me mentioning them on the television show. I just think they're the best. And the fact that they're an Irish company, that's important. Okay, thank you. Okay, gonna take out the lamb. We're gonna cook our chicken. Gonna let the lamb rest. So let me just show you here. I'm gonna show you now exactly what I mean by testing meat. So we're gonna let, lift this off. I'm gonna move that over there, Claire. Be careful, it's hot. I'm gonna wrap this. So we press the meat, everyone. Will you all do this very, very carefully? Just your thumb and your index finger here. Press underneath your thumb. It's rare. You like your lamb rare? Perfect. Move up to your next finger, medium. You all doing it? Who's pressing the elbows? Come on. Move up to your next finger, medium well. And your last finger, well done. Feel the way that toughens up. So that's really important. I'll show you now, I'll just wrap this and I'll do it one more time. We're gonna wrap it in tin foil. We're gonna serve up our lamb in one moment. So just go through it again. For steak, lamb, chicken, any meat. Rare, 
lovely and soft. Medium, medium well, and well done. And that's really important. Now let's cook our chicken. The chicken is marinating, everyone. I'm just going to drizzle it with a little bit of oil. And you'll find when you marinate it overnight in the fridge, it will firm up. And that's the soy sauce, so it is. And a little bit of the spice. So just a little bit of oil. It's going to go oil side down. Okay. My satay sauce is coming to the boil. Perfect. And then what I'm going to do, everyone, I am going to let Claire look after this, and I'm going to serve up my lamb. So uh, we have one minute to go on the sticky toffees, but they are going to take, I think, another extra four minutes. I think so. Right, are we all hungry? I'd say you're absolutely starving. Guys, this sauce, see this sauce here? Forget about marinating the chicken. This sauce, make it and put some cooked chicken into it at home. It's really, really good. Uh, with the marinade, uh, Claire, we'll put a little bit of that over when we turn the chicken. We need to cook this out because we've had raw meat in it, okay? So no point in brushing it. You can put it into a saucepan and then brush it over if you want to. What I'm gonna do next, in case I forget, I'm gonna put the lime in here. And I think because I just made small portion, I'm just going to put half a lime there and I'll taste it. Thanks, Claire. Brilliant. Okay. So that's my bin. We're going to finish our butter bean stew, everyone, with some parsley. When you're keeping any kind of herbs at home, everyone, what I like to do is to put damp tissue on them. You can use a little bit of coriander. What have I got here? I have some basil. I may as well use that. I think we need to get more parsley, Claire. I think so. There's a little bit there. Is it there? Okay. Oh, there. It's hiding on me. Thank you. So guys, what you're going to smell now is the chicken. Claire, you might turn them and they can have a little look at that. It is beginning to caramelize on the outside. And that's the honey, okay? And that's also the soy sauce. So they'll probably stick a little bit. Yeah, that's it. Good woman. Perfect. Flip them over. Beautiful. Well done. Thank you. And then what we'll do, Claire, we'll pour some of the marinade over it. So I'm going to, I'm going to just chop the herbs, everyone, using the big knife. Watch the fingers. And then we're going to put this into our pot with the beans and all that, and don't chop it fine. It just goes in at the last minute. So scrape that in there, gorgeous. I'm gonna be a wee bit noisy now doing the chicken because Claire's putting on the marinade. I'm gonna turn it down. Beautiful, Claire, thank you. Okay, it won't take long because the chicken is cut really, really thinly. Okay, let's serve up our lamb. We need to season it up. I don't think I put so. Do you know what I forgot to mention is lovely in this? Is um, smoked paprika. If you make a tomato soup or a tomato sauce, it's really good. It's smoky, it's sweet, it's not spicy, it's really good spice to have. Right, I'm gonna switch off the chicken. I don't want it to uh, overcook, all right? Just turn it over again. You've done a really good job on that, Claire. This one is a little bit bigger, so it's gonna take a little bit longer, this one here. Wow. Yeah, perfect, well done. Guys, look what I'm doing, I'm just, just pinching these here. Now, okay, so what's caramelizing here, guys, is the actual marinade. You'll smell that, and if you overcook it, it will burn. Okay, so we just want to make sure that the chicken is cooked through. Turn it over. I'm going to move this one over here that it doesn't over caramelize. That's a great job. Thank you so much. Do you mind moving it over there out of the way? Good woman. Thank you. Well, it just makes a little bit more room for me. So I've switched off the pan for the chicken. I'm going to serve up now the lamb and then the chicken, and then we're going to do our sticky toffee. Is that okay, everyone? So I'm just going to get my spoon, bring over the bowl. So this is a nice kind of like a, a bean, a rustic kind of bean stew. All right. And that just there, guys, with chicken, pork, whatever, it works really well. I'm going to get my lamb. I'm going to give you that, Claire, because I know you need to put that in. Be careful. That left handle is very hot. We're going to just get our lamb, and then we're going to slice it. Now, when you're slicing lamb, everyone, we're going to use a nice sharp knife, and we're going to use a little bit of kitchen paper. So just with the knife, slice it nice and thin. Perfect. It's pink. It's not too rare. I don't know if you can see that there on the screen. And that's the way, I'd like it a little bit less cooked than that, if I'm being honest with you. But it's not, it's, not, um, it's not in any way blue or too pink, it's gorgeous. Because it's so lean, everyone, if you cook this well done, it's going to dry out and it's going to toughen up. And it's too expensive. It's too good of a cut to do that, you know. So um, just slice this really, really thinly. And it's a very lean cut. Remember that. That's the whole idea behind this. It's a lovely, healthy, quick recipe. So it is. Arrange the lamb on top. I'm going to finish with a little bit of feta cheese. There's your lunch, Claire. I hope you like lamb. Don't show anyone. Here, Claire. Good woman yourself. Don't tell anyone. A little bit of feta cheese. Thanks for eating it. Uh, we're going to put it here. Little cubes of feta cheese. What did she do with it? Did she give it to somebody? <laughs> a little sprinkle here. Now, when I met Claire, she liked the lamb and her meat's well done. And now it's about educating her about bringing it down to medium well and then medium. And that's it. You'll enjoy it more. A little drizzle of chili oil because we have it here. 
And guys, that's my first recipe for you all, okay? That is our lamb, our little lamb, um, the loin of lamb with the butter bean and tomato uh, stew, okay? Thank you very much. Super. Okay. Now, I'm going to taste my satay. Uh, I just need to check that. And if you get me a plate clear, we're going to do our sugar next. My God, that is good. Do you know what it is? It's not spicy. It's really kind of fragrant. Oh, I love it. I drink that by the cupful. You know that? Delicious. I love those flavors. Kenneth, I think I'm going to give you a run for your money with your satay. I'm feeling very confident here. Whenever he makes satay at home, I'm only allowed to chop the peppers and the onions. He won't even allow me near the pot. But anyway, I hope he enjoys this. We'll keep you a little bit, Kenneth. So that's our satay, guys. You'll see it now in the dish. Pour it in. It's not a heavy, it's not a thick satay. Exactly what I want. You can put cooked chicken into that. You can put um, and warm it through, or you can put any kind of meat. Beef will work really well with that. Okay, now, let's get our little kebabs. Let's check them first. They're perfect. So they're just firm to the touch. Nice little bit of a kind of grill effect from the, um, the griddle pan. Thomas, I might get you to take this. Just get the hammer and chisel to it. I'm only joking you. If you soak it in boiling water, it'll come off, so it will. And guys, that's my second recipe for you. That is the chicken skewers. Thank you very much. It's hot. Are you strong enough to lift this? Okay. Good man yourself. Thank you. Are we happy with that, everyone? With the satay? Enjoy. Now, when we're raffling off the food, you're not getting my plates. We have lovely little foil containers here that, that we'll give you. So we're going to have a little bit of fun doing some sugar. We're going to make a nice sauce, okay? And then we are going to, that'll be the end of the demonstration. I'll only keep you a few more minutes. Are you all enjoying it? Super, okay. Well, we'll be back on at one o'clock with a totally different recipe. And uh, yeah, I, do, I just got great energy from the audience. It's fantastic. So I want to introduce a lovely young lady. Grace, come on up. Come on up to me. I love your wellies. We'll have a little bit of a chat here. Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. Gentlemen. Okay. Give her a big round of applause. This young lady. Now, tell everyone your full name. Grace Arden. Where are you from? Uh, Cork. What part of Cork? McCroom. McCroom. Very good. There's some great butchers in McCroom. <laughs> Toomey's Butchers, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Known very well. So Claire is from Cork too. Claire is from outside the city. Do you like cooking? Yeah. How old are you? Nine. Do you have a nine and a half? Do you have a boyfriend? No. No, not yet. Okay. And what kind of things do you like to cook? Uh, uh, pavlova, shepherd's pie. Good. Um, garlic bread, and lots of stuff. Wow. You're here with your mum? Yeah. Your mum, sorry. Here. Okay. <laughs> and uh, have you any brothers and sisters? Uh, Gavin. Who? Gavin. Gavin, so one brother. Well, you're very welcome. We're going to have a little bit of fun doing some sugar. Is that okay? Yeah. And then we're going to serve up our, our sticky toffee. And we might give you one to take away. Would you like that? <laughs> Do you like sticky toffee? She was the only one that reacted. When I said sticky toffee, she said, what? Didn't you? I saw your reaction. Okay. So, Grace, lovely to have you. I'm going to show you this now. So, what we've done, you have this in the back of your booklet. So, out of this sauce I'm going to show you, we're going to make a... Sorry, out of this caramel, we're going to make a lovely sauce. So, we've got to be careful because it is hot. So Grace, the secret into this is sugar, water, glucose. You cook it for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then what you do, you get a lovely caramel. So if you've seen me at the plowing before a demo, I always do this. This is one of the things that we always get the audience involved in, and it's just great fun. So we hold this over and back, pet. And then I have the ladle oiled, just with plain oil. No garlic, no chili, no lemon, just some plain oil. So see the way I'm going crisscross, but yeah? And then you finish it off, and then the secret is to hold this, and we just lift this off, and then that should set, and then we take it off, and we have a beautiful basket like that. Whoa, isn't that cool? Now, what we're gonna do, Grace, I'm gonna get you to go. I'm gonna help you. Are you left or right-handed? Right. Right-handed, good woman. Now, hold this nice and high. I'll get you started, pet. That's okay, you grab the spoon, and we'll just start off together. So hold that down, well done. Well done, over and back. That is super, over. That's a very, is that a, a telephone number on your arm, yeah? Is that your mum's? In case you get lost? No, that's good, that's very clever. That's smart, that's really smart. Very impressed. Just go to the front, pet. I'm gonna let go now, I'm gonna let you finish it, okay? Hold it higher, you control the sugar. She's doing brilliant, she's gonna be a natural pastry chef. What do you think? So would you like to be a chef? Yeah. You would you? Well, when you get older, will you come up and work for me for a few days? Would you like that? Maybe. <laughs> Do you that? Maybe. Fair enough. Come here now, here. 
I like honesty. Don't worry. You will. Do you know we get a lot of young chefs that do transition year? We had a lovely... Uh, we, had, we get quite a few from St. Mary's in... Um, they're actually in Mallow. So you, you take that off and show everyone that basket. Wow. Go, girl. Well done. Now, we have a little gift for you for coming up. And listen, all joking apart, if you love cooking, you want to be a chef, I recommend it. It's hard work. And never, actually, I'll show you, and we'll chat as we're doing this. I'll show you Angel's hair. You know, I've been cooking from the age of 12. I learned from my mother. So obviously, your mom is a good cook, and you love that. And to be able to cook with them, that's fantastic. But, you know, when you work in a kitchen, and when you get older, I recommend you get a couple of days' work in a, a local cafe, a restaurant, whatever like that. You can work in good places, you can work in bad places. And you can work in places where there might be a little bit of shouting. That doesn't happen in our kitchen. We respect people. Cooking is all about loving, cooking what you cooking with your heart and enjoying what you do. That's the most important thing. And hopefully when you get older, you might come up and spend a few days if you want to. Think about it. Don't give me an answer now. Uh, so what we have is some sugar, and that is what we call angels here there. Okay? That's for you. Go for it. Now, we're gonna do one more. And the sugar can has got to be cooling down for this. This is a little curl. So I'm going to heat this up, everyone. I'm going to make a quick sauce, and that's the demo finished, all right? So make sure you have your raffle tickets. <laughs> make sure you have your uh, booklets. And thank you to Kira, who's been flat out doing work with a journal and giving out tickets. It hasn't stopped. She's been really, really looking after me. Thank you again. OK, now this is really interesting. So this, do you know what this is? No. For sharpening a knife. It's a steel. It's a steel that you use for sharpening a knife. And you've got to move fast. It's still a wee bit hot. So just let it cool down just a little second more. OK. And then you run this around here. And what happens is that the steel, or excuse me, the sugar will actually set on the steel. Break off at each end. Watch this. Look at the screen, guys. Look at the screen. A lovely little sugar curl. How cool is that? And that looks really well for presentation. These baskets and that lovely uh, sugar that you are munching away at the minute will keep for three weeks in an airtight container. All right, now, I'm going to make a sauce now. I'm going to give you that as a little bas basket for you to take. We have a little goodie bag for you. Have you got it there? Well done. Have you strawberries in it? Did you all get to taste strawberries if you were here early? Pat Clark, we're going to be talking about them in a minute. Thank you so much. This is a little book for you, Grace. The book is there. Thank you. And you have what? Sticky toffee? Go, girl. See you. Thanks a million. Well done. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, well done. We are going to just do a very simple uh, sauce now, and then we're going to serve it up, and that's it finished. So Claire's going to prep a little bit of strawberries. Pat Clark, he's here at the stand, and the stand is 655, and he has a little booklet that I've come up with recipes using all his fruit. Have you used his fruit? Have you tasted his jams? Fruit? Superb. Superb. He's one of the best growers in the country, in my opinion. So guys, watch the screen now. I'm going to show you this sauce. I'm going to show you how to make a caramel sauce first. And then, what's that? The which gone? Oh, the camera's gone. Camera's gone, sorry. It's gone next door to the lads. it's gone next door, is it? Okay, 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 okay. So we just whisk this up here, guys. So we have a caramel here, sugar, water, glucose. I'm going to add in some cream. Don't panic, not all of this. I'm going to put in about 100 milliliters of cream. About that. Now, I'm going to show you what happens when I add the cream in. This sauce I'm showing you, everyone, forget about the sticky toffee, is so good. With apple tart, apple crumble. Look at the way it goes lumpy. So you just keep whisking this. If you don't want to make this with cream, I think it's the nicest with cream, uh, you can use apple juice. You can use orange juice, or you can use pineapple juice. So you just whisk this here. Clear another tiny bit more cream. You're just too quick, pet. OK, thank you. And you just whisk this. I think it just needs a little bit more cream because I'm obviously making a little bit more. Now we just whisk this all together. And that is a caramel sauce. Can I show you now how to make a butterscotch? It'll only be a minute. Okay? The butterscotch sauce, everyone, is some rum, vanilla, vanilla, vanilla extract, just a little splash, a little bit of butter, and then a little splash of rum if you have it. It's really good. This sauce that I'm showing you, everyone, will keep for about three weeks in an airtight container. It probably won't last three minutes. It's so delicious. It's so really good with, um, what I would serve this with is uh, an ice cream, sliced bananas, and toasted nuts. I'm gonna put in literally two and two more little cubes of butter, and then whisk that through, and that's our sauce made. And to make it that salty butterscotch sauce that you have in your book, some sea salt for mackle, a little sprinkle of that, and that's it made. So we just whisk this all together, everyone. We're gonna serve up our sticky toffee. Claire has some strawberries done, 
and then we're going to do our raffle. So after this uh, demonstration, everyone, I'll be over there with my brother Kenneth. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, signing copies of my book. Yes, Kenneth. Who's there? Who's there? Dolan. Oh, okay, I'm going to pour this in here. And that's our sauce, guys. And you may look at that. It looks a bit runny. It will thicken up as it cools down. It's so delicious. So it is. Now, let me show you these sticky toffees. They're still warm. How easy they are mold. Every one of them. So they're floured and they're buttered. Okay? You can use them again. Definitely for panna cottas, for little individual puddings. They're great. How long will these keep? Will you mind moving that? They'll keep happily in your fridge for up to about three or four days. And you can freeze them. People love things they can freeze. So can I just show you, we'll just serve one up here. A couple of little strawberries, just around the plate. I would serve this with some ice cream. I would serve this also with a little bit of whipped cream or one or the other. Your sauce on top, everyone. Lovely and shiny. And then your little sponge sugar basket. And then your little curl, which is really delicate. And that's my last dish for this time. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been okay. Thanks a million, everyone. Thank you to Claire to uh, Thomas and to Jerry and Kenny here that, that's with me over here. So guys, we're going to do a raffle, okay? And then I'll be over here if you want to get a copy of the book. So if you're not in, you can't win. Have you all got your tickets? Put your hand up. Kira's going round. Yeah. If you want to ask any questions, the booklets, everyone. There's loads of booklets here. Can I just thank our sound technician, Jason? You're playing a blinder. Thanks a million, gentlemen. Okay, guys, this is our booklets here. And the recipe will be different at one o'clock. We'll be doing a nice beef curry. We'll be doing um, chocolate brownie and what's the other dish? The other dish we're doing? Salmon, thank you. I had a mind blank. Thank you, Kira. I should know. We're doing salmon wrap, so we are. Okay, the first ticket is 486. 486, green. Green, green, green is the colour. 486. You have it. There's a happy woman. Well done. I hope you're not vegetarian. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Okay, so that's the first dish. Clear will organise that. Now, guys, how nice does that look? Uh, beautiful, just delicious. Thank you, Pep. Green again, 536 for the second lot of food. And there's my brother in law, Donald Murphy. Uh, hello, how are you? Good to see you, good man. I should have got him up for the sugar. He's not very good at the cooking. 536, anyone got it? Well done, fantastic. And we have uh, two more, Kira. Pink one this time. Just wait two minutes, guys, and we'll get you your food. 485, a pink ticket, anyone got it? This is very lucky. 485, is that you? Well done. We're flying it today, Kira. Donald, would you like some sticky toffee? Are you sure? He doesn't like my cooking. I'm only joking. Okay, this is for the book. Isn't that right, Kira? Yeah. So, guys, this is for my healthy book, okay? Nation's Fair Food Healthy, and it's a green ticket. 537. 53. Well done. Brilliant. That was a lucky corner. So, guys, thank you all very much. Thank you to Kira. Uh, I'll be over here if you want to get a copy of the book, and we'll see you again at one o'clock. Enjoy the plowing, everyone. Thank you, Grace. Well done. Okay, brilliant. I do, I know what you mean. All you can do is lay. Yeah. 
I watched my food and was back, walked back back to the Well, <laughs> yeah, no, we so live in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. <laughs> happy in the cattle sure. ring under, in front of the camera now. I'm sure the minister doesn't want to eat back there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be there. No, 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 no. Um, what's the problem? I suppose you're all wondering what's going on here now. Um, what we're doing actually, this is launching November, which is a campaign um, linked in with November to raise the awareness of men's health. Um, and what we're doing actually, we're just waiting for the minister is officially launching it, and he's five minutes away, so that's why we're waiting. We should be we should be kicked off. But what we're doing is we're going to be talking about men's health. We also have a volunteer, a victim, I suppose it's like to call them, for the, for the cutthroat, uh, um, clean shave, cutthroat razor, clean shave. We see T.J. Reid here from, you might recognise him from, from Kilkenny. Um, he's, he's, just, he's, he's agreed to become an ambassador, I suppose, for November. He's also going to grow a moustache over November. I haven't, I haven't told him yet, whatever, you know, but he can start growing it from now if he wants after the shave. But he's going to do that. He's taking time, he's been working in, in um, where, what stand are you working in? I was wondering about the Goulding on, on, on your top there now. I was wondering, I thought you might have a bit of better advertise, but Connolly's Red Hill. Connolly's Red Hill, so he's working on the stand down there all day, so he's actually taking a break, and he's going to be lying in the chair. He'll go to sleep probably in a few minutes, whatever, when they're doing it. So we'll wait for the minister to get going, but I suppose we can probably talk a little bit a little bit about the initiative. I mean, it's something November. Is it something we started in the journal last year, and, and really it is about uh, creating awareness on men's health. And because we all know, I mean, the, the livestock demonstrations were in here beforehand, and I mean, we all know the farmers actually look after their livestock better than they look after themselves, and they're more likely to call a vet even though they think it's expensive. And as Liam, Liam was saying, call a vet than, than basically um, call, go to the doctor for themselves, unless there's a real problem, their legs hanging off, or, or they can't get out of bed in the morning. So I mean, that that was the whole aim. We started last year. We actually raised through November. We raised thirty-eight thousand euros. Um, for the charity, and we were the number one, we're the team, farmers growing for November, we're the, we're the team which actually raised the most. And it wasn't just men, there's more bros and there's more sisters as well, so it isn't just um, the men to get involved, but it is to raise that awareness. So this year we decided to go one step further, we decided to basically um, link up with ICOS Marks, because we all know for a lot of farmers um, that it's important, um, the Mart is an important social outlet, it's an important place to go. And to talk, and actually, if we can link the marts to get that conversation going in the marts and to get farmers talking about it. So, we linked up with ICOS to make that link, and I think it's very, very important. And also, with Full Health and um, Paul McCarthy, Full Health, who are going to do the health checks. And really, what the initiative this year is, we're asking farmers to join the November team, to go onto the website, to donate, but also to actually say they're going to grow a moustache for the month of November. So that's what we want farmers to do. So we want a lot more farmers doing it. We had about 20 farmers doing it as well as the journal team last year. So we want a lot more farmers to do for the month of November this year. And also then basically we're, we're doing six health checks in the marts, in the ICOS marts over the month. There's brochures going around that show you what date they're on. But I think it's an important next step of raising that awareness. Not just, you know, it's physical activity, it's, it's basically mental health as well as um, prostate and testicular cancer as well. So it's all those important issues. So what we'll wait for the minister, I might, might as well kick, kick it off and get a few, few of the people um, to, to have a chat. And actually the first person I got him to have a shave earlier today, um, Mike McGann is, is one of our, I suppose, ambassadors, we'll call him, for, for November this year. He's agreed to come on board and he had a very pleasurable shave. And I might hand the mic, just Mike, firstly, how was the shave for you today, Mike? Well, the shave was fantastic. Uh, Sam, Sam was very expert in doing the shaving and uh, you actually do relax enormously and it was nice. But um, I suppose why I came on board was a couple of months ago I was changing a changing a health um, plan or my life insurance policy and I was looking for a different rate. And the deal with the life insurance group was that if I had a, I needed a full health check, that health check threw up a few things that I didn't like to hear. I was overweight and I had high cholesterol. So I made a deal with them that they would re renew or review the rate they were going to charge me if I got down my weight and I tackled the cholesterol. I got the weight down, I lost six kilos in about two months um, by not grazing in the car, not eating when I'm driving, which I did a lot of, 
and uh, getting up on the bike in the evenings. I thought I was very active, but I wasn't nearly as as healthy as I thought I as I thought I was. My cholesterol has not changed. Actually, my cholesterol went up, which disappointed me. But anyway, um, I'm going to keep keep working on that. But in the meantime, I just really thought that this was a great thing to help us all as an industry, as a community, to look after our own health. I know a lot of great friends that that just died too early or got got laid up too early by just not looking after their own health. And um, it's something that I really wanted to help in a small way. And when Peter asked me, I'm delighted to, to get involved, to try and get us as a community to look at our own health and see can we do things to, to change our lifestyle, change how we eat, maybe what we eat, and to look after ourselves a bit better. And um, maybe that was it. I, I give platelets once every month or every six weeks, and I thought that was a great indicator of my, I got, you know, I got, just get a blood, blood pressure and, and pulse rate of that. But it isn't nearly enough, like there were other underlying things that I still needed to tackle. So um, as I say, get involved if you can at all, but more importantly, even if you're not getting involved, get yourself checked over. Go for one of these checks that, that Peter has just mentioned and just see how you are. Um, I suppose, and there's a doctor here, he can clarify to a greater degree. I suppose I was more encouraged to get a prostate test now that it's non-invasive, that it's done by blood. Um, so maybe that was an encouragement that maybe it's one of the, the mental blocks we have that we don't like the idea of that, that test particularly. So anyway, as I say, get involved, get yourself checked over and you probably would feel better as a result of that. I know, maybe your question was up, but you lost some weight, Mike, as well. I mean, you're looking very well. You're looking well. <laughs> There's only a few around here that know me, how I looked like beforehand, so. Take, take a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's also Chief Executive of Animal Health Ireland. I mean, he's the guy driving the focus on, I suppose, BVD and neonate disease and reducing that and eradicating it from the country. So there's a good tie up there. But as I say, looking after the animals, but more importantly, looking after yourself as well. And that's why we're delighted to have him as one of the ambassadors. We're looking for a few more, so there'll be a few more people we can approach during the time. No, no Bruton, you're taking your chance. <laughs> I, might, I might hand over to Michael Spellman, because Michael Spellman's chairman of ICOS Marks, and um, you know when he heard of the idea, and we went to pitch him and Ray Doyle as well, You know they, 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 they were fully behind the idea and, and saw the benefit of the concept. Yes, uh, Peter, we were delighted to get involved with yourselves in this initiative because um, the Mart is a place that uh, men generally are congregating on sale days or whatever, and they would feel uh, less pressure on themselves if they go there to the Mart and are able to avail of the health check. Now, it's, it's absolutely essential, as Mike said there, and we all are aware and becoming more aware of it, that uh, people look after their health. And the simple checks that can be done uh, on, the, on this trip to the Mart could reveal an awful lot and give them uh, an indication as to what they may need to do and otherwise they may not get the opportunity of, of having such. Now this year, uh, as Peter has said, we're having the initiative rolled out in six of our centres uh, from starting the 30th of October in Roscommon and I think the last one is around the 18th of November taking in Raffo, Roscommon, Innes, um, Kilkenny Cardin in Fermoy and Castle Island. And whether or not it's a success, I, from an ICOS point of view, I will be pushing that we will extend this to a greater number of centres next year and hopefully get other agencies involved who see the value of making sure that people look after their health. And as Peter said, unfortunately, the attitude of farmers is such that they will spend more time and more resources on making sure their animals are in good health than they will in relation to their own uh, personal health. We want to change all that, and I think it's important that an organisation like ICOS would get behind such an, an initiative and make sure that it will be a success, not just, just this year, but in the years to come. So as I say, Peter, we hope that it will be a success to the degree that you would say, right, we'll extend it further next year and we'll be fully behind it in every way we can help. I thought you did well remember the six marks there. You're, you're, it took you a while to remember those, did it? 
Uh, not, no, no, look at it. Uh, if it was 26, it would be a different story, but uh, uh, I hope that the people will be able to come out on the days. You get notice notification in the local papers and also from your own marks as to the day it's on over the, between um, late, November, late October and the middle of November. And it will be very important to come along on the day. I'm told here by the lads that they'll be available for roughly about 9 o'clock to 5 or 6 in the evening. It will give a lot of um, chance to, to have your cheque done taken somewhere 12 to 15 minutes so there'll be uh, a lot of uh, chances there to get get looked after and it'll be time well spent. Thanks very much Michael, I might come back to you later. I'm told the minister is three minutes away so I mean he should be coming soon and we can start TJ in the chair and start him, start him shaving um, when the minister comes so, 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 that, so that'll be good. Um, I might hand over just Paul, I mean the third, the third full health has come on board basically and they're running the, the health checks. I might Paul McCarthy, I might just, just Hand over to you. What are you going to be doing, and what benefit will it be? So, um, so basically, just in terms of full health, full health started on. A, I used to work in Chagas years ago, and um, essentially how full health started was uh, my wife, who works in the AD department, started educating far farmers coming into our kitchen, talking about their health, and uh, she explains that uh, the person, uh, eighty percent of strokes and heart attacks can be prevented, I guess we and uh, in the AD department. When someone arrives with a stroke, the emergency is happening that day, but really the emergency started happening 10 years before that when the person's cholesterol and blood pressure and uh, weight started, maybe all, all the numbers started going in the wrong direction. So um, what Full Health is about is educating the person, not just explaining what the results are, but it, telling them, giving them an action plan in terms of a Full Health report, in terms of what they've got to do about it. So the little simple flag system that explains in green, amber, red, uh, what you what, what results are serious and what the next steps you've got to take. Um, I'm going to pass over to Jack for a second here just to explain what's involved. Uh, the doctor will explain the benefits of what's involved in the day. But essentially, very simple process, and you'll get a report which will explain what was tested, what you've got to do about it if anything shows up. So it's a very simple process. And for those of you that are online, you'll get your report back on your mobile phone as well. So, um, I don't know, Jack, let's hand over to Jack quickly to say. Just quickly, because I'm going to come back to Jack when we're doing the shave, so yeah. I just. just so I'm the doctor, I'll be doing the, the checks on the days in the six Mars. Uh, and I suppose I grew up in a, a, a GP surgery at home, my dad was a GP. And what we found is that farmers don't have much time to get into the GP, as, as Michael and Peter alluded to. Um, and when they do get there, they kind of want to be out the door as quick as possible. And they don't, the GP doesn't have enough time and resources to, to educate farmers about their health because they're under, under so much pressure. So what we want to do is make it as convenient as possible for farmers to get in, learn about their health, It'll be 15 to 20 minute check, which involves a bit of blood pressure, height and weight, chat for five or 10 minutes, and then a finger prick blood test, and we'll be able to give you a world of information on our full health reports on how to tackle your health. Because we found that farmers really need to be educated about their health and take it upon themselves if something's going to change. We want them to identify these warning signs as early as possible so that they're farming into their later years, and when they retire, they're able to enjoy it. That's great. So, I mean, we're getting the feel of what the initiative is, whatever you know. And I mean, it's a bit of fun as well. It's about growing a moustache for November. Not everyone wants to grow a moustache, even though I see a few moustaches around the ring. A few very attractive moustaches around the ring. So, um, there's what it was. <laughs> Don't be hiding it now. Don't be hiding it. How long have you had your moustache? A lot, of people like, a lot of people don't like growing moustache and they say, I never grow a moustache, I can't grow a moustache. But really, for the month, it's your one time that you have an opportunity to grow a moustache. You're doing it for charity, you're doing it basically for, you know, to raise awareness, to, to having that conversation. And that's so, I mean, we urge you, I suppose, it's about the health, but it's also about raising money for charity. And hopefully, November, um, we, we, some of November is coming um, in a few minutes as well. We'll get them to talk about November and where the money goes, but I mean, we're hoping that they will actually develop an initiative that will feed into this, that will extend it a wider. So we're trying to raise money. We raised 38,000 last year, and we're trying to hit over 50,000 this year is, is the target that we want to achieve. I mean, you can donate by going to the November.com website and joining the November team or donating to it. So I might, I mean, uh, just, just, just look around, as I say, the minister will be here any minute, and we'll, we'll get it kicked off now. Um, TJ, how are you feeling about all this? Are you press ganged into it or what? I'm looking fun out there, yes. Have you ever had a hot towel shave before? No, never, so I'm really looking forward to it. It'll be easier than when you're out in the Ireland pitch, anyway. Ah, uh, yes, a bit nerve-wracking, and, and nerve so it is, but uh, I'm sure Sam will look after you very well. Sam tell you you're not to make any sudden movement when he's there. No, 
Listen to him carefully because he's, he's a fourth generation barber. Sam, I'll hand over to you if you might say a little bit about Movember and about yourself as well. Thanks, Peter. How are you? The Movember Foundation has been in Ireland six years and we've raised almost 1.5 million to 2 million a year. Every penny that we raise for the Movember Foundation in Ireland goes directly to the Irish Cancer Society. And we've got almost 4 million Movros globally around the world. And we've almost raised just over half a billion uh, dollars worldwide for the foundation. And this year we're focusing so much on rural I Ireland, L like Peter was saying, going around the marts all around the country for the month of October and November. And we just really, really feel that it's important for everyone to get involved. And during the month of November, it's a bit of fun growing them moustaches. And as Peter had said before, mentioned about the Mo sisters. The Mo sisters give them guys that little bit of encouragement with that moustache during the month of November. But it's all about awareness as well. Like you know, if people talk from them moustaches, it just it's a bit of crackdown at the local or a bit of crackdown at the show and around the marks and all that. But um, it's very important to realise that the Movember Foundation, everything we collect in this country here goes directly to us. And it's a fantastic foundation, so I really hope that most of you would even consider even taking the pamphlet, even if you don't want to get involved in the Movember Foundation, even take one of the pamphlets, read it, and then leave it somewhere where someone else might read it also. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much, Sam. You see the way he held up Mike, he's a very steady hand, a very steady hand. It's important for a barber like him. Sam has actually six barber shops across, um, in Dublin mainly, and, and the outskirts. So he's, after this, probably seen the, the, the activity here. He's probably, probably open one in... Kerry, Kerry's is next. He's going to take over Kerry, whatever is, is going to be the next one. Yeah, so TJ, actually, we've had other other um, GA stars. He's been, Sam has been actually giving them shaves inside um, over over the, um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we've had other GA stars as well, and other people. Larkin, Larkin actually has been the the press ganging the different different the different players. You might as well tell us who's who we shaved already. One of them was his brother, so that probably was an easy one. Yeah, I suppose uh, when you gave me the task of finding a. Uh, Six years, or there as many as I could get uh, to get a hot towel shave. I was like, oh, well, they go for this now down at the clown, and a lot of people people looking at them. But uh, so I said, I better get the brother. He plays football with Offaly. No claim to fame there, really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I got him anyway, in, and um, in fairness, uh, Davy Redmond here in the hot seat from uh, Wexford Hurler there yesterday, and uh, we also have uh, John Heston from Westmead getting the hot towel shave later on, and we have Darren Hughes, Monaghan footballer as well. And uh, of course, TJ is standing here beside us. Uh, and uh, we just want to thank the lads, you know, for giving up their time and uh, coming down here and giving us a hand with it. And uh, you know, just getting the message out is really important for us, you know. And um, just, just appreciate it, lads. Yeah, I mean, they, they did it, and they, they thought we were getting a free shave, but they don't realise now they're going to have to grow the moustache from November as well, whatever. You're either, you're either, you're either fully in or not in, whatever, you know. So, I mean, we, 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 we have to tell them that after, whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean that that's as I say, we'll wait for the minister to come now, whatever you know. And um, but we also had Damien O'Reilly, we had him um, from RT Countrywide, and actually he's for his actually he thought he was getting a free shave as well, but I mean now he realizes that he's actually launching we're pushing the initiative to Irish Country Living and um, we're having a page every week. We're also, you know, um, into October or whatever to completely raise awareness. And so Damien said we'd launch it um, in, on his show as well in, in, in the twenty second of October. So we're getting Sam in. Um, to do a live radio shave. <laughs> so you have to make some noise with the razor, is that it? And also a couple of farmers who basically um, are going to do it for us for the month. So it could be one of you, if anyone signs up, and um, we're gonna pick a couple of farmers to, to get them into studio as well and say why they're doing it as well. Because it is about spreading the word, it is about creating awareness. Um, the other person we have, and I mean, I suppose when health, you talk about the HSC, and actually Finian Murray is here from the HSC, um, you know, to, to, uh, to give, I suppose, a little bit of what, what they're doing, but also what he thinks about the initiative as well. Yeah, on behalf of the HSC, we are uh, very much welcome to this initiative. And I've been involved over the years in different aspects and different marks. So there's one, one I was involved in in Castle Blaney and uh, in Valley Bay in County Ireland. And what we found from the health checks was nearly all the farmers had high blood pressure. So we also found over the years that there's no point in expecting men to come to services. We need to bring the service every day men around. And that's why we went to this mission where you bring the head checks out to the bar for the men, the farmer, the go to to come to the bear of the service. And uh, we very much welcome it. We also link in very closely with Mogamber. They did a report last year on mental health, young men and mental health. 
and, and uh, most of us, the main transformed in Ireland, and we need him in November, so let's congratulate the members of Ireland be this as well. So, uh, so uh, onwards and upwards, Peter, thanks. Thanks very much, Peter, I'll come back to you later. You see, the minister has arrived, and it's a very, very busy schedule. We're not expecting to sit in the chair and have a shave himself. So don't move out you think it'll make a great picture. So, so we welcome the Minister, minister of Agriculture, Simon Colby, um, to, to launch the November Farmers Going to November initiative. Thanks very much, Minister Colby. Yeah. So as I said, I mean, we have TJ, TJ Reid, the uh, Kenny Hurler, so you might as well take the seat now, TJ. He's getting nervous. He was he's getting a bit nervous. <laughs> David Redden was in the chair and actually he came, he's working down the lily stand and he came and actually he had a full beard on him when he came and after he shaved there was a big gash under his chin. He said, Jesus, how did he Sam didn't give you that, did he? So no, that was a Kenny Hurler. <laughs> So, Minister, I mean, as I said, the, the initiatives for members is raising awareness. I mean, in the journal we would have launched this last year, we've taken another step with ICOS Marts to actually do six free health checks around the Marts this year. And, um, you know, it's another step of creating awareness. And to get farmers, they tend to look after livestock and they look at better than they look after themselves. So that's what the initiative is about. So thanks very much for, for launching it today. Yeah, no, look, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, not for the first time, I think the journal is, uh, is leading in a campaign. Uh, to try and improve the quality of life of farmers uh, and uh, you know I think most of us know that a lot of farmers don't look after their own health like they should uh, they're more focused on on other things their family uh, their 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 livestock uh, and their business uh, and I think we need to get farmers to look in the mirror um, a, a lot more often I think they owe that to their families uh, and to themselves uh, and I think a campaign like this is a is a reminder of that so I just want to say well done to the journal uh, for that initiative and I think I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to do a bit of shaving here actually in a second. <laughs> it's, not often, it's not often a cork man gets a knife to, to, to cut the throat of a Kilkenny man. <laughs> Particularly when he can't defend himself. <laughs> Thanks very much for that for everybody in this issue. Yeah, I want to, just before, just before you give him the knife there, I just want to get you the stage photos, because I know TJ was nervous before, but I say he's very nervous no, now. <laughs> so I might just get a few photos, we call in Michael and Paul in as well. Justin actually has, he said, when we did it last year, Justin said no, he just he said he wouldn't grow a moustache last year, but if he did it again next year, he'd grow a moustache. So he doesn't like to remember that. Will I, will I, will I put that question? Just give him a Justin says he grows one if the minister grows one. <laughs> Paul, that way, just a faction. Paul, who wants to see the minister grow one? You might take sorry about that time. <laughs> Perfect, one last one now. That's it. Perfect, yeah, okay. Could I just get the minister maybe close <laughs> Just one. <laughs> 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 okay, he's not going to shave you, TJ. You're all right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, thanks very much, Mr. Minister. Give a round of applause going out. So now we get down to business. You can already see that he's, he's mummified him already. Give him the hot towels. The towels are hot, whatever, so he's giving him a pleasure. But opening, what's the hot towels for, Sam? Just to soften the skin and, and soften the bristles and open up the pores to really get down there tight and give a good clean shave. And uh, it's a great way of a man actually getting a face without saying he's getting a face. So it gets all that dirt out. So if you're working down the farm and there's all that crap down underneath the skin, best way to get it out, get a shave. No problem. So uh, anyone had a hot, anyone admit to having a hot towel shaver? Has a hot towel shave? Put their hand up. Donald, <laughs> did you enjoy it, Donald? Yeah, it's really relaxing. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. But the link up with Sam and Sam has been, I suppose, linked up with, with November since since the start, and he saw the benefit, I suppose, with the moustaches. And I've had a few hot towel shaves because of November with Sam. It is very pleasurable. But it is all about, you know, growing the moustache, you know, creating the creating the conversation about men's health and that's why we do want farmers we do want farmers to sign up for the november sign up for the november we push it to the journal as well and now if you don't uh, most sisters can sign up as well and they basically have to give support to the mo brother because i mean as we all know who've tried growing a massage it does look a bit ridiculous for the first week or 10 days you know fine when you've been growing it for years and you have a big forest there or whatever you know and um, like 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 the man over here i don't see any other guys with mustaches to pick on at the moment so just be warned if you do have one. Um, so I mean, but but it does look so. It is about support, and it's about it's about that. You know, it's about raising charity. So I might hand that we have is leave gone. Okay. Uh, just in relation to the the checks that are taking place, something that one would not want to to, to leave aside is the importance of mental mental health awareness. And Vinny uh, brought a, a brochure along here, and we we're, were talking about it earlier. And the reality is that globally, worldwide, one person dies every minute from suicide. It's, it's a frightening figure that over a half a billion people die in the world every, every year from suicide. So mental health awareness is equally as important, important as the physical health awareness. So when you come along to the, the checks, you will be given some um, pointers as well as to what to look out for in relation to uh, mental well-being and that and it's important not to turn a, a blind eye to it and it was one particularly last year when we talked to icos the mart managers i talked to the mart managers and it was the one thing that they did focus on is the whole mental health aspect um, and because i mean they see it and they realize i mean a lot of farmers do come to the mart for their social outlets and it's the one in the week where they come whatever and it's an important part of it and to raise that awareness, something we will be focusing on through the journal and throughout November as well, not just the physical side, but the mental side as well. He's used to being on the big screen, but I don't think he's used to being on the big screen like this. <laughs> Sam's blocking it there now. It's a very good high definition TV screen, isn't it? You can see every pimple, yeah, every, every, every mark. All the pores. <laughs> all the pores that have been opened up there since, since the hot towels have gone on. Don't move any sudden moves now, TJ. Jack, I might go back to you about, I mean, a little bit more about, I suppose, what you're going to be checking for and how, how it's important and how actually people can avoid getting those high numbers. Uh, so we're going to be checking uh, some key elements. There'll be a questionnaire about your lifestyle, your diet and your exercise. Whether you smoke, whether you drink, are you getting out there doing enough exercise? We'll also talk about mental health for a couple of minutes with the farmers see if they have any problems regarding mental health and <coughs> point them in the right direction for how they can uh, solve those problems if they're there and if they exist. We'll also talk about early signs of prostate and this testicular cancer and how to check yourselves for these signs. And then in terms of the actual measurements we'll be taking, it's all very simple, just a single drop of blood to check for a diabetes screen uh, and a cholesterol check. And we'll check as well uh, the person's weight to see if they're overweight. Um, but I suppose the best way to to tackle these things early on is through lifestyle changes. So that's why we really need to educate farmers that they know what are the right things to be eating, how often they should be exercising, what their ideal weight should be, so that they're able to, as I say, tackle these warning signs well in advance of something like a heart attack or a stroke or something devastating that could happen in the future if it's not addressed early on. Thanks very much. I can come back to you. I can come back to you again, there, Jack. 
I mean, as I say, I mean, it is about raising awareness of men's health. We are looking for, for farmers and, and for, you know, be female and male farmers and, and their partners as well to join the Fovember team. And also, um, we've actually, me and here, done the social media side of things. And what we're actually looking for, we're going to have a competition as well of the best moustaches that people can grow. So actually, tell us what, what, what from a social media, what they should be checking and what we're going to do. Snapchat account as well. I must, I must sign up for that now and see, we'll see what's on that. She'll be very interested. Actually, Ashley was a Mo's sister last year and she, we, had, we had some fake moustaches in, um, in, in the office when people were getting taken pictures with them and she looked very um, different, I suppose, is one word. And her dad, she actually press ganged her dad to sign up and grow and he raised a good bit of money as well for, for, for the charity as well. I'll just hand over now because we, Sam has mentioned about Movember and the whole thing about Movember and how all the money goes and stays in Ireland and the folks on rural Ireland. I'll hand over to Jack O'Connor from Movember to tell us a little bit about the initiative. Thanks, Peter. Um, I know Sam's covered quite a lot, but I suppose this is a perfect opportunity to thank everyone who's, uh, who's put this together, especially Peter here from the Farmers Journal, Paul and Jack from, from Full Health, and, and, and Ray from ICOS. Um, the guys have really come together and, and pulled this, this uh, Checks at the Mars program together, and we're really, really grateful for that. Um, Movember is a men's health foundation, and our sole purpose is that men live happier, healthier, longer lives. That's, it's really that simple, and we do that by growing mustaches. And I know that that sounds a bit funny, but um, just get involved, and whether, you, whether you're a guy or a girl, you, you can, you can you know, support as a mo grower mo sister. Join the November team at November.com and, and, and just get on board for the campaign this year. Thanks, thanks very much, Jack. So we'll go over to TJ and see how he's getting on. He's sleep, TJ, you're awake. Yeah, it's, it's very, I'm still looking sorted. Um, I think I'll go in the stand next week and get it sorted. Ah, you can leave it for a bit more than a week, I think, can you? And there's no blood yet, actually. Last year we, we had a few people with blood, so there's no actually blood yet. Sam, you're doing a pretty good job today. Yeah. <laughs> he thought it the last one, but you had to do a blood with him. He was from Wexford, he was from Wexford. So Paul, I'll come back to you again, whatever, from a full health point of view. You might just because, I mean, people are moving and coming again. Will you um, just, just outline what, what you're going to check and what you're going to do from that side of things? Yeah, so, um, so basically full health, full health is a, at its core, it's a platform all about educating people about their health. So oftentimes people know their numbers, but they don't know what they mean. I mean, and what Full Health does is it gives people an interpretation of what each result means, what it means in the context of their lifestyle, their diet, and their medical history. So that's what's unique about it. And everyone also gets an action plan in terms of what they have to do next if there's any abnormal results. So you get a very simple report, and all reports are reviewed and approved by the doctor. Um, and bring it into the modern age, a person can, um, at the, at the Health Checks of Mars, people can, sit, can just turn up, but we, we also have a digital site with where you can get your complete report uh, accessible on your phone. If you hold, on, Paul, hold on, hold on a minute. Look, see, we don't know, we don't know. There's very, no sudden noises now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, I mean, as, as Jack said earlier, what it's all about in one of these Checks to Mars is keeping it as simple and as convenient as possible. And health is something that you have to take control of, because uh, anyone that heard Jack earlier talking about his own father as a GP, uh, we know farmers are very busy, but the farmer doesn't have time, the GP doesn't have time, so you have to take responsibility for your health, you have to know what the numbers mean, what to do about it, and then you can have a longer, healthier life, which is all about what the Movember campaign is about globally. Um, it's just the way the world economy has gone, I think 16% 16, 16 of, of everything that's earned in the country goes towards health spending. Health we're all getting older, healthcare costs are rising, so we don't want to be relying on the state um, to uh, look after us in old age. Um, that's why we've got to take more control of our health. And I'll bring in Finney Murray, actually. He's a guy that doesn't want to see you. He's from the HSC, and the last thing they want to see is sick farmers, whatever. So that's why they're actually behind this initiative, an initiative like it to support it, basically, so that farmers will react earlier, I suppose, and not get to a situation where they have to go to the HSC or they have to go to a doctor? Yeah. I, um, like, as I was saying earlier, uh, in the HSC we actually welcome this initiative and it's a, it's a great opportunity for, for the service to go out and be, meet men where they're at. I'm also a member of the Men's Health Forum in Ireland, which is an all-Ireland group 
of interest to the individuals and organisations around men's health. We're the organisation that runs out Men's Health Week every year, which is in June, finishing up on Father's Day. We also brought out a little mini manual, which is, uh, is health advice on the 10 top theories of health for men. And we have Tony Ward here on the cover. We're all into rugby at the moment. So Tony Ward is our poster boy for this, this campaign. We've also linked in with Movember, who've uh, worked with us on mental health in particular in the uh, we have brought out a, a report on mental health, especially for younger men. So just something you, you should look up on the on, on the website. So as I was saying to I was saying to Peter, we very much welcome this initiative, and it's another chance of uh, profiling men's health all across the country, and especially the at the at the cattle mars, because that's that's a, a place where men meet to you know sell cattle and buy cattle and so on. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I was also involved in uh, health checks in Valley Bay and Castle, Castle Bay. And we found that most farmers had high blood pressure. Now that might have been because they were selling cattle or buying cattle, but apart from that, it was way above the national average, and it was definitely something that had to be addressed. So we welcome this initiative, and we're looking forward to the results. Thanks very much. And I actually got a first volunteer actually over here who's going to grow a moustache in November for us. You see, I asked him to get a moustache, he just hasn't shaved for a while. So have you, when's the last time you shaved? Five days ago. Five, have you been too busy or what? Too busy, yeah. Too busy shaving. But well, it's going to happen. Maybe we'll get you in the chair later on if you want to shave, a hot towel shave later on. Maybe, yeah. But it's the first one to volunteer, so, so he's going to, and that's what we want. We want more farmers to come. I've seen a few more with beards there that seem to like not shaving. So it's an excuse to not shave and to grow that moustache for a month. Any other volunteers? What? You're a farmer, but we take them in anyway. But Michael, I'll come back to you because I mean I know the importance of the marts in this, and I mean when we did it, um, for and it went well last year, so we have to take it the next step. And actually, we looked around and we knew we didn't look far actually because we knew the marts was the ideal place to launch this initiative for next year to have the health checks to make a real difference to raise that awareness for men's health. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, Peter. And as I said earlier, we and ICOS are absolutely delighted to be involved with this initiative because. Like that, the mart is the place that farmers come together once or maybe in some cases more than once a week. And this is going to give them the opportunity to go in there and get a very serious check that could have serious implications for their own personal well-being and that of their family. And it's only going to take 12 to 15 minutes. It might be the best quarter of an hour you'll spend this year if you get the opportunity of going in. And as I said, it's, it's rolled out this year at six centres from Raffo and Donegal down Roscommon, Ennis, Castle Island, Kilkenny and Fermoy. And the expectation and hope is that if it, and I expect it will be a success this year, we in ICOS will help in whatever way we can to promote this and roll it out further to more of our centres throughout, throughout the country next year and for the years to come. And the important thing here is that people need to look after their health. It was said earlier, and how true it is, that farmers in particular, they spend, give more attention and maybe spend more money on the health of their livestock than they do and on their own health. That should not be the way they should deal with their, with their lives. And this, we feel, is an ideal opportunity. They won't be taken out from a day, they won't have to dress up. I spoke to Jack there earlier, the doctor, and they won't have to come in in their Sunday best or anything like that. They can come in as if they were coming on any ordinary sale day to be there in the mart and look around and see where it's being held go in and have their check done and they can even make an appointment and get it done as well. So it'll be operational from a roughly about five, nine o'clock in the morning to five or six in the evening on each of the, of the six days. So hopefully you'll uh, be made aware through local media and uh, the marts themselves would probably send out um, notification to their customers and that of the days that it's on in your area. So take advantage of it and it'll be time well spent. Thanks very much, Michael. And I know a lot of people are here for the livestock demo, which is started at 12 o'clock, so it, 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 that'll be on straight after, once, once we make sure TJ's okay um, under that mum mummification, under the hot towels there. Two more minutes, so that'll be on, that'll be on in a few minutes, and Jack Kennedy will be around from the livestock. I, mean, I see some of the Bora Bia guys there um, who are waiting to, to, to get in. Maybe they'll grow some moustaches for us for November. What do you think, Declan? Joe Murray would look very well with a moustache, or Joe Burke would look very well with a moustache. What do you think, Joe? He's nodding, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> well, TJ, how is it? We're getting near the end. You survived it nearly. Yeah, I'm still here, thank God. Um, I'm 
I'm going to stay here for a day, though. Someone tell Connolly's, Connolly's, Connolly's that he won't be back. He's, he's, he's having too much of a good time up here at the Farmer's Journal. So we have actually, we have a few slots. I think we, we, we have a few slots. We've one or two uh, more GA players and that's a shave. Um, I think Finny, we're, we're, we're shaving you as well later. He came set well prepared with not shaving um, later. But I mean, there is one or two slots that people do want to get the experience of a hot towel shave. So it looks like he's, he's finishing off now. So Sam, was that the first time you shaved with Kenny Hurler? <laughs> You're not too bad. Listen, thanks very much, TJ. Should we talk us through the experience? Yeah, lovely experience to have, so it is. So, if any farmers out there haven't got a hot shave, I'll be, I'll be willing to tell you to go get one done. I'm very relaxing, so it is. So, I'll be making sure to get one again um, soon enough. So, you actually did cut you, Sam. You're going to look after him there now. <laughs> you can have another hot tub. I got more, so. <laughs> You can have another hot towel shave at the end of November. I think you look well with a month's moustache on it, will you? So listen, thanks very much, TJ, and thanks very much for coming along. I might just, just give a quick last last word, I suppose, to Michael and to Paul, who are, who are working with the Farmer's Journal. Keep an eye on it both in social media and also in the Country Living pages. But we are doing a big push this year for men's health, but also to get farmers to join in the Pretemper team and to raise at least €50,000. For, for a November charity. Michael, just hand up to you. Uh, yes, in relation to the charity aspect of it, what we will be suggesting to our managers or our people in the March that we'll have a booklet at the counter, whatever it is, that the money can be donated there, put in there, and that it's going to that very worthy cause of the Irish Cancer Society and how, how important that is. We all know that everyone is, every family in the country is touched by cancer at some stage of their life. So it's important that wherever and whenever we can, we support that with some financial contribution. And as I said to you earlier, the important thing is, let this be a success this year in 2015, this whole initiative, and we will roll it out further and more people will benefit from it in, in the years to come. And Paul, do you want to say? Yeah, and finally, this is a real opportunity to get good quality health care in your own hands. Uh, full health technology is used to run health programs for the likes of the Matter Private and all these places that run the highest quality health programs in Ireland. You can get this exact same service in your mark, free of charge, through Full Health as well for this campaign. So it's a real opportunity to take control of your health, get it into your own hands, you'll be able to access your report online and uh, understand what, uh, not just what your test results are, but also what you've got to do to take control of your own health. And Jack, finally for you for the November side of things. Yeah, a lot of people have come together to, to make these checks happen, so really try and avail of it and pass on the word and talk to your dad, talk to your brother, talk to you, talk to all the men in your life and get them to come down and get checked out so that next year we can roll that bigger and better. Thanks so much, Jack, and I suppose now we better get the chairs out in the life again. Thanks very much, particularly to TJ, for the Minister for launching it, for, for ICOS, for Full Health and for Movember as well, particularly for Sam for not doing too much of a cut on him. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, and the Livestock will be on in about five minutes.
Or Sam. <laughs> it was pretty to, where's TJ gone? It was pretty temporary, let's try to cut him down this summer, but they couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> just, just take, huh? I'll take it just a bit safer, because they could. Signs inside of you, yeah, yeah. You're not going to go, yeah, yeah. Starting here with the supper coming half, Joe. Sorry, in the way, so we make a start. Sorry, lads, we just get we get these stuff out in, in, into the into the main ring here, so we'll uh, we'll ask you oh, that shape as we go over. I've to cut down the Kenny man. Like, uh, <laughs> gentlemen welcome to demonstration two on day two of plowing 2015 in association this livestock demonstration is in association with Borbia, ICBF and the Farmers Journal obviously um, okay sorry for the delayed start we were waiting for the minister to come along so we're going to um, start off here first of all with a, with a five-star sucker cow and calf um, and, a, and, and a replacement heifer these, these stock are from a, a commercial herd in, in near Eden Derry in Offaly, Sean, Sean and Bernie Evans just outside um, Eden Derry. So, I mean, they're essentially, uh, uh, they're, getting, they're getting used to us now, just, they don't want to come out, they're getting camera shy, so they are like, um, they're essentially a five-star suckler cow and calf and a five-star replacement. So, you, you've all heard about the BG, BDGP scheme. So, he, here's an example of the type of stock that I suppose that are, that are coming down the tracks in terms of um, numbers of stars. Nathan Tuffy, our, our livestock specialist, is going to talk us through first of all in terms of uh, the type of uh, cow we have, and then Chris Daly is going to take it up. Uh, okay, on on on, um, on the subject, on the genetic side of things. So Nathan, kick us off here in terms of what what, what we're looking at, and, and I suppose what's the objective and the, the message that's involved. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Um, two st well, one stubborn cow and a calf and a stubborn heifer, I'd say, but the looks <laughs> things. Um, yeah, they're, they're getting used to us. Okay, so I I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about this cow here, fill you in on a bit of the background. Um, she's a cemental cross cow with a cemental calf a foot. Can anybody tell me what age that cow is? Well, you have a good eye there. Uh, she's uh, 2000. Close, close, but not, not fully there. That man has it. 2007 born cow. Um, so she's uh, she, she she she's getting on. That calf is a February born calf. Um, any idea what weight the calf is? 275. Any any advance on 275? Well, you'll throw weight on him. Close. Any advance on 300? Yeah, we're almost there. 330 kilos. February born uh, heifer calf at 330 kilos. So I suppose just to fill in a bit about the cow herself, she's born in 2007. Um, she's a five star cow, as Jack said already. Um, this calf is her sixth calf. So she calfed in 2010, and every year since then she's had she's had a calf. Um, she's a, she's exactly what she wants in, in terms of production. You know, she she she's a good productive functional cow. Um, nothing too fancy. She has milk. You can see the calf, 320 kilos. February born calf at 330 kilos. Milk isn't an issue. Um, so she has she has it on that side. Um, her calf in her her calf in interval is 356 days. Now we always talk about a target of, of a calf, a cow's calf down once a year, so 365 days. So she's yet, she's actually beaten all the targets from that point of view. Um, so I suppose you know if if you had her at home, you'd be particularly happy with her. 
Um, Jack, I suppose just to put it into, yeah. into context, um, we were saying earlier on that the average calf and interval around the country in, in suckler herds is about 405 days now. Um, so like she, she's substantially better than that. And to put that into context, this is her sixth calf. If she was the average cow in the average herd, you'd probably be looking about four, four and a half, or sorry, four and a half to maybe five calves at this stage, Jack. So, so she's a calf less at least, like on the, on the national average herd, like. Yeah. Which, um, which uh, as you say, put a value on the calf. Exactly. 800,000 euros, whatever. Yeah. The cow has to be kept, Jack. We need output from that cow every year. That's the bottom line. Um, the suckler cow, you know, it, it costs a lot to keep her. Chagas figure, figures that show that you could you could be talking anywhere between 600 and 800 euros a year to keep a cow, depending on fixed costs, etc. Um, so there's no time for lag, Jack. We need to we need to keep calves out of her as often as possible and, and make sure that we have weight to sell. Um, I, I spoke I spoke about um, the calf cow per year as well earlier on. Um, calf per cow per year is essential. We we, we work with. Uh, with a group of farmers in the Better Farm Programme, a joint programme between ourselves and Chagask. And I suppose if we rewind the clock to maybe 2008, it's something that we focused on down through the years, was increase in farm output. Getting a cow that was going to calf, every, uh, calf down every year, with a, try and shorten the calf interval, and try and keep output as high as possible. And it has worked, it has got output up. We're targeting um, 0.95 calves per cow per year across the herd, that's, that's the target. In the Better Farms, they're, they're hitting around about the 0.9 at this stage. If we go back and look at the average across the whole country, you're talking about just shy of 0.8. Now, you might think that's huge, a, a huge deal, but if you, if, you, if you think about it slightly, like 50 cow herd, say you take your average 50 cow herd, um, and you're, you're weaning 0.1 of a calf per cow extra per year, that's five calves in that herd extra of output. And no matter what way you want to look at it, Jack, you said 800 yeah. euros per calf. Yeah. Make it up. That's that's four grand. Four thousand. Yeah. 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 Four thousand. That's that's been lost out of your pocket by, uh, you know, comparing the national herd to, to, to what we can achieve, or what has been achieved on farms. So it's something to, to bear in mind. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I mean, in terms of you know, this this particular cow is not a you know she's not a particularly fancy type of cow, but she's getting you have a calf per cow per year. And you're delivering a, a good, a good replay, a good, a good calf out of her, like we'd say, 330 kilos for this time of the year. Jack, you're probably more used to looking at Jersey crosses and freezing, so you know. But calling a spade a spade, she, she, she's a whole hell of a lot better than what you'd be looking at. But at the right. same time, she's just an average or grade cow. Nothing too fancy to look at. Um, Chris Daly was talking here from ISBF earlier early on, and he made the point that, you know, she has milk, she has put, transformed that milk into weight gain on that calf, and I suppose she's done it off her back to a certain extent. Um, and it's something to bear in mind too that if you have car a cow that's working hard, that's producing a lot of milk, she's going to probably be carrying less condition at this stage of the year compared to a cow that, that doesn't have as much milk. Okay. Okay. Let, let maybe at uh, this stage the queue is, I suppose, to introduce Niall Kilrain from ICBF. And just, I mean, again, Niall, there's been a lot of chat about uh, one star and two star and five star and, you know, I suppose farmers getting back their, their stars in the, in, in the post in the last, for, their, for their individual cows in the last, in the last uh, week or two. Can you give us a kind of a steer on kind of what's happening out there, and, and I suppose maybe what um, you know how how this cow rates with the rest of the with the rest of the you know sucker cow population? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Jack. I suppose just to start off with some high level figures, maybe we can see um, my youthful assistant Chris Daly here is holding up. Uh, he's, doing a bad, he's doing a bad job, but is he? he? Yeah, he's not doing a great job. <laughs> but look at Chris, we won beer last night, were you? Chris, hold it steady. Yeah. This is a non recurring problem we have, but anyway, the this. Sample as well looks at 2008 born cows that are in herds that have signed up to this new scheme. So they're pretty typical of what most of you would have out there. Super guys, cows, they're operating away. And we just split them up to look at the, the five star cows versus the one star cows. Right. And it's very clear to say for the, all the different as well, key performance indicators, if you want to call them that, number of calvins, age of first calf and calvin interval, growth rate, milk, you know. All those different traits, the five star cows are consistently outperforming the one star cows. And, you know, that's the high level message that's coming out of this that there's plenty of cows, suckler cows out there that are profitable, and on average, they're five star cows. And this scheme, I suppose, is really much about focusing guys' minds on looking at those cows. Here's an example of one of them focusing on them, breeding from them, making informed breeding decisions. And as well as Nathan was talking about down at the individual cow farm level, yeah. these indexes are looking at the national level 
the message is still the same. The principles yeah. apply that yeah. those high index cows are much more profitable than the low index. Yeah. And th that bottom figure, the 0.87, almost getting a, a calf, an extra calving, like the five star cows, or an extra calving over the one star cows. Like. Yeah, and that's on a, a cow, so if you have 50 cows, yeah. you know, we're talking 50 calves extra over the lifetime of those cows. Yeah. So, look at those figures are out there. I suppose the message now will be to get that, you know, drummed into farmers that maybe weren't aware of it previously, where, you know, or this new scheme has only focused their minds on the stars. And I mean, you've got this information here. If we want to look at uh, individual cows, you know, that information is available here. This cow, she has a, a replacement index of 101 euros, which means that on average per lactation, she'd leave you 100 euros profit more than a cow with an index of zero. Um, you know, the, her on-farm performance backs up that. As you can see, consistently she's producing a calf every year, uh, six calves, calf an interval of 356 days. As they discussed, I suppose, it's, it's, a, it's a very clear, measurable message that yeah. that type of cow is leaving a profit. So what I'm hearing from you, Niall, is that, okay, this cow is one particular cow, as Nathan says, you've got a calf per cow per year, but you're saying that the data from all the, her, all the cows in, in Ireland is more than stacking up for five-star cows versus one-star cows. Now, so, some farmers will come to me and say, geez, I have the best two-star cow, like, you know what I mean, that, that I've seen, and she's only two-star. I know why she's only two-star. Them boys in ICBF don't know what they're talking about. You know, obviously there's individuals that are different, you know, that, that, that'll book the trend, we'll say. Oh, absolutely, and always for a day, there'll be cows that, you know, on an individual animal level, there'll be little anomalies, if you want to call them that, that should be higher or should be lower. But I suppose it, it's, it's driven, really, by accurate recording of information and I suppose here to four farmers especially beef farmers would have a very low level of on-farm recording so you know a cow could be doing a great job but because we're not getting the weights on the performance of her progeny we're not getting insemination data lots of those key sorts of bits of information that we'd like to get recorded to make the indexes more accurate so that's what we'd be really asking farmers to do to increase the level of recording on their farms to increase the accuracy of the indexes. And then what will happen, what you're talking about, Jack, is that those two star cows that should be four star cows, less of those incidences will happen. Okay. You know, everyone will have much more confidence in the whole system when they see that happen. But I suppose it's yeah. a key message with the stars is that the stars don't describe the animal that's standing in front of you. Like, it, farmers would obviously have a, um, I suppose, a misconception that the five star cow must be the best looking cow in the field. Yeah. And, that is not what the stars, the stars don't describe the animal, they predict the, pot the potential profit from breeding from that animal. And They're actually driven by calvings and like fertility and milk. <laughs> yeah, driven by yeah. The, the production parameters that you want to see a cow yeah. doing. Yeah. So if you talk I mean, anecdotally to a lot of farmers, you say, well, if you ask them, what's the best cow in your herd? In a lot, a lot of cases, they'd say, well, you can't see her, she's a small little one, she's behind that big fat cow, but yeah. that little cow is here for 12 years and she's had 12 calves in 12 years. And, you know, visually, she's probably not going to do it. You play yeah. the same argument here with this cow. Visually, maybe not going to shoot the lights out, but yeah. in terms of leaving money, leaving potential, profit, leaving calves job. behind her, she's doing it, yeah. Do we want to talk a bit about the replacement heifer that's there? We yeah, have, yeah. Like yeah. It's oh. probably it's, it's a similar message. She's a higher index animal. This cow, as he said, was 101 on the index. I think the heifer was maybe 140. So it's and the principle of it is obviously that you'd like to see your younger animals coming through with a higher index than your older animals. So yeah. this heifer is ticking that box. She's out of a, an AI, I think she's out of an AI cemental bull. She's yeah. a big strong heifer. She's due to calve a, a little over two years of age. I think Ross texted me there this morning. She was 690 kilos the other day. So yeah. she's a big, strong heifer. She's a big wave, she, yeah. she possibly, maybe if you're talking, that some farmers would say that she's too big, you know, that she's going to be a very heavy cow. But look at, you know, that's a probably a question of individual taste and what farmers like and what yeah. they want to breed for. But, you know, she has the indexes. She's, you know, she's on target to do the things you want to do in terms of having a calf at a young age. And over the, her lifetime, what we'd like to see is that when she has her first calf, she goes back in calf, she has another calf, that her index is then increasing reliability over her lifetime and that well, obviously you'd like to see your index is increasing if she's doing a better job and then you breed a high index bull to her again. Perfect. Nathan, yeah? Jack, I suppose just one point to make, this is a big heifer in front of us, no yeah. issue there with, with, with weight for weight or anything like that. No. But just one, one message just to take home with you. 
if you if, if you are thinking about next year's crop of calves and you want to and you have weavings of home that you're thinking of uh, of breeding next year, well now next year isn't the time to be looking at the weights. It's actually time to be starting looking at now, Jack. Yeah. Weigh yeah. the calves now. Uh, tailor your winter feed plan to make sure that you're going to hit the 0.7. Uh, you know, maybe even 0.6 to 0.8 kilos a day during the winter period to make sure that she's going to be on target to be 60% of her of her uh, of, of her mature weight at that breeding. Correct. No, not when you want them. Like exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, folks. I mean, that I suppose that's the stuff to recall with the replacement side of things. Uh, Darren went off, and, and we we let him. We won't let him off again. Now, but he went off two months ago, and we we gave him a few pounds. One two. Back Hello ladies and gentlemen uh, and welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal stand. How are you all doing today? Um, so are you having a good ploughing? That's good, to, th good to hear. I was just thinking, like, you guys have got a particularly and, good uh, uh, demo to, to attend to because, you know, day one, and, um, not that we've had too many teething problems, but we're kind of getting into the swing of it. I think we're well into the swing of it now and you're not on day three when Nevin is absolutely knackered. So... Um, so you're in for a really good demo um, this afternoon. Um, we have so much going on here in the Farmers Journal stand over the ploughing. First of all, who fancies winning a John Deere? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? We also have a Land Rover. Or Super Value, um, we've got 100 euros a week for a year for shopping in Super Value. This is all part of our Bin Your Build for a Year competition that we're running. Uh, the prizes are absolutely amazing. Um, so if you download the Farmers Journal app, you'll get more details on it and you'll get a bonus token. With the live demos going on outside, ladies, if you want to get your nails done, Irish Country Magazine stand is just behind you there. There's a fantastic milliner inside there, Katrina King, and you can try on her gorgeous hats. And we've Irish Country Magazine, the new issue on sale for two euros. So we, we have a lot going on. One other thing I want to tell you about is our Women in Agriculture conference is taking place on the 29th of October this year. If you've been, you know it's a brilliant day out. If you haven't, it's a brilliant day out. So our tickets just went on sale yesterday um, for 50 euros. But all that aside, definitely the ploughing wouldn't be the ploughing without this man here beside me. Now, over the last year or two, we've had a bit of how many ploughings have we had? I said there was nine, or I said seven, but I, did, I counted it up on my fingers earlier, and we definitely have had done eight. So I figured that's 72 demos we've done here at the ploughing at the Farmer's Journal stand. That's why she wears the earplugs. <laughs> I've seen quite a few of them over my time. Um, but um, I mean, it's just never comes back every year because look at our stand, it's so crowded. The buzz here is absolutely electric, and he does an absolute the amazing demo of course his cookery books are absolutely fantastic and um, his new one is the healthy food which was just launched on monday it's hot off, uh, off the press as he says himself it's not a diet book it's all about healthy eating and i'm definitely going to be making a few recipes there's also his fast food um book and there's a gorgeous book as well for baby and toddlers as marie said it's a gorgeous gift for a christening or something like that so there's a, a plowing deal here today which with two books for 35 euros um so without further ado i'm going to pass you over to the man himself there's some fantastic recipes um on on, on display today um, um, we have had chicken satay this afternoon. I'm going to tell you a secret. I stole a little bit of it. And it's in a carton in the fridge that says Kira's dinner on it. <laughs> Good woman. Yeah. You deserve it. <laughs> but um, we've got gorgeous salmon wraps to start off today. And I'm going to let him take you away with the rest of the recipe. And Kira, can I thank you uh, on behalf of myself and everyone here for the beautiful stand. It gets better and better every year. But also for organizing these recipes. There's one for everyone in the audience. So Kira, thank you so much. Give a big round of applause. Well done, thanks a million. Now Kira's going to be handing out uh, these booklets, okay? So don't go home without them. But also, we're going to be doing a free raffle for all the food and a cookbook. Would you like that? Like to win that? Okay, guys, you're all very welcome. What'd you say? Apart from your satay, exactly. We're going to do two recipe or three recipes for you um, for this demo, and then we're doing a different three for the next demo, three o'clock. So we rotate the the recipes that are in the booklet. I'm going to show you how to make a lovely curry. With some beef from Country Crest, uh, and it's a it's a, 
fantastic uh, beef. It's my uncle's beef for Country Crest. They supply it. It's poor beer quality assured. It's going to be done with a nice curry paste, sweet potatoes and some rice. It's really good. And coconut milk. It's really, really quick. Uh, we're also going to do chocolate. Anyone like chocolate? Anybody? Did you get any strawberries? Anyone get any strawberries? Did they bring them any strawberries? Oh, they did. Good, good, good. So guys, we're going to uh, serve some brownie with some strawberries, some raspberries, put some cool swan and I'm going to show you a hot fudge sauce. And then our last dish is a nice little baked salmon done with some broccoli and a nice little marinade or a dressing. So uh, yeah, as, as Kira said, this is my uh, eighth ploughing. Wow, I love this show. I love it. We were in here at eight, seven o'clock this morning and I want to give you, for you to give Claire, it's our first ploughing this year, from Cork, a big welcome. Will you give her a big welcome? So uh, Claire is uh, one of my chefs in the restaurant. I have 14 chefs in my restaurant in Black Lion and Claire is part of the team and it's all about the team. My head chef is with me 12 years. That's huge loyalty. We have a woman in the restaurant who's been working for us for 45 years. So she, she's given her life. She's like a mother to us. So that's huge loyalty. When you get good staff and you look after them, they're part of your family. That's the way we look at it. It's the way mom and dad ran the restaurant. I'm here with my brother Kenneth. He's just there, the good looking fella. And he's the oldest brother and he's a pretty good cook. He loves this, a chicken satay and different kind of like a, how to cook the perfect steak. Isn't that right, Kenneth? And he's just cringing here at the minute. So he'll be able to answer any of your cookery queries after the demonstration. Is that okay, everyone? I'm only joking you, Kenneth. I'm only joking No pressure. Anyway, thanks to Kenneth and Flo Gas who set up the beautiful unit. So guys, we're going to get straight into it. It's very relaxed. I know some of you have to stand. It's a great audience. Thank you so much. It's great to see so many familiar faces year and year. I recognize people. Maybe I forget names, but I recognize people. I was with Marty Whelan this morning. He's such a nice man. I don't think he can cook or boil water to save his life, to be honest with you. But he is the nicest man. And he is just, I'm on his program every Friday. And uh, he's just such fun. So we had great fun this morning. Let me, Kenneth. And we had really good fun. Now, guys, I'm going to show you how to start the curry. Okay? We're using rump beef. These are your recipe booklets. Every recipe that we're making are in these. So my thanks to Kira and the Farmer's Journal team, first of all, for asking me here, but also for providing the recipes for you all. Guys, we're going to use rapeseed oil. Hands up in the audience who uses rapeseed oil when they're cooking. I love it. I love it. I love it because it's an Irish oil. It's a lovely flavoured oil. Donegal is the one I use. But there is another company at the show, Wicklow Rapeseed Oil, a very nice oil. So I honestly, I think we have, and every slightly, all the different oils are slightly different. This one might be a little bit stronger, but the one from Donegal is the one I use in the restaurant. The Wicklow one also is a garlic one and a chilli one. So they're here, I think, at the Enterprise stand. I think so. Right, we're going to drizzle this on the pan. Why do I like this oil? I like this oil because it gets a higher smoke temperature. It doesn't burn. It's good for you, for your heart, for your, for your health. It's the healthiest oil. I like the flavor of it, but more importantly, we're supporting Irish farmers. And that's what I really love. So guys, this is the beef here. We're using rump of beef. This is already diced, and we're gonna sweat this off in the pot, okay? No need to toss it in flour, okay? It will stick a wee bit, that naturally happens. But we'll put it into the pot, and then we'll put some ginger, we'll put some garlic into that. And we're gonna talk about a couple of really lovely Asian ingredients that you can get in Ireland from an Irish company. I'll talk about them in a minute. So everyone, rump of beef is a really good value cut. You can do this with strip loin, sirloin, top side, even the, um, the blade of beef, which is from the shoulder. It really is absolutely beautiful. So it will sky quite a wee bit. And we're just going to put the lid on this in a moment. We have a lid there, Claire, don't we? And then we're going to, oh, there it is, sorry. So just let that seal off for a moment, everyone. Just make sure you coat the base of the pan with the oil. Keep it nice and hot. And we're going to sear that off, okay? Or just seal it off, excuse me. Ginger. When you're using ginger, peel it, wrap it in cling film. And ginger is fantastic if you have a sore throat with um, lemongrass, sliced lemon and honey. It really is good. We're going to grate the ginger. We're going to crush two cloves of garlic. And then what I'm going to talk to you about is just the different ingredients that we're putting into this. So if you can see in the screen, I'm trying to put everything on the board where you can see it. Thai Gold is an Irish company. They have the best curry paste. I could come up here and I could show you how to make a red curry paste, but it wouldn't be as good as this. I'm not lying to you. Thanks, Claire. So Claire's just turning the meat. If you look on the screen, she's turning it in the pan. Might need a wee bit more oil in there. But good woman. You are playing a blinder. Thank you. We are going to put in coconut milk and the full can of coconut milk we're going to put in. So this is definitely worth having in your cupboard. 
It's a very simple recipe, this. The fact that you have the curry paste made, it's quick. It is, and, and that saves time. Now, in Thailand, when they season food, they don't put salt. This is what they use. It's called nam pla. So it's a fermented fish sauce, everyone, okay? So I'm going to put in about two spoonfuls of this in here in a moment. I'm going to grate the ginger. Um, clear is just sealing off the beef, and we're going to crush the garlic. So I'll just get working on that now. Turn down the pan. Crush the garlic. Good woman. Well done. Super job. Scrape that down. So I have two cloves of garlic in this. And I'm going to just grate the ginger in here. So the, gin the ginger is peeled, everyone. I love ginger. Absolutely love it. So just putting the grater on the pot. A few people have been asking me about the pots and knives that I use. They're all Henkel. They're a German company, everyone. And the best place that I think you can get them is in, Ar in Arnott's in Dublin. They always have them on special promotion and on sale. They're really good. Now, a good pot like this that I'm using will cost about 120, 130 euro. But you'll never have to replace it. It is the best. And I opened up the school, thank you, Claire, my cookery school last year. Uh, it was always a dream for me to come through and to have a school. And I use all these products. They're fantastic. So I'll tell you, I've yet to use better. The ginger and the garlic's in there. I'm going to turn up the heat. I'm going to put in three teaspoonfuls of the curry paste. So this is it already made here. Now this is not a hot curry paste. It's not going to burn your mouth. It's, it's from Thai Gold. It's an Irish company based in, they are based in Wexford, excuse me. And they really are excellent. I'm going to put in a little bit of sugar. In the recipe it says palm sugar, but you can use brown sugar. I've only started using this and it's actually really, really good. So a good sprinkle of that, which will add lovely sweetness. Thank you, Claire. We're going to put in some coconut milk. Guys, have a look at this. How creamy that is. Can I explain you the difference in coconut milk and coconut cream? Coconut milk is, um, sorry, coconut cream is coconut milk that's passed through a sieve and then it's much thicker, so it is. So I'm going to put this into our pan, the full can. And if you make a soup, everyone, like a carrot, sweet potato, coconut soup, uh, use this coconut milk, it's the best. Now, if you wanted a low fat, it does catch in your throat, I know, <laughs> Claire, thank you. If, um, if you want a low-fat coconut milk, what you do is get a full can of coconut milk, empty it into a jug like this, and then top it up with a full can of water, and that's it. Don't be buying that watery old stuff. Make this stuff here, seriously. I remember I was cooking with Ray Darcy last year, yeah, on, um, on RT, it was on, on the program, and I went to his house. Ray's a super cook, absolutely brilliant, brilliant cook. And uh, I, I love his passion for food. I love being on a show. but. I got a text because he was using another brand, Amoy or Blue Dragon. You know those brands, coconut milk. And I got a text from, Co no, a tweet from, from um, and it was a personal tweet from, um, from Thai Gold. They said, what's that watery shit on the TV? That's what they said, excuse me for cursing. So there is, honestly, there's a big difference. This is super. Uh, where will you get this? Dunn stores, super value, uh, sell it, and um, health food shops will definitely sell it. Okay, a little bit of stock, and this is from a cube. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Thank you. Claire, you are saving my life. Thank you. Guys, if you use stock cubes, these are the best ones. Callow. They're low in salt. Um, this is a, excuse me, a vegetable one, but you can use a chicken or a beef one. So we're just using a veg one in here. This is what I use at home. In the restaurant with all of my chefs, we make our own stocks. We make a beef stock, we make a vegetable stock, and we make a fish stock. So that's the base for the um, curry. We're going to put in our seasoning, and we're going to talk about these lovely lime leaves now. Okay. So I'm going to bring this to the boil, and then I'm going to put in the sweet potato after about 10 minutes, and I'll explain about that. So it's a one pan dish, two heaped spoonfuls of this. And when you taste this and you think it needs more salt, don't put salt, use that. Guys, this smells revolting. It is awful. I'm telling you. But the, it is essential in this recipe, and it's essential in most Thai recipes, so it is. So there's no flour in this curry, okay? It's a lovely, light, fragrant curry. So let me talk to you about curry, or these are um, lime leaves, excuse me. These are the dried ones, okay? Thai gold, do them in a little box like that. And Norman is the man from Thai gold. He educated me. He said, Nevin, when you dry lime leaves like this, they lose 50% of their flavor. So we buy these frozen. They're about three euro a pack. The only place you'll get these is in the Asian supermarket. And most towns now have Asian supermarkets. All you do is rip them up. 
And if you go to the trouble of getting these, if you make a fresh fruit salad, you know sugar and water, add them in. They're beautiful. If you cook off apples or, or pineapple, anything like that, you roast off any fruits, they're gorgeous. But keep them in the freezer. Take them out, because I keep them in the freezer at home. So they're really, really good. You can actually make your own infused oil. So you can get some chili, you can get some garlic and ginger, uh, some of the lime leaves if you have them, and you can warm up some plain rapeseed oil, and then you have your infused oil. It's really, really easy. So I'm going to give this to Claire now just to put over to uh, the induction, okay, which is going to cook out the beef. But after about 10 minutes, I'm going to put in the sweet potato. So what I've done, everyone, with the sweet potato, or Claire has done, she's peeled the sweet potato and cut into big chunks. Uh, if you don't like sweet potatoes, a few people said to me yesterday they didn't. Do you know what's lovely? Is pumpkin in season and also is butternut squash. So they all work really well in this curry. So, Claire, don't let me forget to put that in. We're going to move on now to our uh, salmon dish we'll do next, if that's okay. And I'll just finish it with a juice of a lime, chopped mint, and a little bit of basil. So it's a very simple dish, it really is. Okay, guys, I'm going to show you a lovely uh, fish recipe. And in the cookery school, we have this course where parents and children come in. And they're aged from the age of five to about 15. And that's where the love of food comes from at home, it all starts. So I got the love of food from my mother, and then I was the first boy in my school to do home economics. Love being with all the girls, but I'll tell you, I knew I wanted to do the cooking. I remember making a shirt once in home economics, we had to sew, and it was that bad my mother and dad used to polish glasses in the restaurant, so I stuck to the cooking. So, um, yeah, so this is one of my uh, dishes that we do for our course, uh, and it's, it's, it's one of the most, it's a half day, so it's half nine to one o'clock, which is enough. So what we're gonna do is make the marinade, and then we'll talk about the salmon. We're gonna use some ginger, we're gonna use some garlic again. So uh, the root ginger, I'm gonna grate this, and I'm using the same grater. If you don't want the dirty, the garlic crush, you can use uh, the garlic crush, or you can use the grater to grate your ginger. So we're gonna put this into the bowl here. Okay, thank you so much. Crush the clove of garlic, and then we're gonna put in nice honey, we're gonna put in sesame seeds, and also what we're gonna put in is a lovely soya sauce I want to talk to you about. Now guys, this is definitely worth getting. You'll only get this in specialized supermarkets, and um, I know M&S sell this, not in this bottle, but a smaller one. Uh, who else? Um, in the Asian supermarket, you'll get this. What it is, it's sweet soya sauce. It's low in salt. It's wonderful. And I use this at home, uh, in the restaurant, in the cookery school. Look how thick it is. It is beautiful, and it keeps for about two years. So when you go to the trouble of getting it, it's about 10 euro a bottle now. It's not, it's not, um, it's not um, cheap. Thanks, Pep. All right, we're gonna put in some honey. We're gonna put in some sesame seeds. So we have everything in jars and different things like that that you can see through. So I'm just gonna get my spoon here. So a couple of spoonfuls, I love sesame seeds. You know, if you make brown bread, sprinkle sesame seeds over it, it's wonderful. Thanks, Claire, all right. Gonna put a little bit of honey, just a little drizzle of honey in here. And the honey I'm using, everyone, is from the and honey, and they are based in Kilkenny, so they are. So Sarah's honey, she flavors them with blueberries and ginger, different things, a great product. Now, so that's the sweetness. Now we're gonna put in some lime. And I'm gonna put in the juice of a lime. I'm just gonna get my knife, and we're gonna put this in. You can use lemon if you don't have it, don't worry. But the lime is gorgeous. There's a lovely kind of Asian feel to this dish. So the curry is on cooking. We're gonna get the salmon done, and then we're gonna pop this into the oven, everyone, okay? So with the salmon, it's pin-boned, and it's organic salmon from Clare Island. I think that's the best, to be honest with you. If you don't like salmon, you can use sea trout or you can use uh, monkfish. Works really well. So that's our lovely marinade. You can cook pork chops with this, chicken breast. Even if you don't want to do the fish, it works really well. I'm going to show you now the parcels, everyone. We're going to use a nice big sheet of tin foil, okay? And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to kind of double it up a little bit. We're gonna put our salmon, which is pin bone, so there's no bones, but the skin is on it, everyone, okay? So that's a lovely little salmon fillet. Now, before I do that, a little drizzle of lemon oil. So I love lemon oil, and this is the Donegal one that I'm using. I would use this over chicken, chicken breast, roast chicken, in couscous and salads, and when you're cooking fish. There's no point in you getting these flavored oils and using them once a year, forget about it. You gotta use them regularly. See, in a salad dressing, wonderful, it really is. So it's just great to see what they can do now with, with the rapeseed oil, they can flavor it with ginger, with, with um, garlic. Garlic is the number one seller, and also chili 
and there's one to do in the restaurant that we use a curry oil can you believe it a curry oil everyone guys we're going to put in some broccoli and Claire has just cooked the broccoli for one minute in boiling water and then in cold water so it's not cooked but it's blanched off why do we do that we do that to keep the color and to keep the nutrients so I'm just going to get just three pieces of the broccoli get your marinade I'm going to use the spoon here all right now I'm going to drizzle this over. Can you all see this on the screens? Are you all hungry? I can't hear you. Of course you are. Well, the food village is when you go out the door, you take a left and another left. You'll be able to buy <laughs> nice food. Now, we're going to bake these off. So we're going to do a little parcel. Just watch this. Crunch them up. Okay. Lift them off onto the tray. And then this is going to go into the oven. So that's what we have there is our little parcel. I'm going to do one more, everyone. So a little bit of lemon oil. My wife, Amelda, she made this dish the other night for the twins. And the twins are really getting into their food. And they've always kind of, to be honest with you, been good little grubbers. But what they've started to do now, if you put herbs into things, they'll pick them out because they don't like anything green. Now they'll eat broccoli and peas. They love peas, so they do. But that's a little phase they're going through. And I suppose when you're working with anything kind of spicy, that curry would be too spicy for them now. You do it gradually. Don't do it too fast. Because spices are something you bring along very gently. Because we're not, you know, it's not part of our culture. But we do love kind of like, um, you know, curries and that kind of thing. And Thai food. Um, I've been to Thailand six times. And we used to go with my mother, God rest her. Um, bought her twice to Thailand. Great country. Has anyone ever been to Thailand? Oh, I love the people. I love the people and I love the food. And we've been to many places, the wee islands and that. And my wife um, has been Imelda and also my father-in-law. And w when we go there, I always do a half-day cookery course. So you're there chopping away, and they're looking at you and saying, wow, you're very good at cooking, you're chopping. And I say, yeah, I like cooking at home. I never tell them I'm a chef. But that's where you learn about ingredients. So, you know, and that's where you learn about all the different kind of ingredients that they use, galanga, the nam pla, all that. And I love their food. So this is a really, really quick, simple dish. But it'll take about 15 minutes to bake off the salmon. And what we usually serve with this is some rice or potatoes, whatever you feel like. Now, I've made extra. See that marinade? Put that into a little jar, and that will keep in your fridge, I reckon, for about maybe 10 days. So you can make it ahead. Now, let's wrap all this, everyone. Nice crunch. Into the oven. Okay. And I'm going to pop it into this oven here behind me. We're using this oven here, which is nice and hot at 190. So it's a nice hot oven. And then we're going to um, set the timer. So we'll give it 15 minutes. These are a great thing to have in your kitchen, everyone. A little timer. Every mobile phone now has timers, but this is great. So about 15 minutes. Okay. Right. So that's there. We'll have a little look at the fish or at the, at the salmon when it's cooking. Guys, I'm going to show you now how to make a brownie. All right. It's very, very quick, very simple. And, uh, you know, this may not be the healthiest thing, but you know what goes into it and everything in moderation. And that's the same for cream and butter and, every, and sugar, everything in moderation. So we have two eggs, sugar, okay, which we have here. So I'm going to put in the caster sugar just into the bowl. That's done there. And what we're going to do, everyone, we're going to make a sabion. So a sabion is just using a hand mixer. You put this in and you have it at high speed. So you cook this for about, um, say about 50, about, about maybe, sorry, you do this for about two minutes. So nice high speed like this. So I'm going to give this to Claire while I'm going to talk to you just about all the lovely chocolate. All right? Thank you. Good woman. Okay, guys, let me talk to you about chocolate. So you'll all know lint. I'll just hold it up to camera there. This is 70% cocoa solids. And I want to explain what that means. So when you look at chocolate, everyone, this is it here that we're using. And it says 70, 65, 50, 90 is very bitter. It means that there's less sugar in it. It's the cocoa butter. That's what that means. It means it's a proper chocolate, it's a very good chocolate, and another brand that um, I think is very good is Green and Black, that you would all know. Now, the one we use in the restaurant is Calibou. It's a Belgium chocolate or Valrona. You can get that in certain shops, but that's the way they come in in the buttons there. All right? Those lovely little buttons there, which are gorgeous. So this is 65% cocoa solids, which means it's not too sweet, and it's not too bitter. That's really important. So what goes into the brownie? Chocolate. Self-raising flour, really important. Um, some cocoa powder. And the cocoa powder I'm using is from green and black. So it's, um, it's unsweetened. It's not sweetened. Thank you very much. Good woman. 
Okay, and the last thing then we have is some pecan nuts. Now, if you don't like nuts, or your kids have a nut allergy, it's a no-go, okay? You don't use that. So, Claire, that looks good. Well done. We'll just get everything in here. And Claire has melted some chocolate and butter. So I'm just going to get that. She has it all sorted for me. And Claire, will you lift up the saucepan and I'll just show everyone what this means. If you ever heard in a recipe what bain-marie means, that's what it means there. So you have a saucepan of water, which is simmering. You sit the bowl on it. Don't let the water get in, because chocolate and water hate each other, and it'll just seize. And what we do is just simply soften that and melt that. That takes about two, three minutes. It doesn't take long. Now, so let's get all our ingredients in here. We're going to use our spatula. So this is chocolate and butter. This is the recipe, everyone, that's in your booklet. It's probably the smallest quantity you can make for this recipe. So scrape this in. All right, so that's the chocolate and the butter. And then we're going to put in our pecan nuts, which are chopped. Or you can use hazelnuts, or you can use walnuts, it doesn't matter. The lovely chocolate buttons, they go in there. And then we're going to sieve in some flour. And this is self-raising flour, everyone. And yeah, Kira's going around with tickets. And the tickets, everyone, it's a free raffle we're going to do afterwards are for the food and a cookbook. Self-raising flour, and then some cocoa powder. Now... Here we go. We're going to sieve this in, and then we're going to fold all this in together. So guys, brownies are so easy, and kids love to make brownies. I think back when I used to cook with my mother, the first thing I used to make is flapjacks, shortbread, apple tarts. I used to make a mess, but I often think of her. And you know, I worked with my mother for over 20 years. We never fell out. I loved my mother. She was a brilliant mother. Um, she passed away now, coming up on nearly uh, three years with cancer. And, uh, you know, she would have just been such a hard worker. And she started the restaurant in Black Lion when there was nothing. And I mean, the restaurant struggled. We closed the restaurant from 70, sorry, from 73 to 1989 with the troubles. So my mom and dad lived through some really tough times. And all my family worked in the restaurant. And I'm the only one to continue it on, myself and my wife. We have over 55 people working in Black Lion. And we're only as good as the team we have, myself and my wife. They're wonderful. What I love about our part of the country, it's very unspoilt. We don't get many tourists, but it's a beautiful part of the country. Has anyone ever been up to Black Lion? Oh, brilliant. A few you have. Good. Well, you're all welcome back. Maybe not all at once. Do you know we opened up our reservation lines last or two weeks ago? Oh, there's the rain on. It was due to come, I think, isn't it? I think that's the rain. Do you know how many bookings we took in six days? 2,330 bookings for the restaurant. Unbelievable. Come on in nice and tight, everyone. We're all dry in here. So everyone, back on to our brownie. This is, um, this is some um, parchment paper. Buttered um, little dish. We scrape this out. And then we're just going to just spread this out here. So we have the other oven preheated. And again, my thanks to my brother Kenneth for setting up the unit. Himself and Jerry were down here early Monday setting up for you all. So thank you guys very, very much. I'm just going to spread this out. Now, this is not going to be the lightest brownie, but this is going to be one of the nicest brownies you're ever going to taste. Claire, keep that for me and I'll lick that spoon afterwards. And that's what we have there, guys. Can you all see that on the screen? So parchment paper, nothing will stick to it. All right? We'll heat the, the um, sugar and then I'll do the chocolate now. So I'm going to put that into the oven, everyone. Don't worry, we have already one done. So this oven, everyone, is at 180. I'm going to turn it up a little bit and it's going to take about 25 to 30 minutes. So let's have a little look at the curry. Is that okay, Claire? I'm going to bring it over here. All right, we'll have a little look here just at the curry. How is it doing? We want to put in the sweet potatoes in case I forget. So that's the beef, everyone. It shouldn't be cooked yet. All right, you can smell that lovely lemon grass. Isn't that nice? That's my aftershave. Do you like it? Thank you. My wife got me that for my birthday. Paco Ravana. Um, this, is, um, <laughs> this is the sweet potato. That's going to go in there. Stir this through. It's going to go back onto the induction. Uh, about maybe eight, ten minutes will be done, and all we finish it off, everyone, is some mint and uh, some basil. Now, Claire, be careful. You all right, Kenneth? Yeah? Sorry, you want to talk to me, do you? Okay. So, guys, what we're going to do is show you how to make a hot fudge sauce. Would you like to see that? It only takes two minutes. Before I do that, this is the brownie, everyone. So this is the brownie, okay? We made this yesterday, but we warmed it up in the oven for about two, five minutes. So it's already soft, it's not at a, and you have no need to store it in the fridge. No need at all. Okay, let me show you this here. A very, very simple um, 
recipe. A cream. Okay. Claire has the sauce been heated. Well done. So this is for a hot fudge sauce, everyone. Cool Swan. Does anyone know Cool Swan? I love it. It's great stuff. Made in Cavan. Made with um, good Cavan cream. Tell me when to stop. I can't hear you. Single malt Irish whiskey. I'm only joking. Yeah. And uh, then it's, it's flavoured with cocoa, white chocolate and vanilla. It's super. Super value have the agency in Ireland for this to have. So we're going to bring that to the boil. A little bit of vanilla extract, Claire, please. Thank you. We're going to put in some chocolate. And this time, we're going to use the little lint bar. Is that a full bar you have there, roughly? Oh, half. half a bar. Okay, thank you. So just want to show you this here, everyone. Tiny little bit of vanilla extract. No sugar in this. Okay, absolutely wonderful. And it's a really simple sauce. So this would have been a sauce that my mother used to make in the restaurant. And what she'd do, she'd get ice cream, sliced pears, poached pears, or you can use a can of pears. And then what you do is some of this sauce, you'll see in a moment. And then what you do is you put it, the sauce over the ice cream and the pear and toasted flaked almonds. Delicious, absolutely delicious. Now, I want to make sure this is nice and warm. So I'm just going to bring this to the boil, everyone. And then we're going to add in our chocolate. So I spoke to you about chocolate. Definitely try and get the best chocolate you can get. It's really, really, really important. Claire's just warming up some sugar, okay? So we can turn that down now. And then we're gonna have a little bit of fun and we're gonna serve up our brownie. We're gonna do our curry and then the salmon should be cooked. Is that okay? Are you happy enough? Now, I'm gonna add this in here. So uh, this week was a big week for me. I was up in Dublin Monday and uh, we launched my cookbook and it's the healthy cookbook. So it's not a diet book. It's all about healthy recipes, juices, there's um, wheat-free dishes, there's gluten-free dishes, sugar-free dishes. It's a very interesting book. And it's a journey that I didn't really know enough and not about. You think healthy food is going to be insipid and bland, but it's really lovely. Recipes are very quick, which is the secret. So um, Sonia Sullivan launched it last uh, Monday, gone by. And last Thursday, last Friday, I was down in Fota Island. Anyone ever been there? I'd never been there. Fantastic. I can't wait to bring my twins and Imelda. So Sonia was staying there with her family, and she was out for a 5K run. And then I met her at half nine, and then we ran about 3K. Jesus, she put me on a lead. And she was fabulous. She was fabulous. No, I did. I done okay. I was actually quite proud. I think she actually ran very slow because of me. I'm just going to add in the chocolate in here, and then I'll show you what I'm doing. So after that, we cooked. And Sonia made a lovely hake dish with Clonakilty black pudding on top, which was beautiful. And then she'd done polenta uh, chips in rosemary rapeseed oil. It was wonderful now. So uh, she's up in the restaurant tonight with her family, her two lovely daughters and her husband, Nick. And then she's heading back, I think, next week. But she's a wonderful ambassador, isn't she? She's an absolute lady, absolute lady. And I suppose I got to know her over the last couple of years. She's been to the cookery school and she just loves cooking. She just loves cooking. And so when I was recording with her last week, I was asking her about her diet, what she ate before her race, you know, was her diet important to her? And now she has time to cook with her kids. So this is our sauce, everyone. I'm gonna pour it into this little bowl here. You can see it. Look at that, guys. Now, if you weren't all here, I think I would have that, a straw on that, and I'd be actually sucking that up. It's so delicious. It's not sweet. You're using chocolate. I'm sure it's nicely flavored with the cool swan. You know I didn't measure it, so let's have a taste. Oh, that's awful. Mm. That is delicious. I, I like it because it's bitter, and there's no, um, there is no, um, there's no sugar in it. Now. Let me show you now the brownie, okay? We're gonna do our um, sugar, and this is something I always do. And I have two people that I'm going to bring up here for this sugar basket. So I have um, a lovely Clara, is that right? Clara, Clara, where are you, pet? She came up to me earlier on. Clara, where are you, come on. Donahy, I can't even read my own writing. Donahy, Clara Donahy, there she is. And we have Jimmy Terry. Jimmy Terry, come on up, Jimmy. Give, me a round, give him a round of applause. Jimmy Terry is an absolute legend in Black Lion. And this young lady, where are you? Come on up, don't be shy. We're going to have a little bit of a chat. Thank you, Jason, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, I'll introduce Jimmy in a minute, but I want to chat to this lovely young lady who came over to me. And she's very excited. So tell everyone your full name and where you're from, Pet. Uh, Clara Doheny, and I'm from Tipperary. Tipperary. Where yeah. in Tipperary? Care. Just outside oh, here. I know it well. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to the plowing before? I have, yeah, yeah. Have, yeah. Times, yeah. Uh, and are you involved? Are you, do you work as a farmer? No, 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 Jesus, no. no. <laughs> uh, what year are you in school? I uh, college. Oh, Co college. Final year, yeah. You have a lovely young face. <laughs> wow, I'll tell you one thing. And what are you doing in college? Uh, geography. Geography. Fantastic. Geography, yeah. Going well? Yeah, yeah. Super so duper. Far, good, so good, good. Do you like cooking? 
I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Good, good. Well, we're going to have a bit of fun doing some sugar. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. I want to introduce my other sidekick here, Jimmy hello, Terry. Come yeah, on, well, come on over and say hello to everyone now. Yeah, hello. How are you all? Yeah. How are you all? This is for a man, a man. <laughs> That's right. And I must, right uh, I have to tell you, this man, I meet him the last few years That's at right. the Plough he lives probably five minutes from where I live. Right, yeah. But this man looks after uh, my family, but That's also right. uh, with sticks and that. Uh, but we're very good people. to my mother. That's right. I'm great people, your people, watch that. You know. Right. And if it's up in Black Lane, you should give this man support because you need, he's the best wee civil man you'll ever meet. Down to where, no, nothing with him, high grace and nothing. He's, he's never, that's what you see here. <laughs> he's, he's a great ambassador. There's the brown envelope in my back pocket here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't thank this man enough because. Now, come here, you're going to do the sugar. You're not getting away that likely. You know the thoughtfulness of good neighbours. And he used to call to my mom and bring her sticks every winter. That's, That's right. amazing. Ah, no. So we owe you one. No, 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 we go no. back a long time, no, don't no. we? Up a, up a and many, many a good meal we cooked many for you. Good feed you cooked for Absolutely. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, no, it doesn't show on them. I'll tell you one thing, not a pick on them. Guys, we're going to have a bit of fun. Jimmy, you should be an expert in this because you've done this before. Last year. I did not make a cod here last year. Now, Clara, isn't it? Did I get that right? Okay. So guys, I'm going to show you one basket and then you're going to master it yourselves. You ready for it? Uh, you ready for it? <laughs> All right, deep breaths. Hold it well up, isn't it? Yeah, hold it well up. That's right. Hold the spoon well up above the ladle. Yeah. So in the saucepan, everyone, we have sugar, we have water, and we have glucose. And we just cook it for about 20 minutes. You have the recipe in the back of your booklet. You wouldn't want to be in Fitz the night before. No, you would not want to be in Fitz's, which is the local bar in Black Lion, the night before. <laughs> A pity we don't have a microphone on you. See the way I've done that, Clara? Okay, you break all these loose ends off, and then you just give it a twist and it comes off like that. A lovely little basket. Now, ladies first. I'm gonna get the sugar ready for you. Don't worry, pet. We'll get it nice and high. So you can hold it, and the secret into this is to hold it nice and high. Perfect, you're brilliant. Away you go. So you go in one direction and you go in the opposite. Jimmy, you're watching, you're she, next. She's done it before. She done it before, she's a legend. Good woman. Over and back, perfect. And if you oil the ladle once, everyone, it won't stick. So sugar, water, glucose, it's in your little booklet. Have you all got your recipes? Don't forget to go round. Remember, yeah, see your little booklets? So that's from the compliments of the Farmer's Journal. You're very good. You're very good. Are you going to be as good, Jimmy? No, no. You are, of course. You have a shaky hand. <laughs> that's an excuse, isn't it, guys? Now, Clara, I'm going to take that off you, pet. And I'm going to break this off, and I want you to twist that and hold it up to our cameraman there. Now. Look at that, guys. Well done. So now you'll get a shot of that. <coughs> now, you hold on to that, Jimmy. Here we go. Good man. Hold it nice and high. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Over and back. Good man. No, no, you're doing Over great. And Over and back. Brilliant. No. Isn't he doing brilliant? Good. What about a bit of encouragement? Come on, guys. Good man. Yeah, that's very good. That's, that's very different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a one-off, never to be repeated. No, we don't know. That's 15 minutes gone from my salmon. Claire's going to check it. Good man. Clara, you looking? Yeah. Now, this is a real unusual technique. <laughs> this man is great at knitting. He's fantastic. That's brilliant. Good man. Know, oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> magic, magic. <laughs> uh, he's just got a job for Newbridge Silver. And it's going <laughs> to... I think I'm going to wet myself here, I swear to God, Jesus. Jimmy, that's, uh, you haven't been practicing since last year anyway. But come here, uh, I want to thank you. And listen, put that on eBay, you might get a few pounds for it. Um, can I give them both a goodie bag? Jimmy, you're a legend, and thanks for all your kindness to our family. You're a gentleman. Give him a round of applause, and to Clara. Thank you so much. Clara, well done, pet. That's for you. We have a cookbook for you. What else have we got? We have some goodies, some lovely fruit from Pat Clark. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck in your studies. Guys, can I show you two other types of uh, sugar? Uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to be, um, I'm going to serve up the brownie. Okay. So, what's it? Yeah, is it done? Brilliant. Oh, super. The salmon's done. The curry should be done. So what I'll do, Claire, I will, before I do my um, brownie, I'll serve up the salmon. Thank you. Guys, this is what we call um, angel's hair. That was good fun. Jimmy, you're a legend. You're a one-off, I can tell you. Ah, uh, good crack. Good man. And Jimmy, don't forget to call. It's been a while since you called to us. Absolutely. When the football's on, he usually pops in, and we always get him something to eat. That's one thing we don't forget. Okay, guys. So you're pulling the sugar from the spoon. Angel's hair. Guys, enjoy. Take it. Enjoy it. Not good for your teeth. Share it. Share it. Well done. The last one we're going to do is a little curl. And this is a, a steel that we use for sharpening knives. Just takes a moment. 
and then we're going to serve everything up, guys, and I'm very happy about that. That's perfect. That salmon cooked really fast. So look at what I'm doing, everyone. Look at the two. Look at lads. Well done. They're enjoying. Oh, you're coming up for sugar, are you? What are you coming for? Do you know what I have for you? I have some lovely strawberries, which are really nice. And when you give the three of them a little punt, now, Jesus, they're all coming out of the woodwork. Here we go. Now, share them out. Hold on, you see this now? Lovely little sugar curl. Watch this. Poor Nile, he's trying to please everyone with his shots. And that's our lovely little sugar curl. I'm going to keep that. So give them a couple of punnets of strawberries and they can share that. And that's compliments of Pat Clark, okay? You don't want strawberries. They're the best. They're the best. Or oh, your mum's sending you whether you want them or not. You know. <laughs> now, guys. <laughs> right. We're going to serve up our salmon. We're going to finish our curry. Claire, if you bring the curry over to me, good woman. No, no, give me that first, good woman. And then we'll just do our brownie. So let's have a little look. Now I'll have a look at this, just the salmon here. I'll open it out. Clara, I forgot to give you your basket. That's there if you want to come up for it afterwards. It's absolutely super. Okay. So that's it done. Yeah, I'm going to hold it up here. Now it's very hard to see. I'll just put it on the plate, Niall. And that might make it a little bit easier for you. Guys, can we see that there? Um, it's cooked. And how I know it's cooked, there's a little white protein that comes out of oily fish. And that's perfectly cooked. It's really moist, it's succulent, and it's not overcooked. So 15 minutes, isn't that right? Yep. 15 minutes at 190, super. You can add more vegetables into that. I'm not going to unwrap the other one, because whoever wins it, I want them to bring it home and pop it into the oven. It's not a nice wee dish. With rice, everyone, with potato, it's a really quick dish. And that would be a dish that we would do for the parents and kids cooking, because I think, watch, it's hot. It's really important that children eat fish. I'm from a family of nine, and four of them don't eat fish. What's that? <laughs> Are you coming up for something? Do you want some strawberries? Here we go. We'll get you some strawberries. Here we go. Good lad. Now, oh, they're good for you. And you have your chocolate chip cookie. Good man. Guys, can I show you to finish the curry? I'm going to just get some basil. Basil is a tricky herb. You know that. It really is. It can just break your heart. Some mint. We'll need to top this up, Claire, for the next demo, if you don't mind. A little bit of coriander. And then we're going to chop all of this. You don't have to go and get these three herbs, but mint is crucial. Mint is really different in this. Kira, you okay? Do you want me to call that? Yeah. Anybody, anybody need tickets for the raffle? Anybody need tickets? Kira, the legend, has given out the tickets, and this is for the raffle for the food and a cookbook. Now, guys, just watch me here. I'm going to show you all how to chop herbs. We're nearly finished. All right, that's okay. No problem. Using your big knife, I'm going to turn this around because I have a bit of sugar there. This is our curry. Smells fantastic. And the beautiful thing about the curry, everyone, is that, Claire, you can put the juice of the lime in, if you don't mind. The beautiful thing about the curry, everyone, is that you don't need to thicken it. If you find it a little bit runny, you put in too much stock. Just dilute some corn flour, but there's no flour in it. It will thicken up with the sweet potatoes, and also when you cook it, reduce it. So I'm not going to chop that very fine. Just watch the way I'm chopping, everyone. Hold the knife over and back. And then you just bring it up, all your lovely herbs, into the curry. Scrape that out. And then I'm going to wipe my knife because I need that for my brownie. And then we're going to serve up the curry. So stir through the herbs at the last moment. I just want to show this to you in the pan, if we can get a shot. I don't know how that is for you, Niall, there. It might be very tricky. Can you all see that on the screen? The curry, the beef. It's gorgeous. It's not spicy. It's full of flavor. Don't put salt into it because there should be enough seasoning in it. Now, what we got was a rice steamer from Lidl. Was it, Claire? Is that where you got it? Yeah. yeah. They're about, how much was it? 10 euro, 12 euro? Super. So you put the rice in, a little bit of water or stock, and we use some of the organic rice. That's really good, Claire. Well done. That's been cooked now for about an hour, and that will keep for about three or four hours warm. It's a really good thing. Will you show everyone that we rice steamer, Claire? It's a cute little thing. Should just show you here. Just hold it up. Fantastic. I have one of them at home. We have a large one in the restaurant. Definitely worth getting, guys. A rice steamer. Fantastic. Now, let's pack it up with rice. Good woman yourself. Thank you. And if you are going to get the rice, everyone, will you try and get the Thai gold rice? It's organic and they do a really nice brown one, which takes longer to cook, but they do the lovely jasmine rice. Now, to serve this up, we just get our curry. Okay, nice big pile of meat. Okay, you can eat the lime leaves, but don't really serve them, you know, because all you'll be tasting is lime. Sweet potato, 
I love it. Try this with pumpkin. And how good does that look, everyone? That's my second dish for you. The beef red curry with sweet potato and rice, okay? That's that. We're going to put that here. Claire will put it into a little container. You're not getting my bowls or plates uh, when we raffle off. You're getting a lovely little foil container. And then we're going to serve up our brownie. So, you must be all starving, are you? Is there anything worth... You really are, aren't you? I'm going to give you some brownie. Would you like some brownie? I know you would. I know you would. I want to show you the brownie, everyone. Claire, if you just get me the plate... And I'll give you that. That looks gorgeous. Did you get a shot of that, Niall? Yeah? You got a shot of that? Yeah? Happy with that? That looks really good. And it, it looks really good against the black. Can you all see that on the screen? I know it's hard for you to see maybe over there. And I love the fact that the sweet potato hasn't gone mushy. Yesterday, I put it in a little bit early, and it went a little bit mushy. So after about 10 minutes, should be fine. Thanks, Claire. All right. Good woman. Thank you. Now, our brownie, everyone. This is not the one I did. We done this yesterday, and we warmed it up. So this is a dish you can make ahead, lift it out, and with the parchment paper, look at it, it just should just peel off, so it does. Take it out, be careful. It's gooey, it's sticky, it's soft. Can you see that? It's beginning to crack. That's what I love in a brownie. Now, you're all okay with nuts, are you? Okay, that's cool. Uh, we're just gonna cut this here. We're gonna serve this up. They're moving closer, stand back. We're gonna trim this here. And I just wanna show you the consistency of this. This is fantastic. Look at that, guys. Look on the screen. It's moist. It's sticky. It's everything I like in a brownie. I'm going to switch this off. I'm going to put it in the center of the plate. All right. Claire, I'm going to give you this. Cut a little bit for our crew there at the front. The miracle of the loaves and fishes. All right. And then I want to show you what we're going to do with this. Some strawberries. You've got the taste, Pat Clark's. And Pat Clark is a strawberry grower in Stamullen. He has a little booklet out, everyone. Clark's Fresh Fruit. So that's it there, everyone. And the stand number is 655. Really good jams, really good fruit. For me, he's one of my food heroes. Now, let's just serve up our uh, strawberries. Okay, just around the plate. We're going to put some raspberries. The best. Pat Clark, excuse me. In 50 years of growing strawberries, this year has been the earliest he ever picked strawberries, and they're still growing. So it's been a really good year. He's an absolute gentleman. We use his fruit in Black Lion, and I cannot tell you how good he is. He's fantastic. Now, last thing we're going to do, remember the sauce that I made a while ago? We're just going to get a spoon. All right. And then we're going to just drizzle this over. Watch, everyone. Oh, I hear that. Oh. <laughs> A scoop of ice cream is divine with this. I'm sorry, guys. This is one of your five a day because it's fresh fruit. And <laughs> Okay, that's a lie. Your little basket on top, your lovely little sugar curl, which is just broken. It's so fragile. But how good is that brownie there? So that's the chocolate and pecan brownie with some of Pat Clark's fruits. We're going to do our raffle now. And after I do the raffle, I'll be over here. We have any two of my books for 35 euro, and I'll be more than happy to sign them. Kira mentioned about the baby and toddler book. But it's actually my most successful book. There's 50 recipes for babies and 150 for all the family to enjoy. It's a runaway success. Now, Kira, are we ready to go? We have a load of kids for the brownie. Okay, perfect. They're going to help Kira do the raffle. Sophie is first. Thank you, Sophie. And guys, can I thank you all so much? And thank Claire. Big round of applause to Claire and Thomas, wherever Thomas is. Now, everyone, this is a pink. Six. Nine zero. Six nine zero. Pink. There's someone. Come on up to me, my love. Well done. Yeah. You are going to get... What are we giving this lady? Uh, What's up? Salmon. Salmon. Perfect. There we go. Now, Kira. Jen? Jamie. 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 Excuse me. Jamie. Pardon me. We have another Jamie in the Farmer's Journal. A bit of a legend, too. And Jason, can I thank you on sound? You're probably fed up listening to me, but we're only halfway there. You have another day and a bit to go, I'm sorry. A green ticket, everyone. 817, 817. Green ticket, 817. Down the back, come on up, well done. There's a happy lady. And that is for the curry, is it clear? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> What's this young lad doing? What's his name? Sean. Hey, Sean was looking for his own. You're some chancellor. Uh, Sean picked out this ticket. It's a green ticket. 728, everyone. 728. 728. There's a lady coming up. 
Claire, can we get a photograph with everyone in the background? Do you mind if I tweet this? Will you organize that, Claire? Have you got my phone? Okay. So, pink ticket, 645, 645. This is for the brownie, okay? It's not for the cookbook. There's only four, okay? Have you four number prizes? Four. Yeah, that's number four. Okay, okay. So now, guys, come on, let's get this photograph and then we're going to do that. We, and we have for the cookbook. Just here behind me, guys, you're all going to wave on the count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Wave, come on, cheer, let's go. <laughs> Way! <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Okay, it's not number four. Yeah, so this is for the book, isn't it? Yeah. This is for the book. So six, four, five. Well done. So you have a copy of the new book, the healthy book, okay? You sure? So guys, thank you all so much. Kira, thank you as always. Guys, I'm back on at three o'clock. Enjoy the rest of the plow and I hope you enjoyed it. If you want a book, I'll be over here. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheers.
Right folks, we make a start on our next demonstration. Okay, folks, welcome to demonstration three on day two of Plowing 2015. This demonstration, in conjunction with 4B, uh, ICBF, and the journal, will come together just to kind of do a little bit of a demonstration on various types of stock. So, first up, Aidan Brennan, our dairy specialist here with the journal, is going to talk about these two whaling heifers, two, two whaling dairy heifers that have come into the ring. We we'll go through the, the other various classes of stuff with sucker cows and whalings and finishing animals, and then we we'll finish off with the sheep. The whole thing will take about an hour. 
Um, the stock aid that's fair to say are going to be tired of it at this stage. Like, <laughs> um, not the only ones that. <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're a little bit worse to wear, but it, you, have two, you have two different tempers here, There's obviously one is bigger than the other. Talk to us a bit about them and what lads can do at this, at this stage of the year. Yeah, so Jack, I suppose that the whole purpose of the, this then was to go through uh, management practices for the next, the next couple of months for, for impact or for uh, wheeling heifers. So these are two spring-born animals. The, the bigger one and the larger of the two there, she was born 29th of January. And the one, uh, the one next to her then was uh, well, almost a month later. But as you can see, there's a fair difference now in size between the two of them. So the bigger one is, is weighing 220 kilos at the moment, and the, the lighter one then she's weighing down to 160. But I mean, like that means nothing really unless you're working off a target. So, our, and I mean for me, the most important target to hit is that at bulling, the mating time. So that's that's the end of April, the early May. And uh, depending on what your mature weight and your herd is, that's usually around between 3, 340 to 350 kilos. So work that back then to where they should be today. And we're saying that they should be 200 kilos today. So this one obviously then she's above that, so she's she's fine. There's no there's no fear of her. But the uh, the one at 160, the smaller of the two, is uh, you know she needs a bit of TLC to get her up to that target weight of mating. So I mean. You know, you can say, okay, if you've got good quality grass, what did that do? Like, that's fine for the moment, but as we move into October, you know, weather's going to deteriorate, the quality of the grass isn't going to be as good. She's still not going to achieve her gains. So I'd be saying there for her, she needs at least two kilos a day and separate her out from the rest of the group. No point in feeding needs in a bunch because she'd be bullied away. Even when we're here feeding them, the bigger one is just clutching the other one away and she's not getting the chance to do it. So these small animals, they might only be 10 or 15% of your herd, but pull them out. We got these for herd in Tipperary and they're all together, they're in with 40 other animals. And the farm, you know, looking at the field, Jack, like it's yeah. fair to say, we went in and we thought, Jesus, these are a fabulous bunch of animals. But only when he went through it and, and picked out the lighter ones, you see the difference between them. Right. So that's the first key message. Second one then is, as we move into, into winter then, you're bringing these animals in for, for the winter period. Silage alone won't be good enough to drive performance for that lighter one. It might be sufficient for the big one, just barely. But like we're seeing that it's, it's only 0 0.4, 0 0.5 a kilo. Uh, of live weight per day with, 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 with silage, with good quality silage. Over 100 days, uh, you know, depending on the size of your long length of your winter, over 100 days, 0.5 a day, 50 kilos at best over that winter period on good quality silage. Yeah, and she's going to come into shed at, at less than at 180 or whatever else, like, you know, yeah. give, her, give her that for the month. Yeah. She's not, uh, she won't be up, she won't make it for the, for the, for the, uh, for the 1st of May uh, to be 340, 350 kilos. Right. So she needs, she needs 2 or 3 kilos for the winter and good quality silage, but split them out first, that's, that's the key one. Just while they're in, in terms of genetics, um, the bigger one is, is out of GZY, so a genomic bull, he's, he'd be one of the higher, higher bulls. Her EBI is 345, she's out of a good, a high EBI cow. The one on the left is out of a PDO, uh, who's a bit lower now, he, he's 200, and, uh, the, cat, the heifer sorry, is 220 oh. EBI at the moment. So. But I mean, look, they're, they're both from, um, there's a, obviously, there's, there's, she's just behind, she's, she's a month later, uh, born, and she hasn't, got the same, she hasn't had the same go as, as the other one, she's just had the same tribe. And uh, she needs a bit of TLC because she was in the same bunch all along. Yeah. Okay, so two messages. Identify, I suppose, we're, you would hear that maybe slightly above target, Aiden, but give or take, she's, two, she's 220 kilos now. They need to be 200 kilos here today to make 330, 340, 1st of May next yeah. year. And that's the, the key there. The reason why we have the target is for the, the, the calf in February the following year. Like, so you want yeah. them to go and calf the first, the first shot, yeah. whatever that is, the calf next February. If, they do, if the calf later than that, if she goes to the second service or the third service with the bull, I mean, you have a late calving cow to begin with, and that's a disaster for him. Yeah. I mean, the only chance you have to manipulate the date the cow is going to calve is as a heifer. Yeah. From there and then you're, you're, you're really playing with, you know, it's, it's, up to, it's up to the gods at that point. So you're saying to select out the small, you know, the maybe 10 or 20 percent of, 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 of the, if, if a farmer has 30 or 40 of these heifers that are lighter, need a bit of TLD now, but they're a bit of grass or that's a bit of meat and grass now for the next six or eight weeks. And then, obviously, then maybe inside the first winter as well, they're going to need a little bit of shovel on it. Definitely, and I suppose a lot of people say, oh, we'll give two kilos across the board to all the animals. It makes a lot more sense to me to spit out the lighter ones and heavy ones and maybe give this one three kilos or a little bit along with it and only give her one maybe just to tick her along because that's all she needs. Right. You don't want them too heavy either. Like. Okay, any, any, any questions or anything on, on the dairy side of things? Anyone, anyone, any questions um, before we move on to the suckler, cow and calf? Are we all happy? Um, okay, we leave them out and they're all getting a bit tired now, so they are after after the soccer looking a bit a little bit sugar for the for the couple of days. But Nathan, you've you have a suckler cow and calf here and a replacement heifer. And again, I suppose we're talking about good genetics, Nathan. You've a you've a five star suckler cow and a five star um, replacement heifer. 
So these, these stock were uh, sourced from a, a commercial herd in, a suckler herd in Eden Derry here, uh, in Eden Derry County Offaly. And, and effectively, they're, they're, they're good commercial stock, but they have the stars, they have their five stars. So there's big chat at the moment in terms of the BDG, BDGP scheme. Nathan, I'll, I'll let you take it over. Yeah, we'll just, hang on a second, Joe, our Jack, they're just after, they're just coming out now. So the first one here is a replacement heifer, five-star heifer. And then we have a five-star cow, the, the uh, cemental cross cow, along with the uh, cemental cross calf as well. Um, I suppose, Jack, yeah, you're right. There has been an awful lot of talk about the, the beef data genomic scheme the last couple of, well, last couple of months, really. Um, but what we have here is a, is a good example of, of what can, you know, when you do follow the index and, 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 and you, 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 you produce a good cow that's doing the job, what you, what you can do. Um, first of all, any idea what the what age that cow is? Use one age on her. Four. You can go another bit. Any other offers on that? Be careful if I were you. She's uh, two thousand and seven born cow. Um, the calf is a February born calf. Can anybody guess the weight of the calf? Any good calf in that here? Uh, another bit. Another bit along with this. Lower, we'll go again. Yeah, close enough. 330. Um, so yeah, we a February born calf, 330 kilos, and uh, a five star cow. Um, that's getting on at this stage. She's had six calves. I suppose Jack, we, we've said this at all the things. You know, she um, she's born in 2007. She calfed down first in 2010, and she's had a calf every single year since that. Um, so she is exactly what you want on, on, on a sucker farm. Which is unusual, of course, for sucker. Is, is it fair to say it's unusual to have calf per cow per year? If yeah, we, yeah a, a calf per cow per year or, or a calf interval of, of what she has is quite, it, it's quite unusual. The average cow in the average sucker herd in the country, Jack, is producing about 0.8 of a cow per, per year, or 0.8 of a calf per year, not a cow. Um, she has a calf interval of 356 days. And we'd always be speeching on about targets, and our, our target calf and interval is 365 days. We want a calf every year. We want that cow doing a job and, and producing the calf every year to sell. She's actually a little bit better than that at 356 days. Um, the average cow and the average herd, again, the calf and interval is 405 days. So, as you can see, if you had a herd of cows like that, you're going to have an awful lot more output. Um, and output is the name of the game. You know, when, when you have such a high cost system, Jack. And, and low and 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 low uh, output in terms of, of the, the, the value of the calf out of one cow per year, um, then then it's critical. Um, if if she was if she was the average cow jack, yeah, with a calf in full of four hundred and five days, we wouldn't have a calf here. She'd probably be calfing in God knows when, not October yeah. November, and she'd probably have four and a half, maybe maybe five calves at best. Yeah. over the last couple of years. Lost output big time. Big time, Jack, yeah. And there's no room for that in, in, in the suckler scenario. It just, it just doesn't work. Um, your, your, your finances are going to be under pressure if that's the case. The difference between going from the national average of 0.8 of, of, of a calf per cow per year, which is there, thereabouts, national average, to 0.9, which is what we're achieving on average in the Better Farm Programme, um, a programme that we're involved in in Chagas, the 31 farms taking part. Um, the, the difference in that alone, in a 50 cow herd, is five extra calves to sell at the end of the year. And if you put it, figures on that, Jack, you know, what, what, what kind of price are we put on that wheel? 800 euros then. We'll, we'll throw 800 on them. Yeah. Five eighths is 40. 4,000 euros of, out, of lost output. Um, and that's just from simply just culling cows that are inefficient, making sure that your cow is calving down every year and that she's productive. In terms of milk, um, you know, we're, we're looking for a very functional cow. We want a cow to do the job. That calf is 330 kilos, February born calf. Would you be happy with that? More or less. Like it's, it's a heifer calf, remember, so it's, you know, we're, that calf has gained, I think, according to ICBF, Niall, you were saying earlier on, 1.25 kilos a day since birth, which is well above average. The average would be somewhere in around the one kilo per day for a heifer calf or even slightly under it in the national herd. So milk is a major driver of, of weanling weight. We, we've seen that in, in Chagas. Um, Chagas studies down through the years and from, from this cow you can see that it's actually she, she's delivered in the calf she has a calf that's, that's, that's going to be heavy at sale okay right I mean yeah I mean that's more or less it from, <clears throat> from the cow I mean if, we, if, if maybe if I bring in Niall Kilrain from 
from ICDF, uh, just to uh, talk about the cow and calf, Niall. Um, you know, she, 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 you're telling us she's a five-star cow, she's had a calf for a couple of years. As, as, I mean, is she, you know, is, is, is there, you know, when we take the population as a whole of sucker cows here in Ireland, is she typical of, you know, what the five-star will deliver, I suppose? Like? Yeah, I suppose, Jack, that now you, now you touched on it there in terms of the, the individual cow performance that this cow is booking the trend. I suppose my colleague Chris is just going to hold up some stats here of the... This is just a snapshot of approximately 100,000 cows, suckler cows, that were born in 2008 in herds that are signed up to the, the new BDGP scheme, which I'm sure a lot of you here are in. So I look at these cows, as I said, born in 2008, so they've been on farm a while. We split them up into the five-star cows versus the one-star cows. And, you know, you can see clearly there for all the, what they call them, key profit indicators, number of calvings, age of first calving, calving interval, percent of life, is the right, you know, which is survival, staying in the herd, growth of the calves, milk score, carcass weight, and age at slaughter. For all those things, the five-star cows, on average, are consistently outperforming the one-star cows. And, you know, it's at that high level, you know, big numbers across, big numbers of herds, it's very interesting to see that, you know, that message is out there. And that's what we're trying to get to, the, to I suppose, focus in on those cows, the five-star cows, breed from them, and then obviously equally identify the one-star cows and get them out of the system because it's the one-star cows that are sucking the profit out of the, the, the each enterprise and each herd that they're so, in. So what you're saying is this cow belongs to Sean Evans is is not booking the trend. If you're doing the figures on the whole the whole of Ireland, some cows the whole of Ireland, it's still the same. You're getting that extra calving almost from, from the five-star versus the one-star cows. Absolutely, yeah. Obviously we picked her out for a, a specific example to say well look she's a high index cow she's operating in a, a normal commercial suckler farm the same as everyone else has she has high indexes she has the on-farm performance data to back it up and you know it's 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 just a message to get it out there that these pr profitable beef suckler cows are out there it doesn't matter what breed she is that you know it's to focus the mind on identifying these cows. Now some, some, some suckler farms have come up and they've come up stand here and say listen we have a two or three star she's a very good cow you know she's only two or three stars you know what what, what can we do or what should we do or you know oh absolutely and i mean we we're talking there to different farmers with different breeds between the talks here at the the shed and everyone has the same question like that cow at home why is she this and why is she that and you know as i said that stats table that we were looking at that's based on a hundred thousand cows and on average those five star cows will always be ahead of the one star cows and then obviously when you break it down to the individual cow versus cow basis you'd say well why is this cow that and that cow is this you know it's it's a function i suppose of the reliability of the figures that historically we've had very low levels of data recording in suckler farmers in you know yeah. it, it wasn't a, a common practice for farmers to record information so with this new scheme they'll be getting lots of i suppose surveys and different options to record information in terms of calving difficulty um, cows cow milkability cow docility calf quality calf docility all those key pieces of information that you record will have an effect on the index of the animals in your herd so you will have much more control instead of us sending you out a report and you're wondering why is this cow two star why is this one five star you'll be able to see that well if you record it accurate information on your animals over time you'll start to see the indexes much more accurately reflect what's at, what's happening on your individual farm so it's very much a, a, a what would you call it a partnership approach with the farmer sending in information to ICBF and us sending information back into you and that's what this is all geared towards this type of cow a high index cow and she has the index and she has the performance to back it up Perfect. Um, Nathan, if we just touch off the other animal in the ring, the replacement heifer, I would, is, is she typical maybe of what's, what's out there on the better farms or, or maybe where they're going? I mean, she's, she's, a, she's a decent heifer for her age. What age is she again? Remind us. She is, Jack. I think she's, from what I can remember, she's going to cap down around 26 months. I think so, yeah. She's not going to yeah. be there around the, the 24. She's a little bit stronger than that. Um, she's a five-star heifer again. Um, good heifer, by all accounts. Quite, you know, quite beefy, beefy enough. Um, is she typical? Like, yeah, she, she you know, it, there will be breed differences, obviously. Like, it's not, it's not an issue. The one thing I'd say is, um, number one, go back to the common cap for farmers. Just focus on the point that Niall said about about weight recording. I suppose 
the one thing that's essential, um, you know, is to, is to wait report between 150 and 250 days. That's probably the best time that you're going to get a handle on what kind of milk is in the cow. And if you feed that, that information back into, into ICBF, it will help to strengthen the figures to, to some extent. Um, I suppose, Jack, the average cow, or the average heifer calving down into the herd is going to be older than that generally. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of people still calf them down towards the 30 months to 30, you know, 36 months, maybe not, but generally around the 30 month mark. Um, a lot of a lot, a lot of farmers, especially in the better farm program, will switch over to 24 month calf and that way perfectly with it. Um, it takes a high level of management, no more than the dairy side with your, with your own heifers, Jack. Um, I suppose one thing to say is that, like, this heifer is in calf now, the, the job is done, she was a strong heifer. If you're thinking about breeding heifers next spring, or next, you know, ne next year, it's now you need to be to be looking at your heifers, pulling them out, checking the weight gains now, or checking the weights of them now, and making sure that you get a good weight gain over the winter to make sure that they're going to be able to calf down in 24 months, if that's the way you're going. Um, you need to have them at about 60% of their of their uh, of the mature cow weight at at breeding. So you're talking somewhere between 400 and 440 kilos, depending on your your cow weight. Um, next next spring when you're boning. So now is the time weigh the calves. Um, and the next thing would be to, to sample your silage, know what quality silage you have, and construct your feed regime then for the winter based on that to make sure you get your 0.7 a kilo of weight, okay. weight gain per day. Okay, I think we're happy enough. Uh, Niall, do you want to mention that on the, on the replacement heifer as you're going out there? Um, we, can, we, can, we can switch in the... Yeah, well, just a quick mention, I suppose. Yeah. Nathan covered off the phenotypic or the, the type of animal that she is, but just in terms of the indexes, as we mentioned about the cow, she's a high index cow, she's 100 euros, but the heifer is a good step further ahead again. She's 140 euros on the index, which is, in theory, what you're trying to do, you know, you're trying to bring in higher genetic merit animals into your herd all the time, so that over time, you're, you're improving and increasing the level of you know, quality that you have in your herd. And, you know, there is no end point for that, you know, that you're constantly trying to increase your average index and by using higher index bulls on the higher index cows through this new scheme that you'll be moving the whole trend in the right direction okay thanks very much Niall we're going to move on I suppose to the, to the, the male and the male output from the suckler cow uh, and Darren has moved into Waylands into the ring here we sent Darren off with a checkbook two months ago at this stage Darren just before Tullamore show and we sent him off for four animals and he came back with two um, and there was no change left either, Darren. But you know, there. Jack, Wayne's were expensive as well. So oh, they are. Right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> transport is getting dear too. <laughs> Darren, talk to us. There's, there's two Wayne's after coming in here, a red one and a, and a, a Shirley. Um, talk yeah. to us about the differences between we them. We bought two Wayne's, as you said, for Tullamore Show for, say, two messages for, say, Tullamore Show to talk about, I suppose, management pre weaning and then sort of management post weaning. And we have the same thing here today. This good uh, limousine here was 300 kilos today we bought them. Anyone want to gauge what he cost? I'll turn them around now first and you can have it. 300 kilos two months ago, 8th of July. As Darren said, the trade was on fire down, I suppose. Especially that day you were in the marathon, anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the export was there. What do you think? How would you pay for them? 880. We'll send Sean next year, Darren. We'll send Sean. The, the day he was in, there was five export type calves together, and four of them were a thousand. He was a thousand twenty five. That was the price from on the day. Uh, Only for Sean of being against the gate, there he default down. I suppose there has been limited export trade, and it's really for that sort of high, uh, the, the sort of upper end of the calves in the market. We'll bring in Joe in a minute to talk, I suppose, about exports and where it's going. Or, sort of price has been given but that type of an animal is still commanding a price and I suppose even though prices have come back that 20 to 30 cent through March since, then, you know, like, since then yeah. yeah like if you have a nice limousine a nice Charlie Wheeling in the rest of Ireland you're still selling somewhere between 270 and 290 a kilo for that sort of 300 kilos the lighter animals price per kilo are selling a lot better this fella here was two, uh, 60 kilos 820 uh, now this and I suppose it shows the two difference. Months ago. Two months ago, it shows the difference between I suppose having some meal fed before weaning and some meal fed after. This this calf here is ten months old. This calf is seven months old. Uh, at the time, this fellow was on a bit of meal beforehand, and I suppose he really hit the ground running. And in, in the last three weeks, in particular, he's really started to try. Whereas this fellow is really only starting to come into his own. It took him a long time, bit of a shock after weaning, wasn't getting any meal. Uh, took him. 
few weeks to get into me, you know, he still has put on 40 kilos since we bought him, this fella's put on 50 kilos, but he, he hasn't sort of done as good as the other fella. Uh, what they've been getting, this fella's been getting about 3 to 4 kilos a meal, as you can see, or as I said, this, feeding this fella a bit heavier, there's no harm in doing it, because he's going to push out muscle, so he is every, every kilo that he's putting on is, is a higher value kilo. Uh, ideally sort of two kilos in good quality grass is what you'd be aiming for but if grass quality is poor you could go up to three even three and a half kilos that fella this fella though opposite one to two kilos would suffice if you went up to three kilos this fella probably what you'll get is you'll get a lot of fat sort of around the tail head and as with any farmer that's wanting to buy say for a steer system or buy wean and it's just for sort of storing over the winter they don't want that type of an animal they're paying for weight that's probably going to melt off them in a few weeks after what the plan is for these now, uh, if anyone gives me a thousand twenty-five tomorrow evening, they can bring the red fella home. Uh, but I suppose we asked a question the other day and we asked for a show of hands, what would people do with them? Whether you do them bull beef, whether you do them steer beef, and it was about a 50-50 split. 50% of the farmers said there's definitely an animal like this. Ideally, if you had them a small bit heavier, if he was around the 400 kilo mark, you'd be ideal for that under 16 month bull beef finish. He's definitely got a grade of U plus anyway when he'd be hanging as a young bull. Won't say go into a huge, huge carcass weight, but the bonuses that you're going to get and the grade and the bonuses that you get to 12 cent quality showings bonus will pay for him and it will bring him on. Letting him out, putting him into a sort of 22 month bull beef system, probably might be gone, you probably might run into a weight issues. This fella probably wouldn't suit either bull system, probably more of a sort of steer system. There is a dairy breeding in his background, he's out of a CF52 bull, but he, he's light on the shoulder, so it's still a good calf, but has that sort of easy flesh and sort of tendencies, he's probably a 24, 26 month system. What you could do with that calf, I suppose, is keep him going on the sort of kilo a meal of good grass until housing, then over the winter, good quality side is your kilos, two kilos a meal, keep him going 0 0.6, 0 0.7 of a kilo and get him out early next year and get him driving and he'll do a good try for us. This fella, if you are going to go down a 16 month bull beef system, you really need to keep him moving. There's no room for a store period and you really need to keep him on target. If you are going to go a steer system, he'd be equally good. I suppose we're going to bring in a bullock in a few minutes. It's, uh, he has the potential somewhere along the line if he was kept into age to, to, to sort of bring down, the, bring down a heavy carcass. Or maybe you could try the try the sail again and try for live exports. We had a few live exporters called to the ring in the last two days. What they're saying is that he's ideal for the Italian market. He's also ideal for the say North African markets. And maybe on that point, Jack, he will probably bring in Joe and maybe he'll explain a bit on what the prices are for them type of cats. Joe, I mean the export market. I mean, would Darren make money uh, buying 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 red cats for export here? Like, would he or would he? Um I would he break us? Um, I suppose a bit about the trade, Joe, in terms of export. The like type of, this, this type of animal going for export is it a is it a runner this year or where where's the trade been? Yeah, no bother. I, I was just thinking, all right, when you were uh, giving Darren a little bit of a, a yeah. dig there, all right. I'd heard of Jack and the Beanstalk, but never Darren and the Beanstalk. <laughs> <laughs> but I know he's a safe he's a safe man to 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 send out, all right. He he got good quality that was reflective of what we wanted to show, yeah. and certainly that limousine bull there, it would be ideal. Um, for the type of calf that an exporter would be buying. Right. I suppose the thing is that the export customers aren't just as active this year, mainly as an impact of the fact that Wienlands are a bit dearer. Uh, Irish farmers are have gotten higher prices for their stock. Cattle prices have improved 9 or 10% this year, Jack. Obviously last year was a low base, all right. Cattle prices were, were lower. Um, we've gotten better prices now. That has fed all the way down through the, the, the cattle in the marts from forward stores all the way down through Wienlands and even calves have been more expensive here. As a result of that, where normally Ireland last year would have exported 240,000 cattle live, uh, so far that this year is down by 25%, and the Wienland trade especially has been a lot slower. That type of animal would normally be bought for export to Italy, and there's still a good few cattle going to Italy. It had been a lot slower earlier on in the year. It has started to pick up in the last few weeks. Um, there was 700 Wienlands went out live to Italy last week, which, you know, that was improved a lot on where it was earlier on in the year anyway. It's mainly an impact really that um, in fact, there's been a case of blue tongue over in France, and that has actually slowed down their level of exporting down to Italy. 
So hopefully our exporters will be in a position to send a few more stock there over the coming months. So See, that's Joe, typical of the 700 per week. How does that relate to uh, maybe last year or the year before? Like uh, a, way, way lower. Like, way, way lower. Know, in recent years, it yeah. has dropped down. Like it, you know, Previously, there would have been 17,000 cattle a year going to Italy. At yeah. this time of the year, there might have often been 2,000 cattle going a week. Per week, um, yeah. So 700 is yeah. still a very low level. So high for this year, but still well below where, yeah. where we've been yeah. in the past. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, like, and that's a light wheel and now he's only 350 kilos, yeah. you, you know, we, you, we would typically be sending slightly heavier wind than, than that 400 kilo bulls, 420 kilo bulls with good muscle like that. A limousine bull would be ideal, similarly as well to Belgian blues would be maybe the more typical animal because they're something that's a bit different to what they can buy in France. France would have the majority of the market, they'd be the main exporter of Wienlands into the Italian market. Other markets as well too that Wienlands would be exported to Jack would be Tunisia and Morocco. Yeah. Although numbers would be a bit smaller, they're great markets as well and you can see exporters buying Wienlands like that for three euros a kilo or, there, or thereabouts. That type of fancy Wienland. Ah, uh, very nice ones there like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and you know, temporarily France looks to be a bit uh, restricted in what they're going to be able to export and it should represent an opportunity for us maybe in the short term anyway for the next <coughs> month or, or okay. two months maybe so so th that's their market there's four close animals closer to finish coming into the into the ring obviously two first in or two from the from the dairy herd and then there's two from the supper herd from the beef herd joe what's, what's the objective what's the message here yeah uh taking it on a stage further obviously we're looking at the weanlands there and talking about the live export of weanlands and darren touched as well too and but irish farmer buyers as well too are looking at and are buying weanlands with the objective of finishing them as bulls or finishing them as bullocks these are four steers here in the in the, in the ring um there's two of them there two charlotte bullocks Really, really good cattle altogether. They're on a uh, feeding trial inside an ICBF in Tully um, in Kildare. And those cattle are, this orange bullock here in front of me is 23 months of age. The white Charlie bullock there over in the corner, he's 21 months of age. Um, and the two dairy bred animals, then the Frisian bullock and the black whitehead bullock, they're two cattle that are around 18 months. They're, they're uh, spring 2014 <coughs> born cattle. So they're, they're a good bit younger. Months. We're not comparing like with like. No, 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 like, no. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, the genetics are a lot different and they're a bit younger as well, too. Um, but I suppose the first thing that we're going to touch on is a little bit around carcass weights and requirements as well, too, for the customers that are buying Irish beef nowadays. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to be looking at a few sheep later on, and, and some of our colleagues are, are going to be talking about that. Um, it's something that they've been familiar with in the sheep world for a good few years, Jack, that they have weight limits. Yeah. They can only get away with selling a lamb carcass up to 21 and a half or 22 kilos. Well, that's all they get paid that's, for anyway. That's what all they get paid for. Um, similarly, <laughs> they were on the like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> true, true, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and we can debate about free lamb being given away, but <laughs> correct. Yeah. In the beef world, we have been in the situation, obviously, for going back for many, many years, that uh, you have, it, from time to time, much heavier carcasses. And that has been acceptable as well too. Going, you know, year year on year, uh, it tends to tends to to be a factor. Um, you know, that a certain amount of your bullocks or your young bulls are going to be of a heavier carcass weight. However, it's more and more becoming a feature of the market um, that there's a resistance there for animals over and above a particular carcass weight. And um, you know that really kicks in. It, it, I suppose it's open for debate. It depends on the customers, but it kicks yeah. in if you go much over 400 kilos carcass weight. It, uh, it it tends to be that's the upper limit 400 kilo carcass weight Appro approximately it depends on the market but yeah, for yeah. much heavier carcasses there are more limited outlets okay. and i'm going to go into a little bit of detail as to why that's the case and and uh Phelan O'Neill, uh, the Farmers Journal and Market Specialist as well too, has some practical examples as to what that means in terms of meat cuts and uh, specifications okay. and things like that. But okay. looking at the two Charlie Bullocks, obviously the, there's no weight limits or weight weight limits aren't going to be an issue for the for the two smaller cattle out of the dairy herd. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what weight that orange Charlie Bullock is there, guys? He's heavier now than what you think. Add on a bit um, because he's a really really well finished bullock. He's a thick bullock real deep body on them as well too and he's well finished he's on a feeding trial now for the last 90 days so he's going to be weighing well anyone hazard a guess now as to what weight he is no he's not quite 900 but he's not that far off it 850 yeah exactly he's 850 kilos so very very heavy bullock all right and you know heavier than what he looks because of the flesh that he's covering that he's carrying and the thickness of the body as well too the white bullock on the other hand then while he's a similar frame size he's not as well finished yet he'll probably be fed on for another short while 
um, he's just 700 kilos. Um, and the, obviously there's a big gap there, there's 150 kilos between those two cattle. But if they were to be slaughtered, the yellow bullock is going to be killing out at nearly 470 kilos carcass weight. The white bullock, on the other hand, he's not going to be a U-grade bullock. He'll probably be an R-plus bullock if he was killed there at the moment. And he'd have a carcass weight more like 390 kilos. So there's a big difference. Is, you know, 80 kilos of carcass in the difference as well, too, between the two cattle. And the, I suppose the key thing about the big carcass when it's slaughtered, the big difference is going to be around the loin cuts, Jack. Uh, around the strip loin and around the rib eye. The strip loin is along here, along the back of the animal. Uh, the rib as well too is slightly in front of that. So they're hind quarter cuts, they're high value cuts, they're steak cuts. That's where a lot of the value is in the carcass, um, in those cuts. The key thing about that big um, orange Charlotte bullock is that because he's a heavy carcass, he's a big bullock, he's going to have very big loin cuts. Uh, that carcass weight animal is going to have strip loins that are 10 kilos weight each and they're going to have a very big eye in them. It's going to result in big steaks and big yep. portion sizes. Yep. And a lot of our customers wouldn't really accept that or would have a preference towards something more typical of what we're going to be taking off, say, a 390 kilo carcass. So, uh, so Joe, 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 you've built up this Charlie Bullock to be the best Bullock in the ring, and all of a sudden now you've oh. put the legs from under him and said he's not <laughs> suitable for the market. Like, um, Well, that's the thing. There's none of us that wouldn't love to have that Bullock at home yeah. in our yard at the moment. Yeah. When he'd be killed, he'd come into a big check, he'd grade yeah. well. Uh, but there is resistance there on the part of many of our customers. Um, you know, the, okay. the, many of the retailers in particular. Yeah. Some of it comes down to, you know, supermarket specifications okay. and portion size, Jack. So it, it leaves in Phelan. I mean, you, you have a, you know, in terms of that big bullock, what a, a cut will look like, like from him. And you, you, I just talk a bit about that, like we'll say, in, in terms of maybe the supermarket, what, what, is, what is the demand? In practical terms, what the, this big prize uh, bullock here means in the marketplace, and, you know, it feels a bit of a fraud to be critical of an animal like that from beef perspective but the reality is when that animal there is slaughtered and is cut out and boned up it produces a steak here for something like this this here was taken of a similar type animal uh, similar weight similar grade and you can see if, uh, with your eye it's a smashing big sirloin steak the sort of thing that would land it out in any other place would be delighted to get it uh, the trouble with that steak is that it doesn't meet more modern sort of retail and food service restaurant type requirements it's simply too big uh, too expensive for portion size and too expensive for the retail pack where I suppose supermarkets are looking to get consumers in and wanting to give them at least the impression of good value for money. Uh, now it hasn't always been that way and that we have to recognise that the trend is taking place and we touched on earlier there about lambs which would have always went into a commercial marketplace. For many years, like if we're talking 20, 25 years ago, the, the meat industry, the meat in, in this country, it was very much a case of producing for intervention, for producing for aid to private storage. EU supported exports to all over the world. And in that sort of an environment, you couldn't breed cattle big enough, heavy enough, uh, or age, didn't matter. And it was a case of getting the most kilos of meat off a carcass full stop. Uh, over the last 10 years in particular, as we've moved out of that, that, that support's available no more, we're moving into commercial markets where we really have to give the consumer exactly what they want, and that's through the retailers. So, uh, whilst this steak here is an absolute prized piece of meat from our point of view, the reality is what the supermarket want is something on the smaller size. And uh, for assistant here, could it be could it go? Yeah, this is that focus. Yeah, yeah. If we can look at this here now, you can see immediately here in this pack, the most obvious difference is instead of one in the pack, we've got two. And, uh, same weight, so you can the same, weight, the same, same weight. amount of steak, but that comes off an animal uh, around 380, 390 kilos slaughtered, similar to the white or Charlie in the ring here. So commercially, this is what the market is driving us towards at the minute. This is what we have to produce. Now, the uh, the other thing that's interesting, the last single steak that I had in a pack, the retail value on it was 10 euro 49 cents uh, for the pack for the single steak. Uh, this pack here with two steaks in it. The retail value is 10 euro 25 cent it's actually a few cent less and you're filling two places with it this is where the commercial market is taking us hope this is what we have to to produce for now i don't want to say that there will never be a market for a big high quality beef animal like this there will be but it'll be limited opportunities and in future i think we're best to think of that high, heavy beef market in the same way as we probably think about angus or hereford at the moment jack we talk about there where you're in part of a scheme, you're booked in ahead, it's produced to a very strict plan, factory and farmer know exactly what's coming at what time. 
And if you think in that way, there's a place for the heavier animals, but it's not going to be a sort of a, a, a free a mainstream market yeah. that we've known in the past. Right. It's more niche, is what you're saying, in the future for that, for that very, animal. Very much yeah. so, yes. Yeah. And so the two steak piece is more r relative to the white the white Charlie here, Joel. Like, I mean, you're confident of that as well, that they, you know that. And, and we'll come on now just to, I begin to be very quick to say when we come into the what, what looked like the planer cattle here, yeah. we will see this taken a stage further. Stage further. Right, Joel, take us through the, uh, the two dairy bred animals. We talked a lot about the Charlottes, or the two, the two cattle from the Sumter herd. The two dairy bred animals here, how do they relate to the whole beef thing and again the market, the market requirements? Um, yeah. We're gone, we're gone. Sorry, Jack. Uh, yeah, obviously the, the challenge for finishing the dairy bred animals is going to be to efficiently get them into a good enough carcass, get them into a good enough quality carcass with good finish. Um, weight limits are go aren't going to be an issue. Um, looking at the Frisian bullock there, he's 450 kilos there at the moment. He's a year and a half old. He's very typical of a lot of the dairy bred uh, Frisian animals that we have around the country. Um, you'd hope that you know if a good job is done on him now, if he's put into the shed, he'll be probably kept out and grazed for another six weeks, put into the shed then and fed on until next February. So he'd be slaughtered around 22, 23 months, Jack. Yep. He should hopefully be an O equals in confirmation then at that stage. Right. You know, he's not very you know well rounded, no. but he's not going to be a pea grade eater at the same time. Yeah. And the fact that he's going to be slaughtered young, he's not going to grow on and go real leggy in himself either. If he's pushed on fairly well, you'd be confident that you would get him into an O equals and that carcass weight wise he should hopefully be up around 310 320 kilos carcass weight at that stage or about 600 610 kilos light okay. weight so he's at the lower end of the spectrum the 300 400 spectrum he's at the lower end of it but that's that's not an issue he is jack but yeah. like you know you put that bullock down on the grid and assuming that he is at O equals he's not back that much from the base price on the grid yeah. you know he's minus 18 cent and if you get a plus 12 then for his inspect quality assurance bonus you're back still close enough to the overall base price on the QPS you're not doing too bad you know for, for that type of a bullock and similarly again then the next stage up obviously is going to be the Hereford animal um, obviously out of a dairy background as well too and the key thing as well too to emphasize is we do have an increasing population of beef cattle in the country uh, we have the fact that our live exports are down by going to be down by about 50 60 thousand for the year jack the other factor as well too is that the national herd has been growing we've have had nearly 120,000 extra calves born in the country as well too this year so we've more and more of these animals coming through especially the angus and hereford animals there's 70,000 more of them born so far this year in comparison to last year so that's up by 20 percent and many of them are exactly like this they're out of a dairy background they're out of an angus and hereford bull and then out of a, a, a dairy cow obviously and uh, they're relatively good beef animals as you said, Jack, they're never going to run into the trouble of having heavy carcass weights. The challenge is going to be, I suppose, to get them into a reasonably good carcass weight. You'd hope that, again, that animal is slightly heavier than the Frisian, even though he's a ticker set bullock. He's uh, 470 kilos now at the moment. And um, if he's on a similar regime, then put him into the shed for about 100 days of feeding over the winter, kill him in the middle of February, hopefully. And again, he'll be around the 300 kilos carcass weight, somewhere between 300, 320 kilos. Okay. He won't quite make an R in his confirmation, Jack. He's a bit weak in the in the in the shoulder. He's a nice enough little end on him. He's about an O. He'll make an O plus in confirmation. So he won't be a huge carcass. The advantage of him is that he's going to be eligible for the likes of the Hereford Prime Scheme. Or if he was an Angus animal, he'd be eligible for the Angus bonus. Okay. Two questions. Would Joe yeah. Farmer come up and ask me if, if there's seventy thousand more um, of the uh, Angus type or Hereford type bred animals? Will the premiums go down? That's for you. And Salem, the other farmer came up and he said to me, "Have you got? A, have you not got a knife? And you could cut the other steak in two, and you'll have the same amount. You 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 talked about the same amount of weight. So hold that question. You can answer that question. Joe, the, the Angus uh, premium and the, pre yeah, the uh, we, premium. We would be confident that at that end of the market, Jack, that there is scope for that to grow further. Like that's a twenty percent increase in one year. But we'd be very confident that there's enough demand in the market. Currently, the the bottleneck, I suppose, had been that there wasn't even enough of supply of Angus and Hereford cattle in order to meet okay. the current demand. There are more customers that up until now they haven't been buying it, but if we have the supply of it, and we will have from now on, we'll be able to grow the grow the, the schemes and continue to see those bonuses being paid. Okay. Very, 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 very good question. Uh, and the answer is yes, you could, but if you did, the reality of life is you would seriously devalue it in the terms of pence per kilo, that you would lose whatever you would gain uh, by, by doing that process. 
uh, there's an expectation when people buy a, a strip loin steak that you get a muscle that's shaped pretty much like this here. Now, going smaller isn't a problem, and that's where these planar type cattle that aren't displeased, certainly from beef producers eye or beef farmers eye, aren't displeasing on the eye. But the reality is, if you take a wander down any supermarket shelf, you'll see packs of maybe, not just two like this here, you'll see packs of three and indeed packs of four, which are very much smaller steaks that are cut from those planar animals, smaller eye muscles. So the, the straight answer to the question is, but if you cut it, you devalue it in terms of pence per kilo and you lose out. Okay, happy enough. Just, yeah, no, no, not happy. Come over to the corner here, Joe. Come over to your left, sorry, over to your left. Oh, with the microphone, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good question, Jack. It was in relation to carcass weights that, you know, if you kill that animal young, push him yep. on and kill him at, we'll say, 22 months, and he's yep. only 300 kilos carcass weight, yep. he's not coming into a good enough check and a good enough return. We'd be better off keeping tipping off. Things on the input, of course, that went into yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah. The suggestion is maybe you could keep him tipping over for the winter, not, uh, you yep. know, put the put the high level of meal into him, right. turn him back out to grass, okay. and put him into a slightly heavier carcass okay. weight, we'll say the following June or yep. July. Yep. And definitely you could do that, especially maybe for the lighter okay. animal, maybe going into the shed, if he's not just quite well enough developed in order to push him on and put the investment into him to finish him and put the cost behind him, um, that'd be one of the systems, all right, that go back, you know, grass based system again for a second or for a third grazing season and kill him maybe at 27 or 8 months in the month of Ju June or July and get him into maybe possibly possibly 3 40 kilos carcass weight especially maybe um, you have the land base I suppose to yeah. do that like you know because you have another crop coming on obviously like so yeah it is one of the challenges already Jack for the animals with an Angus or a Hereford background they're not going to have as big of a frame in yeah. order to carry carcass weight but the thing is you're going to get them done you know, at a younger age, you're yeah. going to get flesh on them maybe with less meal yeah. in comparison to even the, the pure dairy bred animal or the continental animal. So there's advantages as well as maybe slightly lower output per animal, but you, you could uh, you could carry a slightly heavy, heavier stock and rate because they're smaller. Right. Them, you're and, to get in, yeah, yeah, yeah. As, and I suppose at the end of the day they are planar stocks, so they, they start off at a, at a lower value in life uh, as well. They're uh, looking stocks now, like yeah, yeah. They might, they might make leave uh, absolutely the farmer, farmer, like must, yeah, must, yeah. must respect the dairy industry by all means, Jack. Uh, the uh, the uh, more lose the truth on it. Just the, the other point, we talked a bit about the loins there and the value of the loin and the relatively small percentage of the carcass that it is, but the amount of value that it delivers. Um, we, sh we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that over half the carcass now goes into a mince or a ground beef product or burger meat. Is that a big change? You know, that half of the animal goes that's to that? A, that's the evolution. Again, if we go back, um, and, and I suppose I'm unfortunately got to an age now when I can go back rather a, a long distance. Uh, if we go back to when I would have started working in the industry in the mid-1980s, uh, at that point in time there was just about 30% of the carcass would have went into a mince product. Then you would have had pot roasts and you would have had stews and you would have had various casseroles and, yeah. and, and briskets and, and all sorts of slow cooked meat. That has changed as lifestyles have changed in the in the past generation. So with that amount of, of product now going into a manufactured beef market as we call it, uh, that can come whether it's from the planar Frisian or the best uh, Charlie, it all goes in at the same value. Now of course the planar Frisian does give you the same amount of meat yield uh, as your as your top quality Charlie will, but just to be aware that the market for that product uh, is, is very valuable and not to, not to be overlooked. Yeah. Do, do, Justin McCarthy, do you mind if I just give the microphone to Justin, just in terms of, I mean, it's a sea change, Justin, for uh, the, 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 the market spec, we'll say, and, and the type of animal. You know, there's a lot of suckler farmers, and they're around this ring probably as well, that would love to see this orange Charlie Bullock, you know, in the field, we'll say. The, lad, the two lads here have built him up to be this super Bullock, and all of a sudden they're saying the market doesn't require, like, I mean, can farmers change, or how long does it take to get that change on farm? But, but Jack, I think the important point to point out here is, the problem is somebody fell in love with him because he kept him too long. Uh, Three months that, of age. Yeah, but that yeah. bullock, that bullock was ready for slaughter. That could have bullock could have been slaughtered given his growth rates. He's a phenomenally bred animal. Yep. But given his growth rates, that bullock could have been gone in 16 to 18 months. Okay. With one winter. Okay. And what the problem is, we're in a system and we're dictating the animals to the system rather than matching the animal and yeah. saying that animal, 
he's growing at a rate he can reach that three yeah. to four hundred kilo like that animal at one stage in his life was an ideal animal right. brilliant he had the growth rate he had the confirmation he's just been kept too long so, I mean, so it's, it's not all about yeah. one or the other yeah uh, i think it's about a farmer standing around this ring taking the messages out that suit his system but so the am message I, is am, am i hearing justin if you have that type of an animal that you you, you need to go for the look for the finish of the you know the fast finish in 16 month bull beef or, the, or well, not even 16 months you go across and a lot of yeah. farmers around this ring will, will think it's impossible but yeah. at the end of the day you, you can go to places in scotland that 20 20 miles across the water and yeah. they're finishing those of steers in 18 months okay 20 months doesn't, okay. Have, to doesn't have to be a bull now you're you're right though jack and the 16 month bull and a suckler to beef system the 16 month bull would be what i'd recommend for that animal but in the case of a guy buying Winlands and going to beef, he has no grass in that system then, so it's very difficult for him to exploit his main advantage. But that animal could exploit it because he could go out, spot as a wing and go out to grass, but be killed off and maybe brought in the month of August, given two months mean to, to fatten up. But he doesn't have to be kept to 23 and four months just because we used to have an old premium system that used to dictate that. Okay. The final word on Jack Lidge, you get on the sheep, and, and again, coming from the dairy industry, you appreciate it, you referred to sheep earlier on, both of those commodities are yeah. specification based very much in terms of determining their market value, right. and the beef industry is simply travelling the same road, that, that is the reality. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, that leads us nicely into, I suppose, our next part of the demo, and we're obviously changing to the woodies, we're changing to the sheep stock. Um, Darren Carthy, you've, you've um, I, I presume... You, the money that you left over from buying the two, they bought the two sheep. Two bins already, bought Jack. The two sheep, like yeah, fair play to you. Like, um, so Darren, you have six lambs here. You have six commercial lambs here. Yeah. Three, three lowland and three, three, three hill lambs. Talk. Yeah, I suppose, Jack. What, what we decided to do in this, we'll be talking about the lambs and say finishing and specifications at the minute. But in the last few years, there has been a big increase in, I suppose, interest in store lambs, and we've seen it. Uh, at an earlier stage this year and really where it's coming from the lads talked about a tightness and supplies is there has been a lot more beef farmers and a lot of new customers in the market for store lambs and it's trying to develop or it's trying to give a few bits of advice and sort of what is the type of system or how what way do you go at the minute there's a very very small differential between your store lamb price and your finished lamb price this lamb here the it is the biggest of the lowland lambs. He's 44 kilos. That's the level of the blue spot. The blue, blue spot on his blue head. Blue the back of his head. Yeah. And he's probably selling today anywhere from 87 to 92 euros in the market. Uh, you bring 87 home, to 92 euros. 44 kilos. Euros. For yeah. five, six euros cost on him, transport. Uh, it's going to cost you your 50 to buy him, your to kill him again, yeah. or two euros to sell him. So you, you run into five, six, seven euros very quick. He's a short keep before lamb. You, uh, any before before you, you yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a short keep lamb. What he does do is, he's 44 kilos, he's, he's lacking flesh, but he has a frame. He's put on nice grass, and I suppose farmers this, this time of the year have grass for five, six weeks. They want to get it grazed off, yeah. move lambs again. He's your ideal man, but yeah. you need to be give, getting them into. 21, 22 kilo carcass to have any money back out of him. So, so Darren, if he's sending 100 euros purchase price, like, I mean, you... If you get him into, say, take today's price, yeah. 475 a kilo, 22 kilos, he's coming in around uh, sort of 103 to 105 euros. That's yeah. what you want to be hitting, so it is. Yeah. Uh, the markers in previous years, it has increased, but it has increased after Christmas. And that's where you're more or less coming into the other two lands. This fella could be gone before Christmas, could be gone after. He's a... He's a sort of shorter keep store. He's, he's a purple, uh, purple on the shoulders here now. Purple on the shoulders. He's 40 kilos. He's costing anywhere, I suppose, at the moment from sort of two euros a kilo, 220, anywhere, I suppose, from 80 to 86 euros a head. Uh, he's an ideal lamb in that he's tied with lamb. He can go sort of, he'll probably finish off.
Hello, everybody. Oops. Oh. <laughs> big hair. Did you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal, Irish Country Magazine, and Irish Country Living Stand. We're absolutely delighted to have you all here and to have a, such a, a fine, fine crowd. We have a huge amount going on, as you see, uh, all around on the stand. The lads are at live demonstrations out here all day. And we have 50,000 high-vis vests going out over the few days. Now, as Mairead said yesterday, they must all be in bottom drawers and around the place because we've been giving them out for so many years and everybody should have them at this point. So, you know, we can't stress enough being safe on the farm and being seen. And remember that it's, we all understand farm safety, but remember that it's your farm is the dangerous one. Um, you can get your Irish Country magazine. The new issue is out and you can get it for a special price of two euro. Take home a bucket load for your friends, they'll be delighted. You can also get your nails done and the lads, you can go in and fit on some hats. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, now, we also have what's called bin your bills, okay? And this is a lovely, lovely prize. If you download the Farmer's Journal app, you'll get a bonus point for it. And bin your bin bills means having the use of a John Deere tractor for a year, having a Land Rover for a year, uh, having your grocery bill paid for the year. How nice would that be, ladies? And your tax sorted. So do download the app. And we have to mention the Women in Ag Conference. I know that all your faces will be seen there. It's an absolutely great event every year. We're back in trim. The price is the same, 50 euro. And do, do look at that, and it'll all be in Irish Country Living this week. And now I come to the reason why I'm here, and that is to introduce the best chef in Ireland <laughs> who is cooking here for us for the eighth year. And I know there are a lot of families and women that have come in here to see Nevin for the eighth time. And every <laughs> year we learn from him <laughs> and we learn, you know, particularly, I think I particularly love, and I'm sure you do too, his very strong family value, his ties to his mum, and just how he's handing down the wonderful crafts he learned from her through the generations. Um, I think that is one of the most special things that he does and of course he's an advocate for our Irish food for everything we produce he's working on our behalf all of the time and taking up all the Irish products he'll be telling you all about them and and promoting what we do and that is why we love him so much now he has lots of beautiful books how many books have you produced at 12, this 12, and 12 books yeah. can you imagine that <laughs> as well as doing everything else between television and so on his wonderful MacNean restaurant you you've got to go there and um, it definitely is the best restaurant in the world so to the books we have three books um, he has three books here he launched healthy eating the other night and we can see he's got rather trim <laughs> since he was here last year and i'm hoping to delve into that book and hopefully the rather same will trim. happen yeah he claims and i'm saying claims with tongue and cheek that he was running with sonia o'sullivan the other night she launched the book uh, for him but she did uh, compliment him saying that she has tried the recipes and that they do work and you know how important that is for us to open a recipe book in a hurry, trying to make a nice meal and to have the blooming thing turn out like, you know, swimming in the end or whatever. So, but no, these do work, so do take that home. And his nation's favorite fast food is here as well. And here's a grand one for Christmas presents, quickie, uh, cooking for the baby and the toddler. And of course, he has plenty of experience with the twins <laughs> for doing that. It's a great one for christening presents, and, and, and for Christmas presents, so take those home with you. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nevin, who has been with us for eight years. Wow, thank you Away so you much, go. Catherine. Thank you, lovely to see you again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Are we all good? I can't hear you, are we all good? Yeah, yeah that's more like it, Catherine. Thank you so much uh, for that lovely uh, introduction. God, I'm gonna get a big head. Uh, listen, eight years, I thought it was nine, Marie thought it was six, and so it's eight years, it's official. Uh, I love this. Sh I love the show, and uh, we do three demos every day. So three tomorrow. This is our last one today. We start at eleven, and then another one at one, and then another one at three. And we are doing three different recipes for you that we've done for the last one. We rotate. Now, have you got your recipes, Kira? I want to thank you. 
Kira the Legend from the journal has uh, organized all these lovely recipes for you in this booklet. So please don't go home, we have lots here. Take extra for your family and friends. They are free. And we also are going to give you a little raffle ticket if you stay. And you can be lucky and maybe win the food. Would you like that? Would you like to win some food I cook? Come on, of course you would. And also my cookbook. You can win a cookbook too. Right, guys, we've had a great day. I'm absolutely loving this this year. Thank God the weather is holding up. We had a bit of a shower earlier on. But overall, it's pretty good. I notice now because people get up early in the morning at my demos, they start to yawn a little bit because they're tired. And that happens. You get a mid-afternoon kind of slump. So I hope you won't go to sleep with me. I'll keep, you, I'll keep you hopefully invigorated and uh, happy and hopefully that your uh, tongue will be hanging out. Guys, we're going to do three recipes for you all. We are going to do a lovely sticky toffee pudding with cool swan. Does anyone know cool swan? Yeah. Oh, I love this stuff. It's beautiful. Not because it's made in Cavan, but because it's flavoured with single malt Irish whiskey, good Cavan cream, cocoa, white chocolate, vanilla. We're going to make a lovely cool swan kind of pudding with that. And then we're going to do a satay, chicken skewers with a satay sauce. Has anyone ever made a satay sauce before? Very easy, guys. Really, really easy. And my brother Kenneth here, my oldest brother, who's a wonderful cook, he is, um, yeah, he's the king of satis. Whenever you make satay at home, I'm not even allowed near the pan. I just can chop onions, chop mushrooms, gar or not mushrooms, uh, vegetables and that. So, uh, Ken, I don't know if you've tasted it, mine, if you approve. It's just okay. He says it's pretty rubbish, but I think it's very nice, anyway. And then we're going to do another dish for you. It's a lovely lamb dish. I think we have the best meat in the world our lamb, our beef, whatever. We are so lucky with such great meat. And I'm going to do a lamb dish, everyone, with a nice butter bean, and it's like a tomato sauce, so it is. Is that okay? Does that sound good? Yeah? yeah? Okay. I want to introduce Claire. Claire, come on up and say hello. Come on. Claire's from Cork. It's her first year at the Plowin. Can we give her a big welcome? <laughs> to Claire and Thomas, who is in behind there, from Donegal. They're my right-hand uh, chefs for the last couple of days. So my thanks to them. So where I live, everyone, is a small village in Black Lion, called Cal in Cavan, excuse me. And it's a small little village. There's about 300 people living there. That's where I've lived all my life and I've grown up. And I'm from a family of nine, five boys and four girls. So where I learned to cook was from my mother. And then I started off cooking and then I wanted to, um, really wanted to be a chef. I love eating, as you can see. I love talking about food and I just love the whole subject of food. And what's really excited me since I've started coming to the plowing, or since I've even started um, cooking, is the quality of Irish produce. We have the best food in the world. We're so lucky. Our meat, our dairy, wow, we just really have such amazing produce. And we can never ever take that for granted. So in Black Lion, myself and my wife Amelda, we have 55 people working for us. We opened up our reservation lines, everyone, two weeks ago. For two years. You know how many bookings we took in six days? 2,330 bookings. Unbelievable. So we never take that for granted. Our house was bombed twice during the Troubles. So my parents closed the restaurant from 1973 to 89. I remember cooking for five people, 10 people, 15 people. And then I got a break in television on Open House with Marty Whelan and Mary Kennedy. You're all too young to remember that show. But it was the afternoon show, and that's where I got my break in television. Six years I was on that every single Tuesday, and I loved it. I loved it. And I was down with Marty Whelan this morning. That man cannot cook to save his life, I swear to God. He's just the nicest man, though. And we have great banter, so we had a great time with me and Kenneth, hadn't he, Kenny? Marty, he's just the best. He's a very genuine man. And he's writing his autobiography now, which is coming out in October. So he's there, and then Mary Kennedy, of course, she's an absolute... And she can cook, I can tell you. Okay, guys, I'm going to get on cooking. Sorry if I'm talking too much. We're going to show you how to uh, make our dessert, first of all, if that's okay. First thing we do, and this is for the sticky toffee pudding, is dates. So we get the dates into a saucepan, okay, which is over here. So they're going to go in there. In on top of the dates... I'm going to put in some water, okay? So Claire had the saucepan empty, so that's why it's just coming to the boil. And then what I'm going to put into this, everyone, I'm going to put in some rum. Definitely worth getting a small little quarter bottle of rum, dark rum, not an expensive rum, really good if you put into a custard. It's lovely. And also it's really nice, uh, flavours the date, so it does. So it's really, really good. So I'm going to put a good splash of this in. We're going to bring that to the boil, and then you cook that for about 12 minutes. And after 12 minutes, thank you, Claire, you have something that looks like this. I'll just show you here. Okay, just show you what we have. So they're nice and soft, and they're just softened up, they're stewed. Do you know what's lovely with dates? Forget about the rum, cook it in some water, a little bit of sugar, balsamic vinegar, and you can make a lovely kind of like a, like, like a date jam for cheese. It's really good, really, really nice. So this is our dates here that are soft. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put in quarter of a teaspoon of baking powder, okay, or sorry, bicarbonate of soda rather, 
Okay, so I'm going to put this in and I'm going to hold the saucepan up and I'm going to show you just what happens here. So there's two raisin agents in the puddings, everyone. Yeah, Claire's going to take that away. Thank you kindly. And look at this, everyone. It foams up. Can you all see that? Just in your screens there. And that's a reaction from the bicarbonate of the soda that actually foams it up and it's going to be a really light pudding. It's not a heavy, sticky toffee pudding. I'm going to give this to Claire. She's going to blend it in the food processor over here. Thank you very much. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to start the rest of the recipe, if that's okay, to make the batter. So what are we going to put into it? We're going to put um, butter, brown sugar, okay? It's all measured out, and this is the recipe you have in your booklet. Vanilla. Does anyone buy vanilla pods? Can I tell you a company you can all go online and buy of? They're not Irish, unfortunately, but they are very, very good. I've been buying vanilla from a company called VanillaBazaar.com. Vanilla Bazaar. Do you know how much the vanilla is? 23 cent a pod. For me and for you, there's no difference. I only buy in, in kilos. So you can buy one pod, 10 pods, five pods, and they all come free postage and packaging. And fantastic company. Really, really, really fantastic company. So what we do is we open up the vanilla pods. We scrape out the seeds. So guys, I want you to get something that's quality, but I want you to save money. And in Cavan, we love to save money, as you know. Okay, we scrape out all these lovely seeds. Okay, you're happy with that, everyone? So that's from one vanilla pod. So don't forget that company. They do extracts, they do uh, vanilla skin, which they dry out. Really good company. What do we do with the skin? Don't waste it. Use it, everyone. Put it into some sugar for pavlova, for sponges. Put it into sugar and water, you know, for fresh fruit salad. This is full of flavor, so don't be throwing that out. You can actually make a powder. And how you make a powder, everyone, is putting this in, into an oven, sorry, on a tray with parchment paper, which is silicone paper and put this on for about mm, 40 minutes at 100 degrees. You dry it out and then you grind it in a spice grinder or coffee grinder. It's a powder and it's intense and it's absolutely full of flavor. So we're gonna add in a little bit of extract and I'm just gonna soften this. So this is a little pure vanilla extract. So I love vanilla. Do you know how many vanilla pods we use a day in the restaurant? About 30 to 40 vanilla pods a day, a day. So you imagine that's why the amount of vanilla, I am a big fan of vanilla, so I am. Okay, we're gonna pop this in here we're just going to soften this. So Claire's the butter diced. Well done, Claire. And just to soften it. All right. If you're under a little bit of pressure, just pop it into the microwave for 20 seconds or 10 seconds just to soften this. Now, we're going to soften this up here. We're going to just distribute all these lovely vanilla seeds. And then I'm going to get Claire then to just add in the dates. Okay, Claire. Yeah. Do you want to add in that? So the dates are warm, which will even soften the butter more. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And then we can add in the rest of the ingredients. So the rest of the ingredients, sorry, Claire, self-raisin flour, which is already sieved in here, two eggs, and these are some quality assured eggs that I'm using. Thank you, one more, good woman. And then I'm gonna put in some alcohol. I'm gonna put in some cool swan, which will give lovely, 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 lovely flavor to it. Mary, are you gonna come up and say a few words? Come on up, we'll just get, uh, Jason, can I get a microphone? So this is uh, this wonderful lady here beside me who, uh, came up with the whole creation of Cool Swan. She can tell you a little bit. Will you give her a big welcome? Mary from Cool Swan, the coolest woman here at the Plowin. Now hold the microphone up and sing us a song. Okay. <laughs> Let's bury you that. <laughs> Go on. Tell me when to stop. Use oh, the bottle. No, I'm going to joke Keep here. going, keep going. Mary, keep tell going. me a little bit about, like, how long have you had the company? It's been a roaring success for you. Tell me a little bit about it. Uh, we have the company. It took two and a half years of tasting whiskey and chocolate what? to bring it into fruition, <laughs> yeah. So we had to lock everybody into the room, make sure they didn't leave before we came out with a proper drink. Um, so next time we're doing a brand, we'll put an ad in the newspaper. <laughs> People can apply. Um, we created it out of the idea we're farming in between Navan and Kells there in County Meath. And when I married my husband, my mother was a farmer's daughter. I was brought up in Dublin. And uh, Philip's father turned to me at the wedding table and said, just as well you have a job. So I realized then there wasn't too much money in farming. <laughs> so we decided we better do something, not just with the, the output from the, uh, from the dairy herd, but also Sorry. just from the buildings and the, the land that we sit on. And we tried hundreds of things, hundreds and hundreds of things. And finally, Cool Swan was born back in 2009. And we knew we were on to a winner because we were the first Irish product ever to win the gold medal award at the San Francisco, kind of the Oscars of the really? world of alcohol. When was that? What so year was that? 2009. Okay. And uh, that was totally by accident. They came across the product. We put it out to a few people to taste. And we won it. It wasn't even on release then. And then after that, it just has gone from strength to strength. And it has. 
Yeah. But it's a great product. Very good it's a very natural too. product. It is, yeah. It yeah. all comes from... It's so natural. I give you mm -hmm. a secret. We feed our cows whiskey and chocolate and we milk it straight into the bottle. So, so don't <laughs> tell anyone. You'll know our farm. We have the happiest cows in County Me. They love coming to work. <laughs> but Sometimes Mary, they can't stand up. <laughs> it's a great success. Uh, oh, I know the feeling. It, it's a great success, isn't it? In Russia, England, America. Where else do you export? New Zealand. New Zealand, wow. Um, Denmark, Germany. It's going. We were voted the number one spirit brand in Germany in 2014, last Christmas. Wow. The awards only come up every uh, I didn't Christmas know that. time. Yeah. And in Denmark, it's going very well. So multi award winning. That's what uh, it is. Oh, yeah. No, it would be at this stage. We've just gone live in Alberta, in Canada, Nova Scotia, British Columbia, and then, oh, Hong Kong. We've just gone into Hong Kong. That's amazing. Yeah, you must be so yeah. proud of that. Yeah, and of no, course, guys, if you're going through, sorry to interrupt you, through the airport, you'll see her team there. Doing samples, you get the big one litre bottle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's only and available in the airport or here. At the and where else plow. can you, oh, here at the plough, yeah. and where else can they buy it? If they can't get it at the plough, and where else? Super value. Super value. They've and been I, hugely supportive, haven't they? I would say one thing for super value. I'm not sure there'd be too many companies like us if it really wasn't for them, because they do commit to Irish brands. It's part of their marketing is that they do hold Irish brands, but they're extremely easy for us to work with. We're tiny. They'd be used to dealing with large, large corporates. We must be a pain in the ass. <laughs> we just <laughs> must be. But they're very, very good to us. They treat us very well. And only for them, they've over 200 outlets That's between amazing. their centres and their super wow. values. So I would say to you, if you can do a bit of shopping in super value, do because they really genuinely do support Irish brands and hold on to us. They, they work with us to grow. It's not just... Um, and they don't replace us with other products that look like us. So yeah. that, that's a really that's important brilliant. Well, product. that is important. Yeah. And you, you have a very distinctive brand and a style, but the product, it's what's in the bottle is special. We wish you continued success. Thank you very much. An award-winning, wonderful product, made yes. locally up the road for me in Baileybur, the posh end of Cavan. <laughs> and will we give her a big round of applause? Mary and the whole Thank cool squad. Much, Thanks for coming to say hello. Great to see you. Well done. Well done. We'll get her to sing when she has a bit more in her. Um, okay, guys, we're going to fill these. So what I did when Mary was telling you a little bit of story, I didn't realise she'd won all those awards. I knew she'd uh, won many awards, but that's a phenomenal success. I just bet everything together. A little bit of Cool Swan in there, okay? The, the dates, I just want to show you the mixture, everyone. It's a lovely drop and soft mixture. These are not heavy, sticky toffees, okay? You have two raisin agents, for carbonate of soda and bacon powder. What we're going to do now with these lovely little pudding basins, Dario moulds are smaller than these. They're about two euro each. You shouldn't pay more than that. And uh, most good kitchenware shops will have them. Get these guys. They're wonderful. Brush them with melted butter and flour. That's what's in there, okay? So we're just going to spoon this in. Myself and Claire will do this. And uh, what we're going to do is about half fill them. Don't be tempted to overfill them, guys, because if you do that, they will um, overflow. It's as simple as that. So we're just going to half fill them here. And out of this recipe, we should get 10. 10 of these lovely sticky toffee puddings. Flavour it with cool swan. And then what we're going to serve with this, everyone, is a really delicious salted caramel sauce. Does that sound good? It's a butterscotch sauce with some salt. It's really good. So we're going to get this done. And then what I'm going to start now after this, Claire, I'm going to do my lamb which is a lovely, lovely quick dish uh, that cooks really fast, but also is full of flavor. Now, I want to make sure that we get, yep, yeah, maybe I've been too generous for this time. Because if you overfill them, guys, I'm telling you, they're gonna be, it's going to be all on the tray. So I'll just maybe stretch it out a little bit. We should definitely have enough. Thanks, Claire. It's great when you have teamwork. And you know, this young lady beside me is a very hardworking lady. I know Claire for about five or six years. And when I opened my cookery school last year, I uh, asked her, uh, Claire, would you be interested in the job? And she said, yep, sure would, brilliant. So she came up to the cookery school, and I have to say, the rest is history. She's been absolutely brilliant. Hardworking, loyal, and I could put her into a station or a section and in my kitchen, and she'd run it, run it like any of my chefs, and she's no qualifications to cook. But it's all about passion. It's all about the love. She's got the bug for cooking. She's also fallen in love with my pastry chef, who just left last week, yes, to go to Dubai. So she's kind of heartbroken, and we feel for her. But she's not going to dare follow him. Not yet. <laughs> But uh, Stephen, he's been with me for six years. Thanks, Claire. And he has gone to work for Gordon Ramsay. So he'll come back black and blue at Christmas, I'm sure. But he'll be, I'm only joking, I'm only joking. Yeah. That's a bit, that's wrong. But he's a very talented guy and was with me for six years. So you wish everyone well. When people go on, you open the door for them and you welcome them and say, if you ever want to come back, you never fall out with anyone. That's the most important thing. So good staff are hard to get. Guys, that's our sticky toffees. You may think it looks a bit messy. It's going to rise up. Can you all see that there on the screens? It's soft. 
over here, guys. It's soft into the oven. Claire, we're going to use this oven here. Okay. So 20 minutes. Claire has the timer on. All right. At 180, about 180, 190. 180 should be fine. Are we happy with that, guys? We'll check it after 20 minutes, and it might take another four minutes, but I'll show you what you're looking for. So we are going to move on, and we're going to do our lamb, and we're going to do our um, butter bean. So <clears throat> I might just get the butter bean on first, Claire, if that's okay. Good woman. I'm going to talk to you about the lamb here just for one moment. I'm going to use rapeseed oil. Can I ask how many people in the audience like rapeseed oil or use it? I love it. I think it's great. The one I use is Donegal. It's a local one for me. They make lovely flavored oils with chili, lemon. It's so delicious. But there is one at the show if you want to buy some. Not here, but I think it's in the Enterprise tent. It's a Wicklow rapeseed oil. So why rapeseed oil? It's Irish. It's a healthy oil for your heart, for your cholesterol. I like the flavor of it. Not every chef does. But we're supporting Irish jobs and Irish farmers, and that's really important to me. And it's a really good oil to cook with. You get a higher smoke temperature. And what that means, everyone, it doesn't burn like vegetable or sunflower oil. So guys, for any of you standing, if you want to come in, there's a oh, look at that woman. I've never seen anyone move as fast. Good woman. My God. Okay, guys, can I show you all just how to dice an onion? It's very basic, but it's one question that everyone asks me in the cookery school. How do you chop an onion? So we're going to just get a little bit of red onion in here. Okay. I'm just going to use a big knife, and you go with the point of the knife three quarters to the end of the onion. Now, when you get there, just watch. Using the flat of the knife, watch your fingers. And then, this is the crucial thing. You hold it all together and you dice it. Now, when I started cooking, everyone, I trained in Fermanagh College in Inniskillen. And my first week when I was in college, all I did was chop vegetables. I didn't even cook them. So knife skills, the proper name for what I'm doing here, everyone, is called a brunoise, a small little dice of onion. So you need good knives, and the knives a lot of people have been asking me the last couple of days, they're all from Henkel. Henkel or Swilling. They're the same company, the oldest manufacturers in the world for knives, and uh, they're German. And the only place that I know you'll get them, that I can think, is Arnott's in Dublin, is, is where you get them. They're the best, so they are. Uh, they are expensive, no doubt about it. I'm not going to lie to you and say they're cheap knives. They're not cheap, but they are the best, and they last. There's a lifetime warranty. Garlic, I love garlic. I had a lady asking me today... Um, her husband had a very severe allergy to onion and garlic. So what would I put in instead of this? I put in smoked bacon. So I put in smoked bacon into the pan with some chili, with some tomatoes, just to get some nice flavor in there. So I have to be honest with you, my oldest brother, Kenneth, he used to not like garlic at all. When my mother was cooking in the, in, in the kitchen, she'd be cooking off onion and garlic for pate. And he used to come down and say, what's that awful smell? Thank you, Claire. And now he loves garlic. So it's very addictive. We're going to heat the pan, which we've done. Bring over the pan, or excuse me, bring over the onions. Garlic goes in there. Watch the fingers. Scrape that all out. I'm just going to wash my hands after handling onion. And then what we're going to do, everyone, we're just going to let this cook for a moment or two. We don't want to color it, okay? Now, put the bacon in. If you want to put bacon into this, it works really well. Trust me. We're going to use tomatoes, a can of tomatoes, plump tomatoes. You can use chopped tomatoes. I prefer the plum tomatoes. Okay, that's going to go in here. All right. Thank you. We're going to use chili, and we've got to be careful with the chili now, okay? Just a little bit. So just a tiny little bit of chili is going to go in here. When it's dried like I'm using here, that's all I'm going to put in. It's much hotter. The seeds are in it, so just be aware of that. You can make your own chili oil, everyone, by just getting some uh, chili, fresh chilies, rapeseed oil, garlic and ginger, and lemongrass, and you have a wonderful aromatic oil. You put it into a pan, and you simmer it, don't boil it, and for about maybe 15, 20 minutes, and it's gorgeous, it really is lovely. So I'm just gonna mash this down with the spoon, and then what I'm gonna do, clear a little bit of sage, a little touch of vinegar. I'm using red wine vinegar, but if you haven't got it, white wine vinegar is perfect, just a splash. That's all. You know, and if you, when you taste this, and you think it's a wee bit sharp, with the tomatoes, thanks Claire. You just simply put a pinch, a pinch of sugar. Now everyone, I'm gonna put in some sage. Sage is a herb that I, that I don't use an awful lot. The only time I really use it, what, is at Christmas, or with roast pork, you know, for a nice stuffing with a turkey or chicken, it's beautiful. So I'm just gonna cut this here. So you can get a bronze sage, and this is just your regular common sage. So it's quite a different herb to serve with lamb. 
even though we have the lamb marinated in some rapeseed oil, which I'm going to cook now, so I am. So, do we have any stock? We do, Claire. Yeah, lovely. I'm going to put in a tiny little bit of stock. Claire, will you do that for me? So, just a tiny little bit. And I'm using a stock cube. Perfect. Thank you. Guys, the stock cubes I'm using are called callow. So, they're a low-salt stock cube, so they are. I want to get away from putting as much salt into our food because when you make your own tomato sauce, which is basically what we're doing, you can control the amount of sugar, salt, and additives that goes in. And that's what cooking, good food, wholesome food, and healthy food is all about, in my opinion. Okay, I'm going to let that cook away there, guys. That's going to take about 10, 15 minutes. And then I'm going to finish it with some butter beans. These are great to have a can of these in your cupboard. You know when I make a big pot of mince? Mince, onion, garlic, Sometimes I put smoked bacon into it at home. Worcester sauce, tinned tomatoes, and then I finish it with this. It's gorgeous, guys. Some of these big butter beans are beautiful in mints, in stews, and in soups. They're wonderful, so they are. And really good for roughage, and they add a lovely kind of creaminess to the actual um, sauce that I'm going to make now. So I'm going to do a switch here, everyone. I'm going to move the pot here to the back. I'm going to move the hot pan. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let that simmer away, stew away. I might turn it down a little bit, it's boiling a bit too fast. And now we're gonna cook our lamb, we're gonna talk about the lamb. Okay, oil, rapeseed oil, nice hot pan. So first of all, the cut that I'm using everyone, I'll just scrape off the rosemary. Claire has this marinated with some rapeseed oil and some rosemary. So we just marinated it this morning. So this is the loin of lamb everyone, which is the, the loin, which is the most tender, leanest cut on the actual animal. And we've just got my butcher just to trim this off. So this is good quality assured Donegal lamb, which is about maybe 45 minutes for me. Uh, when you're cooking meat, everyone, you bring it to room temperature and you season it just before it goes onto the pan. Salt, black pepper, and by the way, the salt I'm using is for mackle. So it's amazing now we're producing our own oil, our own salt. Irish food is in a very good place and it's only gonna get better. And you have to see a show like this, I suppose, see the way the food element is growing, growing the same at Bloom, it's just magical. Great to be in, in, in this time now with food. So just get your tongs, lift it off, onto the pan. Thank you, Claire. I'm gonna put a little bit of butter. Now in this book, there's very little butter, broke my heart. You know me and my butter. I had this woman once coming up to me in a butcher shop in Cork, and she grabbed me by the cheeks up here, not down here. And she says to me, Nevin, you're using far too much butter on TV. And I said, I know I am. I'm trying to support the Irish dairy farmers. I said, I love butter. And she said, my husband's always given out about it. And uh, she bought a book, and of course I charged her. But, um, you know, it was, <laughs> it, it was a funny thing to say. And she wasn't, you know, she just grabbed me. The big, you know the way you shake somebody's cheeks like that? But uh, I do love butter. And everyone, if you can get the oil, the rapeseed oil and the butter, one stops the other one from, sorry, the rapeseed oil stops the butter from burning. So can you see the colour on the lamb there? I'll hold it over to you now over there, folks show you in a moment. We're going to put this into the oven in a moment. We're going to season, we'll have it seasoned up and we're going to give it about 10 minutes. It won't take long. It's a very lean cut. If you don't want to use this because it is an expensive cut, lamb chops are gorgeous. Pork chops or chicken breast. So you can vary it. Try this um, tomato sauce that I'm doing. It's gorgeous with pasta. It really is good with fish. So let's just get a nice bit of color here just on the lamb. And can I just show you what basting means everyone? So when we cook a piece of meat in the restaurant, we usually get a spoon like this and we spoon over these juices. So you're keeping it really moist. Now it's completely blue at the moment in the center, but I'm gonna serve it pink, okay? Not rare, but pink. And if you're lucky enough, Kira's gonna go around with tickets and you can win any of these dishes that I'm making. A free raffle, okay? So you can't leave. Now let's turn over the lamb. Okay, I'm gonna pop this into the oven. And in here, sorry. The oven, everyone, is at 190. I'm gonna check it after about five minutes and I'm gonna flip it over, okay? And we're gonna cook it pink. And I wanna show you the tip, everyone, here. This is really important. Will you all do this for me? I'm sure you've seen this tip a million times. You get your thumb and your index finger here. Look at, come on, everyone. Press underneath that. Feel your, your, that part of your thumb. Feel how soft that is, rare. You all watching there? Medium, okay, nice and soft, but not as soft as the first finger. Medium well. Don't be pressing your elbow. Come on now, you're a pack of chancers. Medium well, and then well done. So it toughens up, so meat is a muscle. So remember that, same with duck, pork, chicken. I'm gonna cook the lamb pink, so I wanna get it to medium stage. Is that okay? And we're gonna let that cook away. We're gonna finish this um, in a wee while with some flat leaf parsley 
and then we're going to put the butter beans in. So that's fine. That's been done there. Can I show you a nice little marinade for chicken, everyone? It's a satay. And uh, has anyone ever been to Thailand? I love Thailand. It's one of my favorite places. I've been there about six times. And I have great memories of going to Thailand because my mother, before she passed away, she went to Thailand with us and she loved it. And my father-in-law and my wife, Amelda. And I can't wait to bring my twins. They're a wee bit young. I, I'd love to bring them because it, it's so educational. It's just a great, the food. So I always go and I do a kind of like a Thai cookery course. So you're there chopping away and they're looking at you and they're saying, wow, you're pretty good at cooking or chopping or whatever. And I'd never tell them I'm a chef. I'd say, yeah, I love cooking at home. But it's where you learn about ingredients and food and all that. So this dish that I'm going to show you is a Thai dish, okay? It originates in Thailand. There's loads of variations. That's one of my mother's favorite. I always think of her when we make this. So I'm going to show you what we're going to put into the marinade for the chicken. We're going to put in some mild curry powder, okay? We are going to put in some interesting and beautiful soya sauce called ketchup manis. Can you all see this? This is really good. So it's a low salt, sweet Indonesian soya sauce. A lot of people were asking myself and Kenneth, where can you get this? The Asian market, some Tesco's, but definitely where you'll get a small bottle of it is an M&S, Marks and Spencer's. Okay, it's ketchup manis. This one is about 10, 12 euro, isn't it, Claire? About that, and it's really good. It's beautiful. It's a two-year shelf life, so you can use it in stir fries and that. So it's a very distinctive label. If you want to come up afterwards, get a photograph on your phone of the, uh, of the soya sauce. Claire will show it to you. It really is gorgeous. So I'm going to put a little bit of honey into this. And the honey I'm using, everyone, is from Malivan Honey, just up the road in Kilkenny. Really good honey producers. Thank you. We're going to mix this all together. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add in our chicken kebabs. So what we've done, everyone, is with strips of chicken. So this is some really good, nice, quality assured chicken. Thomas is in the kitchen. He's from Donegal. And he got the chicken breast. Okay, this is one chicken breast cut into three little strips. So don't go across the chicken. Go lengthways, and it looks better, to be honest with you. So we're just going to put this into the marinade. I have it on bamboo skewers. All right. Thank you, Claire. Good woman. She's playing a blinder, isn't she, this girl? You know, I'm telling you, she really is fantastic. And you know, the key to running a business for me is you're only as good as the team that you have. We have a woman working in our restaurant, everyone, and she's been with us for 45 years. She's given her life to us. She changed my nappy, God love her. And she's the nicest woman that so she is, and you know, we have very, very loyal staff. So we're nothing. Black, Black Lion is not a one-man success, it's about a team. And I'm very proud of that. Very proud of where I come from. Do I want another restaurant? Do I want to open up more? No way. Do want to do it right. And enjoy what you have. Enjoy my time with my twins and my family and the cookery school was really something I wanted to do. I was a bit selfish about it because I want to be at home. So guys, this is our chicken. Claire has some marinated since this morning. So from this to this, I will show you. Thank you. We'll keep that in the fridge tonight and we'll cook that up tomorrow morning, so we will. So it makes sense. So how long would you marinate it? I wouldn't marinate it any more than overnight because it firms up and it starts to actually to cook the chicken, the soya. Okay, because there is a little bit of salt, yeah, honestly, but we're going to grill it. But before I do that, can I show you a very quick satay sauce before I do the chicken? I just want to show you all the lamb in case I forget. So make sure if you put a pan like this into the oven that it's a really good enamel pan. Don't put a nonstick pan into the oven, guys. Seal it off, the lamb, put it onto a little Pyrex dish and then put that into the oven. You'll ruin the nonstick. So a little bit of color there. Look at that. Now, I know it's not cooked. I know it's still very rare in the middle, so I'm going to give that about another three to four minutes, and then I'm going to let the meat rest. Are we happy with that, guys? So that's the lamb fillet that we have. Let's have a look, little look at our sticky toffees, which are in about, what, 16 minutes? So the 14 minutes, sorry. Yeah, you're better at maths than me. Okay, and I'm going to lift these out. Now. Okay. And look at this here, guys. That's where we have the sticky toffees there. They're not done. And how you know they're not done, they're still very raw in the center. I know by looking at them. So, isn't that incredible how they puff up? And you've seen it from start to finish. I want to get him a book, that gentleman in the black. Please. Yeah, please. Thank you, I know him. Okay, guys, sorry. Uh, just a friend of mine, I'm just after spotting. So, I'm going to show you the satay sauce. Really, really simple. No, 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 definitely not. <laughs> um, okay, uh, some peanut butter, uh, coconut milk. I'm going to talk about the coconut milk. And we're going to use some sweet chili sauce. And these are all products from an Irish company called Thai Gold. Has anyone heard of them? Based in Wexford, guys, the best products you'll use. I swear to God, they're fantastic. And uh, I've been probably using their products, God, nearly for 10 years. You won't beat them. They're really, really good. And earlier on, we made a lovely Thai red curry. 
this is a very simple satay sauce that, that we're going to that we're going to um, that we're going to make. So we are. So let me explain what's in the satay sauce. We have coconut milk from Thai Gold. Kira's handing out the tickets. So guys, if you're not in, you can't win. Everyone's got to be a ticket for everyone. Make sure Ken a chance to him for a minute. Yeah, please. Thank you. Coconut milk. Peanut butter, I love peanut butter. I love it in parafés. And a parafé is like a creamy ice cream. So we make a peanut butter parafé in the restaurant with roast bananas, chocolate sauce, guys. It's, you, just, you just cry, it's that nice. It really is. So this is the peanut butter here, guys. It's a crunchy peanut butter. Obviously, if you have a nut allergy, you don't use this, okay? But it is crucial in satay, to be absolutely honest with you. I'm gonna put in two spoons in here, okay, of the peanut butter, all right? And then I'm going to put in some of the coconut milk. I want to show you, excuse me, the coconut milk. All right, there we go, Claire. Thank you. <coughs> excuse me, sorry, everyone. Now, this is the coconut milk. Look at this, guys. How creamy is that? So delicious. I love that. And a lady asked me once, you know, do Thai gold um, bring half fat or low fat coconut milk in? And I asked Norman. Norman is the man who, who owns the company. <clears throat> Excuse me, everyone. And he said to me, Nevin, why would I bring half water around the world? So a good tip he told me, when you hear this, you get a full can of coconut milk here, like this. You put it into a jug, you put the same amount of water into it, and voila, that's your low-fat coconut milk. So think about that. You're, you're getting twice the yield, and you're being a little bit clever, so you are. So I'm going to put some of the coconut water in there. And the difference in coconut milk and coconut cream is that coconut milk, sorry, coconut cream is just sieved coconut, um, sieved coconut milk. So it's thicker. Does that make sense? Okay, brilliant. Claire, will you take out the lamb in case I forget? I don't want to overcook that. I'm going to put in a little bit of sugar, everyone. And I'm just using this sugar. I don't want you to go out and buy it if, if you can. Brilliant. I've been using it in the cookery school for the last year. And it's a really lovely sugar. It's palm sugar. It's a slightly caramelized, it's hard to describe it, nutty taste. It's really good and it's very different to brown sugar. Brown sugar will work perfectly, by the way. So I'm gonna put a little bit of that in. Beautiful, Claire, thank you. So what Claire's gonna do with the lamb, everyone, we're gonna take it out and we're gonna let it rest. So just before I come back to the satay sauce, that's nice, that's nice. It's nice and soft. I'm feeling the thickest part of the actual lamb. And Claire's gonna wrap this in some tin foil. Thank you. We're resting the lamb. I'm gonna do the satay sauce finish this and then we're going to serve it up. Is that okay, guys? So, let me talk to you, thank you. Some sweet chili sauce, always have a bottle of this, it's really good. For some people don't like it, it's not hot, it's sweet. There's a difference. So that's in there. And then the last thing, in case I forget, is some lime, so some fresh limes. So we just bring this to the boil, everyone. God, they're really good limes. Sometimes you buy limes and they're so, there's no juice in them. They're as good as I've seen, fabulous. Well. So just a good squeeze of the limes here. So this satay sauce I'm going to make now, everyone, for you. We'll keep in your, in your, when you make it in your fridge for up to a week. No problem. And you can use it up with leftover cooked chicken, leftover cooked beef, whatever you want. It keeps really well. It honestly does. Now, let me see. I am going to start to cook my chicken, and then I'll finish my, um, my, my bu the, the butter beans. So when I'm going to cook the chicken, everyone, these are the kebabs. I'm going to do it on a griddle pan. It'll be a little bit smoky now, I hope you don't mind, but it'll be a lovely way of cooking it. You can do this on a barbecue, of course, or however way you want to cook it, if you want to grill it. Just one thing, if you're going to grill it, make sure you soak the bamboo skewers in cold water, because that keeps it really, really moist. Now, I'm going to uh, heat this, turn over my chicken. So that's it marinated there, Evan, can you see that? That's it there, nice and thin, good hot pan. Claire will keep a wee eye on these for me. I'm just going to drizzle a tiny little bit more oil. Oh, the smell of that is super. And then turn down the pan. A little drizzle of oil, just a little drizzle, guys. Okay, perfect. And then we're just going to let that cook for about two or three minutes either side. Right, I just want to whisk my satay sauce, and then we're going to finish off our butter bean stew. Now, it's a little bit smoky, and the reason why it's smoky, everyone, the honey, it begins to caramelize, so it does. So are you all hungry? Is that the stupidest question I've ever asked? Well, when you go out the door, take a left, the food court's up the street, and <laughs> there's lots. <laughs> no, Claire made us lovely wraps today. I have to say, Claire, beautiful for lunch. Um, okay, so we're just gonna let this come to the boil, let that cook away, all right? Gonna put a tiny little bit of soy sauce, nearly forgot, into this. 
and that's that ketchup manis. So I leave it there if you want to take a picture. It's not for you to take home. I need it tomorrow, but it is something that you can use and take a picture and you can buy. It's worth getting. Now, guys, back on to our tomatoes. Let's have a little look. They're turned down. They're nice and stewed. So I just want to show you the consistency. All right? In goes the butter beans. Stir this through. Warm them up. And then we're going to finish this with a little bit of chopped parsley. And the parsley I'm using, everyone, is some flat leaf parsley. So our timer's gone. And the timer Claire was using is um, just a little kind of battery-operated timer that is really good in your kitchen to have um, if you want to, you know, just to remind yourselves, because we can all forget. It's very easy to forget. So a little bit of flat leaf parsley. I had a lady in the cookery school ask me, they look gorgeous, ask me, Nevin, why do most chefs now use flat leaf and not curly parsley? Will we use both? to be honest with you. But flat leaf parsley thinks a little bit stronger. Now, Claire, do you want to bring them out and show everyone? Sorry, I know they're hot. They look gorgeous, they look gorgeous. Well done, and they're cooked. Look at it, they're soft. Can I just show you? You might just turn the chicken. Thank you very much, good woman. I just want to show you, and just that I'm not bluffing, and you know that these are them. Shake them. Now, they're mad hot. Just give them a little shake, okay? And then they should just pop out. There we go, like that. Now oh, it's stuck a little bit, that one. It's okay, that's the quality one that we'll just taste. No, they're, they're awful. Hide that under the counter, and don't tell anyone I ate it. Okay, mm. it's really moist, it's hot. I'm gonna leave that for a minute. And do you know what? <clears throat> I unmolded that a little bit quick, I wanted to show you, but when I go to unmold them in a few minutes, they'll pop out because of the steam. So we're gonna chop our parsley, well done. A little bit of a nice marinade. Watch the fingers when you're chopping. And then just what you do when you want to chop herbs, everyone, like this. You hold the knife, rock it over and back, and then what you do, it goes all into the pot. With the butter beans, with the tomatoes, the red onion, the garlic, that looks great, Claire, well done. And just freshness, just look how good this looks here. So if you wanted to cook some pasta, that's beautiful. And think of smoked bacon in that, it really is gorgeous. Now, we're gonna serve up our lamb, that's the first dish we're gonna do. The lamb is resting. We unwrap it. Why do we rest meats? If we take it out of the oven and we slice it, all that beautiful juice that's here, it's gonna go in here, so we waste nothing. If we slice it, everyone, what's gonna happen is that it's just gonna leak, leak and weep on the plate, and we don't want that. I'm just gonna get a large spoon. Sorry. <laughs> and we're just gonna spoon this on here. All right. So a nice big pile of these buttered beans. We're gonna finish it with a little bit of fat in a moment but I wanna just slice the lamb. So look at that, even on its own, that's really good. Now, move that out of here. Just be careful with the handle, that's hot clear. We have some feta cheese, but we'll just slice the lamb first. I always have a little bit of kitchen paper just here, beside me, so I'll just bring that over there. Slice it nice and thinly. That's gorgeous. Now that's the way I like my lamb. It's succulent, guys, it's pink, it's not rare, it's really good, I love it like that. So I do. I'd even eat it a little bit pinker, to be honest with you. That's going on now a little bit past medium, okay? So it's going on just a little bit. It's not medium well, but it's on its way. <clears throat> because when you let it rest even longer, all that lovely juice will come out. We'll just go back into the lamb rather. Now, Claire, there's your lunch pit. Seems that all I give you <laughs> is a little bit of lamb. I'm sorry. We have had a wrap, I promise you. And then just arrange this just on the plate. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's the lamb there. It's a nice, generous portion, that now. Last thing, a little bit of feta cheese. Just crumble it on. And then we have just the final garnish of this is a little bit of flat leaf parsley. And Claire, will you get me a little bit of lemon oil? We'll just drizzle a tiny little bit of lemon oil in this pet, if you don't mind. Thank you. So just a tiny little bit of lemon oil for freshness. Or you can use chili oil, actually, because we had uh, chili in the recipe. So just a little drizzle here. That's all. And that's my first dish for you, Erpen, that I presented. I'm going to do my chicken now, and then we're going to finish off our uh, sticky toffee puddings. That's the loin of lamb, okay, or the fillet of lamb, it's called. And that is done with the butter, bean, and tomato stew. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you. Okay. Now. All right. This is our sauce. Let's have a taste of this. So at this stage, if you think, oh, it's a little bit too sweet, you add more lime, okay? So counteract it. Mm. 
I like that. And it's not uh, in any way, it might be a little bit heavy. Have we any stock clear? Just to loosen it up. And I just want to show you what I mean. Good woman. And you see, there's no flour in it. It's the peanut butter. I'll tell you when to stop. Good woman. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. And this will just loosen it up. It's nicer. I don't want a really thick, heavy, gloopy satay. That's not what I want. And then we're going to move this over here. Pour this into the dish on the side. And you could stir in some cooked chicken, some cooked prawns. Fill it right up, everyone. I'll give you that there, Claire. Now we can cook that. And then just let's lift off our chicken. So our chicken is cooked. Claire turned down the pan. That looks amazing. I think that. Look at that, guys. Get a wee shot of that. It looks so good. See the way it's sliced? Thomas, you've done a really good job. Thank you. He's down the back there. He's been a great help to me, Thomas. Thank you. And them are lovely chicken there. Guys, that's my second dish for you. And that's the chicken kebabs done with the satay sauce. And uh, what about that? Isn't that nice? It is lovely. Try that. You're very kind. Try that sauce, everyone, with uh, pork chops. Are you okay? Thomas, are you feeling strong? You might come up and help. It's a couple of heavy pans. See that cast iron griddle pan? It's serious weight. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of sponge sugar. And then what we're going to do, everyone, we're going to make a sauce from this so we are. So let's just tidy up. Claire is heating the sugar. And I just want to get over the, uh, all my other ingredients. Now, in the saucepan, everyone. Thanks, Thomas. You're a gent. In the saucepan, everyone. We have sugar, water, glucose. If you see me at the ploughing, you say, here's that Egypt again with the sugar. But it's good fun. We're going to get two people up from the audience. So we have. We have two people, haven't we? I think we have. Hold on, let me see. Who have we got? Keira O'Connor. Is Keira O'Connor coming up? And we have to pick a man, a boy, a man. We get a man. How about this man here? Would you come up? Good man. Come on and give him a round of applause. I don't know who you are. Come on, we have a chat. Good lad. Thanks, Jason. Oh, you can do better than that now. Come on. Are you going to sleep on me? Now, come on up. Kira, come on up. This is great. Let's have a little bit of a chat. We'll chat to the lady first. You don't mind? Good man. Thank you. Come on and say hello to everyone. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on in close and say hello to everyone. So tell them who you are, where you're from. I'm Kira O'Connor from Selbridge. From Selbridge. Yeah. My twin brother teaches in Selbridge. I know him well. In this lake. You know my brother well? Yeah. Uh, David. I do. Know. How do you know him? Uh, just from going to the school. From going to the school. <laughs> ah, super. Okay. So tell me about yourself. What do you do? Um, I'm, uh, I work in forensic science and I have a uh, mother of three. Don't push the microphone away. Everyone <laughs> wants to hear you. Go on. I, I'm a mum of three. You're a mum of three. <laughs> tell me, what age are your kids? Uh, ten, five and three. Wow, that's yeah. exciting. Busy time? Sure is. Many boys, many girls? Uh, they're in the audience. Are they're they two, in the audience? Where two are boys they? and one girl. Hi guys, hope you're enjoying it. Do you get time to cook at home? Uh, I do. Do you? No choice. <laughs> well, no cho <laughs> it's yeah, have to be fed. Yeah, you yeah, have to be fed or they starve. Yeah. And what kind of things would you make? Just simple kind of everyday kind of food? or? Uh, no, they're all into fish. And really? Yeah, they are. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Well done. What's their favourite fish? Salmon. Salmon. Yeah. And it is the most eaten fish in Ireland, salmon, so it is. So we're going to have a little bit of go doing sugar. Is that okay, Kieran, right. in a moment? Yeah. I want to get this gentleman's name. We don't know him. Come on over here. Hello. The front row, you must have been here at 11 o'clock this morning. Oh, seven. What's your name? Kieran Ryan. Where are you from, Kieran? Uh, Nina, County Tipperary. You're very welcome. Nina? Yeah. Peter Ward country. That's right. Has anyone ever been to Country Choice? Peter Ward's fantastic guy. Absolutely yeah. wonderful, isn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. a great ambassador. What do you do yourself? Um, house husband at the moment. Yeah. Good, how's that going? Trying to learn how to cook. Really? That's why you're here at the front row. <laughs> and what kind of things do you cook? Go uh, on. Sure. Anything simple. Anything simple. Yeah. Do you like cooking? I do, yeah. Ah, but super. A lot to learn. Oh, well, listen, we all have a lot to learn. And every day I'm a chef, I've been cooking from the age of 12. I learn every day. Mm. So that's the beauty about it. So if you were to cook something very simple, what would it be? What's your favourite thing to cook at home? Um, I suppose... I love a roast lamb. Roast ham? Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Yeah. Would you do the leg or what could it have? Would you do? It's gorgeous. Leg, leg of lamb. Well done. Yeah, and do your family? Oh, leg of lamb, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Lamb, I just said ham. Favorite. Gorgeous. Lamb mm -hmm. is gorgeous. Roast leg. Do your family, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah. yeah. Three kids. Three kids. What ages? 14 and 12 and 9. Brilliant. And how many boys, many girls? Two boys, a little girl. A little girl. Are so they here? Ah, oh, so look at so She's very course. proud. Paddy's here up cooking. Okay, now we're going to have a bit of go doing sugar. Kieran, isn't it? Yeah. Super. Okay, we'll put this over here. So, guys, let's have a little bit of fun. Come on in, Kira. You keep running away. Get in here. Okay, come on in, Kira, either side of me. So, we have the two C and Cs. Are you a C or a K, Kieran? K. K, okay. So, guys, what we have is sugar, water, and glucose. All right? And what I want you to do is to hold the ladle down, hold the spoon up, and just go over like this, over and back. And you just do this, and it's very, very easy. Just let it simply, just over and back, over and back. And then you go and finish the basket at the bottom. So what we have here, we have sugar, 
we have water and we have glucose. And I'm going to just break all this off and then you're going to twist it and you're going to have a lovely little basket like that. Kira, wow. Kira, what about that? It's a bit out, very impressive, but we're going to be very impressed with you. Um, now, Kira, here we go. I'll help you. Get started. Hold it nice and high, pet. And that goes down low. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. All right, over and back. That's it. Good woman. You keep going down to the ladle. Go up again. Good woman. You're strong. Up you go. And then finish it off. Now, guys, a bit of encouragement would be going to harm. Come on, what about that? You're doing brilliant. In front of a couple of hundred people. Brilliant. Well done, pet. Now, I'm going to put, take that off. And then what I always do, Kieran, if you're watching, just put your thumb here so that it doesn't slide off. Do that and give that a wee twist. Wow. Go, girl. Well done. Look at that, guys. Get a shot of that. Niall, get a shot of that. That's gorgeous. I'm very proud of you now. You're not going yet. One minute. Kieran, the moment of truth. Pressure. 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 Go on. Take the top off. Go on. I'm only joking. Here we go. Get the spoon. Come on. You're doing it. Oh, good. <laughs> Hold it high. We even higher. Good lad. Yeah, yeah. Super. You have it. Excellent. Come on, guys. A bit of encouragement. Come on. They always love to see the men up here. Do you know that, Kieran? You're great. I'm very proud of you. He's good? Brilliant. I'm very impressed. Wow. You're very good. And then finish it off. And the reason why we finish it off, remember around the bottom. Remember I went around the bottom. Don't worry. Hold on now. We're in trouble here. Hold on. Hold on now. Take it. You got, you got away there. That's fine, don't worry. We'll just finish her off. That'll be your own unique basket. You lift that off now and you can show Niall, our cameraman. That's it, take your time. Take your time. Hold on, I'll hold it. Wow. I'm proud of you. Now, if you're looking for a job, there's jobs going in Black Lion all the time. We'd love to have you off. Good man. Now, we have a little gift for both of you. We have a goodie bag here. Thanks, Claire. Pass them up. So, what have we got here? We have a copy of the book, Fast Book, for you. Kira, well done. And Kieran, I will sign them afterwards. Bring your baskets with you, put them on eBay, you might get a few bob for them. Well done. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thanks for coming up. All right. Very, very quickly. Yes, Pet. The last call for Raffle tickets. The last call for raffle tickets. That's what the boss tells me. So, we're going to do two other types of sugar. Put your hands up. Guys, we're going to be finished in a couple of minutes, promise. Going to show you Angel's hair. Look at this, everyone. Sugar, water, glucose coming from the spoon. As the spoon is fall as the sugar is falling from the spoon, it's going to cool down. And then, that's what we have there. What about that? Would anyone like this? Would anyone like this? Would anyone share it? Sharing is caring. Okay, well done. And then the last one is this little curl here. So everyone, this is the steel that we use for sharpening knives. And you just go round, take your time, and as the sugar hits the actual steel, it will set. Break off either end. I'm going to move that over there. That's up there. Just make sure that's on. And then watch this, everyone. Slide this off. And you have the coolest little curl. What about that? Can you all see that? It's a really, really lovely little garnish that you can sit on top of the, on top of the dessert, whether it's ice cream or whatever. Now, can I show you all, first of all, how to make a caramel sauce? And then we'll make a butterscotch sauce. So we remove the spoon. And the reason why we remove the spoon is because it's going to go, bu it, it'll bubble up and we don't want to get a burn. That's really important. I'm using this small little balloon whisk. We're going to put cream into it, everyone. We're going to put some rum, because we have it. We're going to put vanilla and we're going to put butter and salt. That's it. So first thing I'll show you all is how to make a caramel sauce and then we're going to make a butterscotch sauce. Is that okay? We're going to be finished now in a few minutes, everyone. And after we're finished the demo, we're going to do the raffle for the food and them for the cookery book. And after that, I'll be over there with my brother, Kenneth, um, signing and uh, copies of my book. So we have um, the nation's favorite food fast, the healthy one, which was launched this week, and the baby and family book, which is a great little book for all the family. Now, everyone, just watch this. It's very hot. I'll show you what happens. I'll lift it up. This is some regular Avamore whipping cream. It's not double cream. Okay, just watch now. I'm gonna lift it up and I'll show you. You whisk this, and it goes really lumpy. So you keep whisking this, turn this down, and you'll get a nasty little burn, and then you just keep whisking it. So all you're doing is you're just dissolving the caramel, which that's what we've made with the sugar, water, and the glucose. You have that recipe and the cream. Turn it up, a little bit more cream. If you don't want to use cream, I think it's the nicest, you can use apple juice. Okay, apple juice, orange juice, or pineapple juice. 
So guys, this is what we have here. It's just dissolving those. See those little lumps there? You're just dissolving it together. Now, let's just keep that cooking a tiny bit more cream. And then we're going to add in the rest of our ingredients. Claire, can I give you that? No. All right. We're nearly there, guys. We're going to put in some vanilla. Just a little splash of vanilla. You can use, this is where you can use the vanilla skin. You know we had the vanilla skin left over? So full of flavor. You can use that. A little splash of rum. Okay, we've already spoke about the rum, so a little splash. And then we're going to put in some butter. And this is what our butterscotch sauce is. Just about a spoonful of butter should be enough. It gives a lovely shine, gives a lovely richness to it, and this is just regular uh, salted butter. It's not unsalted butter, by the way. Now, we just whisk this all together, and guys, that's our sauce. And when my mother used to make this, she used to do a little dessert called butterscotch bonanza. And all it was was homemade vanilla ice cream. This sauce, not served hot, just at room temperature. And then it was um, sliced banana and toasted pecan nuts. It was gorgeous. Just a very simple ice cream sundae. So let me show you the sauce. You may look at it now and think it's a little bit runny. Trust me, it's not. That will thicken up as it cools down. How long will that keep in your fridge? I'd happily keep that for about three weeks. It probably won't last three hours when you make it. You'll have it devoured. So let's serve up our little um, sticky toffee. These have cooled down. Yeah, and you see the difference now? I am molded it very quickly and it's stuck. And, then, and you know, it's like brown bread, isn't it? If you leave it in the tin for a while, it's the steam that removes it. So that's actually a good lesson for us all. Okay? We're going to just um, drizzle the sauce over. I don't know if you, some of you got the taste strawberries, did you? Pat Clark, he comes um, from Stamullen. He's one of the best strawberry growers. And he handpicks every single strawberry. They're what you call stem picking. So we're going to put this around the plate with some raspberries. So this is like a rich dessert, there's no doubt about it. What I love to serve with this, everyone, is some uh, whipped cream or ice cream. So you have hot and cold. And we're nearly finished, everyone. We're just going to arrange our little basket. We're going to arrange our little curl, which is very delicate. And that's my last dish for uh, today, for the Farmer's Journal demo. Can I just thank uh, Claire, I'm playing a blinder, to Thomas to Jerry, Kenneth, and then Niall and Jason on sound and also on, um, on doing the videos. Guys, thanks a million, you're playing a blinder. They haven't got anything to eat. You're getting all the food because we're raffling it off. Thanks a million, lads, well done. We'll see you all tomorrow. Now, we're gonna do our raffle. Kira's gonna get the tickets. Did you enjoy that demo? Yeah? yeah? I bet you're all hungry. Is there anything worse than sitting, so, sitting down, watching a chef cook and you can't even taste it? Could you imagine if you came up with a cookbook that you could scratch it and you could taste? Imagine, Kira. That's a, that's a project for you. If anyone can make it happen, you can. We'll do it, we'll do it together. Okay. <laughs> now, let's have a go at this, guys. This is for our food. That's a good idea. One, two, three. First recipe, what's in that? Uh, lamb? Yeah. Lamb, okay. Perfect. So, first um, ticket is a pink ticket. Eight to, uh, eight to eight. Pink ticket. Who's got it? Eight to eight. Anybody? Eight to eight. Yes? Well done. There's a happy young lady. Well done. Good girl. We'll get that into a little bag, Jerry. Thank you. Enjoy. Just show me the ticket. That's great. Well done, pet. Thank you. Enjoy. Now, the next one, Kira has is a green ticket. And it's 981. Who did it? Sinead picked it. Hi, Sinead. Uh, 981, everyone. Green. 981. 981. 981. Anyone put your hands up? Well done. Come on up to us. What's this one, Kira? Or, sorry. The satay. The satay. That's the satay for you, my love. Well done. Jerry, I'll get that into a bag. The next one is the, is the sticky toffees. Oh, it's hot. Look at the excitement of everyone, Kira. Did you hear that? Forget about the other one that we want the dessert. Nine, six, eight. Nine, six, eight. Green. Nine, six, eight. Anyone? Anybody, anybody? Hands up. Well done. That's a lucky corner. Okay, that's your sticky toffees. There we go, Jerry. Someone might drop that down. So the lady, just stand up and I'll get Jerry to drop it down. You okay? Oh, you all right, pet? Just help her there. You okay? You hurt yourself? Yeah, all right. Oh, she just slipped. And the last thing that we're going to do is the book. Is she okay, lads? Yeah? Kenny, will you just go or Jerry, see if she's okay? Just, she might have got a bad knock there. Um, this is a green ticket. This is for the cookbook. 921. 912. 912. Apologies. 912. 912. Just go and see if she's okay. Anyone for the cookbook? That's for the healthy eating book. Anybody? Yes? Come on up. There's an excitement. Well done. You're a bit too young to eat healthy, but there we go. <laughs> now, we'll sign the book. Now, there we go. 
So guys, that's the demo finished. Uh, thank you so much. We'll be back on tomorrow at 11, at 1, and at 3. If you want to get any of the books, I'll be over here signing them. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the day. God bless everyone. Thank you.